Hi, Vikas. Welcome. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I was just uh, reading through your email. <laughs> I think that's a very valid point you're making there. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Today, I would like to take a moment of yours and use your imagination. Imagine living a life without any advanced technologies and available with us currently, especially in the present situation where the whole world is transitioning towards functioning digitally. How will we communicate? How will we perform our day-to-day -day tasks more effectively and efficiently? I know it's really hard for us to imagine as a part of life. We today are focusing on advanced technologies to the next higher level to do more, to perform better. In the next few hours, we'll be taking all these technologies humankind has been able to develop. About Tech Conclave, the main aim of this conclave is to deliberate on the current issues confronting of Industry 4.0 with the focus on IoT, automated systems, AI and machine learning, and cybersecurity. Now, I invite Professor Maheshwar Divedi to take a head from here. Uh, thank you, uh, Durga Bhagwan. So, on behalf of School of Engineering and Technology, my heartfelt uh, profound gratitude to all the participants of this e-technology conclave, which is being organized by BML Munjali University uh, on this day, which is the 2nd of December, 2020. Uh, so first of all, hi, I'm Dr. Maheshwar Divedi, and I shall, be, I shall be giving you a brief outline of the events that will unfold in the next few hours. Uh, so as part, part of this technical conclave, titled Industry 4.0 and Smart Autonomous Technologies. You will get to see panel uh, discussions on four different thematic sessions, each of one hour duration, uh, with the principal objective of deliberating and discussing the current issues confronting Industry 4.0, with special focus on the AI and machine learning, automated systems, IoT, and cybersecurity. Uh, I'm happy to share that the technical conclave boasts of the participation of a total of 16 leading uh, 16 uh, senior uh, uh, professionals from industry and also academia who shall be deliberating on the following four themes. The first thematic session is titled Artificial Intelligence, Hype or Reality and is uh, scheduled from 11.45 onwards, uh, expected to go up to 12.45 p.m. The second session is based on the theme Future Factories, Robotics and Automation and is expected to kick off from 1 p.m. onwards uh, to until 2 p.m. The third session of the conclave is titled IoT, the next frontier, and shall start at 2.30 p.m. onwards, following a short break. The fourth and final session of the conclave is titled Challenges for Cyber Warriors in Uncertain Environment, and is expected to start at 3.45 p.m. Finally, uh, the Dean of School of Engineering and Technology technology will conclude with vote of thanks. So that was in brief the program outline. Now I would like to request and invite our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Manoj Arora, to deliver the inaugural address of the first BMU technical conclave on Industry 4.0 and Smart Autonomous Technology. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Maheshwar. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, my dear experts from industry and academia, my colleagues and students. Uh, first of all, my sincere gratitude to the experts who could find time to become part of a very timely technolo technology conclave organized by our School of Engineering and Technology with the support of our Career Guidance and Development Center. Uh, I would also like to put on record the efforts put in by my colleagues, uh, in particular, Professor Manik, Professor Sarabjo, Dr. Goldie, Divedi, Kiran, Rajiv, and their team, and also Mr. Neil and his corporate engagement team in bringing a galaxy of experts on this platform 
to share their views on Industry 4.0 and the way forward. A hearty welcome to all to this conclave, which we have named as Technical Conclave, and which will talk about technologies of the future, as Maheshwar said just now. Uh, as we all know that the industrialization started with the so-called steam and the first machines that mechanized some of the work. Uh, then we had electricity and assembly lines, which led to the birth of mass production. Then came the era of internet and the advent of computers when robots and machines started uh, replacing the workforce on those assembly lines. And now we are talking of bringing computers and automation together in a new way with robots connected remotely to computer systems equipped with machine learning algorithms and so on and so forth. Uh, perhaps there are nine major technological components which lay the foundation of industry for adopt and adapt these perishable cells. So there is no escape. So the nine component internet of things, simulations, autonomous robots, augmented reality, cybersecurity, system integration, additive manufacturing, and so on and so forth. So, so are we geared up to embrace this revolution? This is the question which each person has to answer all the time in today's age. I was reading a CIA report which said that India is on the verge of starting its journey to becoming uh, to uh, becoming economical, industrial, and defense superpower in next three decades, looking at the current growth of uh, GDP, although pandemic has uh, put down a break on that, but looking at the vision of Digital India, Make in India and a Smart City project, uh, we think that uh, there is no escape and the tech country is also going in that direction. So if we really want to make this Make in India initiative uh, a kind of global hub for the industries, then we have to win against the global competition. So if that has to happen, our future workers will not only need to be highly trained in these emerging technologies, but also as importantly in the values associated with using those technologies. We already know how artificial intelligence can be used for good or bad. So both the things are there. So in future, we must not only process the ability to develop the technology, but also to know whether, when, and where to use that technology. That is also important. So that kind of thinking uh, will bring in both reflective and interdisciplinary aspects of these technologies. So, someone said industry 4.0 will require the world to produce worker. So, they must be able to see. Now, these traits define the knowledge work challenges and engendered by this particular technology. The personnel are expected to acquire adaptive thinking, cognitive, and computational skills predominantly in the area of information technology, data analytics, data analytics, and so on and so forth. So tomorrow's industry leaders and managers, I'm repeating this, must possess new skills to adapt, to manage, and to take advantage of this industry 4.0. They must be critical thinkers, problem solvers, innovators, communicators, and provide value chain, uh, value-driven leadership. So this would require new approach also. Uh, the you know, trends in the industry have to adapt and modernize the existing programs, facilities, and the infrastructure. The schools and, you know, and universities need to reinvent themselves quickly. And we need to adapt to the demands of the Industry 4.0 and try to give as many opportunities as possible by creating the adequate context for the students to be prepared for the future jobs. The problem in the future could not be lack of employment, but the shortage of skills that the new jobs will demand. So that is the challenge. So the, 
I am sure the job market will pick up automatically if our students are well versed and acquainted with the various concepts of Industry 4.0. And I'm specifically talking about the engineering education here. So we have the obligation as a academic leader, we have the obligation to create the models and context to allow it to happen. Otherwise, we will have a generation with no skills, skills, no skill shortage for the new demands for the of the labor market, and that will become a big problem to the society. So students also need to understand how they can correlate, use, and apply different knowledge in diversified context, what they really mean, and how they can create synergies between among different subjects to develop, create something that connects to the real world. Gone are the days of studying core engineering in silos. And I have been telling this time and again, an engineer has to equip himself or herself on all components of the industry 4.0 technologies. In this change, I think the first and foremost is the designing the right kind of curricula. And on top of it, it is the delivery of the curricula in its true sense, where again, the technology can help. So the introduction of new courses composed of programming language analysis, database system, machine learning, security systems, all these will have to be taught to every engineer. The conventional libraries need to be upgraded with visualization software tools, simulating systems, and so on and so forth. To real, even the even I would say that the student club activities could be done studying the importance of industry and impart knowledge about its various aspects. It's, and from there, they need to collab. They need to develop new ways of communicating. They need to be put in front of complex situations to develop critical thinking and complex problem solving, and to learn how to be imaginative, creative, adaptable, flexible, and to develop the brain plasticity, I would say. The partnership between companies and universities are going to provide a greater competitiveness, versatility, and interoperability during the Industry 4.0 era. So partnerships are very, very important. Uh, when 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 we when we talk of education 4.0 thus our, our education needs to be more dynamic and we as academicians need to closely ourselves associate with businesses government institutions and technical communities for collaboration and partnerships that is the only way forward fortunately at bmu we have taken a number of initiations we revamped our curricula. We introduced fractal credit system to promote collaborative and integrated learning environment. We engaged with par partners in teaching of courses, both on campus and remotely. We focus more on project-based learning. We introduced new generation of specializations, all which we have been talking uh, and will talk today. We allowed students to choose courses across different disciplines. We introduced major and minor specializations. We strengthened our practice school, the internships concept, and increased its percentage in total credits. We brought in courses on innovation and entrepreneurship. So we made these changes so that we, we, we are there uh, alongside Industry 4.0. So in future, in fact, we plan to give more flexibility to students who can build their own degree by creating their own basket of courses. That is our vision for this, for, for BML Manjal University. I'm sure that the next era of education, which we have been calling as education 4.0, parallel to industry 4.0, has to be different. If we really want to embrace industry 4.0 truly. With these remarks, I again congratulate the School of Engineering and Technology and Career Guidance and Development Center in organizing this wonderful conclave and wish all of you a good and enjoyable learning from the experts. I'm expecting some recommendations also from this conclave, which I can consider maybe we may use to further improve upon what we have been doing as of now. Wishing you all the best, happy learning. Thank you, sir. It was uh, really thought provoking, sir. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, now I would like to call upon my dear friend Shashwat to take it from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bhagwan. Good morning, everyone. I am Sashwat Sarangi, here to introduce our moderator of the session and present a short introductory note for the topic AI reality for hype. AI continues to remain in the spotlight everywhere and has enabled and perverted human life in many ways. It is changing society with various developments which are larger than the life, such as self-driven cars, 
medical breakthrough game where the computer beats the human player but still the fact remains that it has a still a long way to go ai may have given us some application it's some human level of intelligence but the interesting thing is do we get hooked by what ai can wonder or explore more and so let's uh, dive deep into what ai can and cannot do so now let's take a, mo a moment to invite our esteemed moderator for this session dr sarobjot singh anand dr sarobjot singh anand has been involved in the field of machine learning since the early 1990s having worked on developing algorithms applying them to the real world problems and training a host of data scientists in the capacity of being an academic and an entrepreneur in 1998 he co-founded mine it software limited in the uk playing the role of the cto managing the product vision and the research initiatives within the company in 2003 dr anand moved back to academia to pursue his research interest but remained active as a consultant working with various businesses dr anand co-founded tatras data in 2018 he co-founded sabood foundation in mohali punjab to train the engineering students in machine learning and to work on the social well being dr anand is currently the director of csc at bml munjal university welcome sir thank you saswat <clears throat> and um, thank you for the very kind introduction um i would like to invite my panelists uh, some amazing data scientists that we have in the country and we are very very fortunate to have them all here uh, first of all i'd like to invite uh, uh, dr vikas agarwal uh, vikas is uh, an amazing source of uh, of knowledge and is always the go to person that i have whenever i stuck with uh, problems uh relating to uh, data science and machine learning <clears throat> he is the senior principal data scientist at oracle and has had stints at uh, intel in the us as well and of course uh, did his phd uh, in delaware and postdoc in caltech so welcome uh, vikas um i am also very fortunate to have uh, gaurav agarwal with us <clears throat> who is currently <clears throat> Uh, a staff research scientist at Google. He has in previous stints also been the head of data science at Ola and a senior research scientist at Yahoo, uh, having started the journey with a PhD in Maryland. So, Gaurav, uh, uh, welcome. Uh, we're really pleased that you could make it today, uh, despite uh, an odd hour uh, on a week of working day. Um, uh, I'd also like to welcome Mukesh Jain, who is currently chief technology and innovation officer at capgemini uh, he's there he has previously been the head of big data at geo and uh, had uh, a long stint in microsoft where i think um, i'm right in saying mukesh that you were the man who uh, took uh, the spam out of email that so is uh, <laughs> congratulations on that and all of what you've done since then and welcome to the panel and uh, finally vijay gabale uh, who is uh, currently at uh, infelect uh, having uh, worked at ibm prior to that and uh, of course with a phd uh, at iit mumbai so thank you panelists uh, for agreeing to be here uh, and uh, i'm looking forward to our conversation around ai uh, the hype Uh, as well as the the reality of what ai is is able to deliver so let me start by um, you know just asking you to summarize your views on where we stand with ai of course ai we see is hogging a lot of media as saswat was saying um there's a lot of talk around uh, you know the amazing things that ai is able to do and there is conversations around whether doctors will have jobs in the future or even uh, machine learning and engineers are now under threat in some media stories um and of course we are constantly looking at uh, tools that we are using whether it's just google or recommender systems that we are using in netflix or amazon we are seeing you know self driving cars being around the corner we are all using mobile phones that unlock themselves based on our recognizing our face Uh, so these are clearly you know um, ai in action as we see it today but then there is also a lot of mistrust where uh, you know recently in the british medical journal there was talk about uh, you know exaggerated claims being made by ai companies and ai researchers um, uh, suggesting that they can actually replace doctors uh, and then of course ibm watson has been getting a bit of a battering recently about overpromising and under delivering in ai healthcare um so uh, you know where do we really stand with ai uh, can we start with uh, 
you, Vikas, maybe, Vikas Agarwal? Sure, Sarah. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Well, um, if you had asked me the question yesterday, the answer might have been different. <laughs> okay, but uh, from what I heard from Gaurav Agarwal yesterday, uh, I actually want to share this uh, because I think uh, the scientists in the uh, audience would really love this. Uh, so this is a recent advance. Let's see if I can share properly. Just a moment. Um, do you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So just a moment. All right. So, so you see these protein structures over here. Now this, when I was a graduate student, people would tell me, do not touch this field, you will not get your PhD in time, right? Because this was a, this has been a 50 year old grand challenge, right? So now I was working in computational biology and it was shocking for me that this problem has been solved in my lifetime. And this was published just yesterday by DeepMind researchers from Cambridge in, uh, um, in uh, the UK. Right? And look at their accuracy. Let me see, is this visible? Okay, so until last, until a couple of years back, um, so there was this competition, which I will not go into given the time constraints, but these guys have good, gotten as good as the experimental error in X-ray crystallography or NMR spectroscopy, right? So until yesterday, I would say, you know what, I can do really well with games and so on, but this is, very carefully done science, which includes machine learning. Right? So this indicates that there is significant progress being made in AI thus far. And I, I should just show you the data, given that this is such an important news. You know, again, you're welcome to read the paper. This paper will be published not in a machine learning journal or an AI journal. This will be published in a biology journal called Proteins which is also very significant because this means there is a significant scientific advancement which people in that field will accept, right? And the, the way this problem was solved was by careful science of the domain. Now, these kinds of advances in AI have been coming since 2012, since the last image network uh, advance. So let me just briefly show you, right? So uh, Sarap touched on these, right? That, you know, Google's AlphaGo beat uh, go human jam, uh, alpha zero beat alpha go. Again, I'm not going into the details of this. 2011, IBM Watson just destroys humans in jeopardy. You can be poker players, outplay games, uh, you know, face recognition, search and rescue drones, recognizing traffic signs, and even beating captures, which were designed to beat humans. Right. So lung cancer detection, skin cancer detection, and then of course we use these every day, Google search, or, uh, and of course Gaurav can speak more to that, the kind of amazing advances that are being made. And you, you can go on, I don't want to take this up uh, further. So there is a lot of real work being done. So I, I think there is a lot of bright future out there for this field. Thank you, Vikas. Uh, Gaurav, uh, what about you? <clears throat> thanks, Vikas, and thanks for explaining the Alpha Fold 2 work so clearly. Um, I think it depends on what you mean by hype. I, I think where you're coming from, right? I mean, um, I think it is for real. I mean, as far as the science part of it is considered, the algorithm part of it is it's real. I mean, we can do things today using machine learning which we could not imagine 10 years ago, forget about much farther away, right? I mean, especially with the ad advancements of deep learning, we have, we are starting to achieve things which are impossible computationally or otherwise. I mean, there is always hype. I mean, having said that, there is always hype. Are we done yet? Are we there like, you know, where we can replicate humans consciousness and other things? No, no way. Uh, but, but it depends on how you look at it, right? I mean, for example, this, uh, the, the advancement that, uh, uh, you know, Vikas mentioned, it's amazing because it's not taking anyone's jobs. I mean, it is going to help us live longer, probably save lives. Uh, it is not about taking jobs. I think we should get away from that uh, uh, thing, right? I mean, we talk about India has so many poly, so many 
uh, problems that we, we can't find solutions to. So we should look at what we can do with it. I'll give you another example from our lab uh, about a, a medical problem called as diabetic retinopathy. So people who are diabetic in nature, as they grow old, they can actually become blind over time. And, and countries like India, Thailand, and a few other in Southeast Asia, that's where like it, it is a real problem. Millions of people every year go blind because of this. And it is completely curable. I mean, fortunate part is curable. Unfortunate is if detected in time and it doesn't happen because we don't have uh, that many ophthalmologists who can actually do it in time. Maybe in cities, you know, living in Delhi, Gurgaon, Bangalore, Mumbai, we, and having access to medical care. I mean, we people like us will be fine, but talk about millions I and mean, billions of people in hundreds of millions of people in villages. I mean, they don't have doctors, forget about ophthalmologists. They won't even have an eye doctor. Uh, I mean, so what's the solution? I mean, you can't rely on uh, generating a, you know, so milli, um, I mean, by some calculation we did, we need a, more than a million ophthalmologists to handle this. And we don't have even like few thousands uh, across the country who are specialized in this. So what do you do? So, I mean, uh, again, machinery to the rescue. So if you can take imagery using uh, some specific cameras and, and your algorithms can sort of act like a screener, I mean, it, it's still not taking the doctor away from the loop. I mean, but if it sort of uh, takes care of all the, you know, the easy cases, whether they are on the, you know, positive diagnosis or the negative diagnosis, then the real, I mean, the, the smaller group of experts have to just look at like the, the difficult cases. That's what we actually do. And, and we have built a system that does this actually better than an average ophthalmologist. And it is out there in public. It is already being rolled out in India and Thailand. I mean, there is bureaucracy involved, so there are a lot of things before it becomes uh, reaches a scale that we would want to do. But the reality is, we are we are you know we are solving real problems. We are solving problems that matter to lives. It is not so much about jobs. I mean, those jobs were up for grabs, but we didn't have doctors. We didn't have people who were doing it, and people were getting blind. So so that was unfortunate. So I think we have to look at it from a positive point of view. We have capabilities which we didn't have, so that's not hype. There will always be some hype, you know, especially because so much of money is involved, right? I mean. For example, you would have heard about GPT-3. Uh, I mean, that's again a massive advancements from where we used to be. Right? It's massive. But then when I looked at like, uh, you know, on social media, all these people who are venture capitalists or, or people who are like the business guys, right? They were all running after it. I mean, and uh, trust me, they will be disappointed because it's far from, you know, something that can make money for them. It can solve problems. It can solve problems where you want them to. But if your goal is just to make money or, you know, reduce your cost, I mean, then you will be disappointed. And, and that's where the hype happens. I think ha hype is created by people who don't understand it, who are not, who are just somehow want to mint it in some way or the other. But but it is for real. It is for real, and it is a long way to go. Like any other science, uh, you know, that has, I mean, ever since we were born, or you know, much earlier than that. I mean, it is a continuous process. It's not a destination. I mean, machine learning will come and go. New things, deep learning will stay for a few more years. Then something else will come. I mean, our the way we think will change. I mean, about computation, about uh, consciousness, and getting there, right? So, uh, so, so it is real. I mean, let's not get bogged down by the hype and say it is. Uh, so the answer is it's neither hype. You know, it is neither hype nor uh, as real as like you can just. Uh, it will you know it make people go away from from all jobs. That's not going to happen. We'll just have better jobs. It's like any other advancement technology. So that's my take on it. And and it is saving lives. So I I really uh, you know I'm really a fan of it. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Gaurav. You've just answered all my questions already. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Mukesh, let's uh, move on to you and get your view on it. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here. Hype or reality? I think it's an interesting question. Uh, 1993, when I, uh, when I uh, spoke with my faculty in my college, saying that I want to do something on this, uh, on the speech side of it, uh, my, my, my HOD told me from the college, you know, Mukesh, forget it. I said, why? Nobody will help you. Same thing happened in 1999 when I in Microsoft I joined and I raised my hand saying that I will solve Bill Gates problem for junk. And uh, same thing happened. And then people said, no, Mukesh, no, we don't, we are not ready there. And it worked. So my thing was, I think always there was always a suspicion or so, so whether it will happen or not happen. And I agree with Gaurav, as, as he said, right, um, probably hype for business side of it. But if you look at it, the, the evolution happened. The, the main evolution happened probably from the business side, I would say, is the intent side of it. When you're doing a search, when you're doing a search 2020, how does Google know, how does Bing know, what are you really searching for? I would say that is that is AI, that is really good, that's reality. 
at the same time last year nascom invited me to deliver master class on ai in bangalore and when i asked everybody uh, tell me who all have seen ai okay several hands went up when i asked them you can lower your hands if you are only talking about chatbot siri cortana or alexa most of the hands went down so yes reality hype you can make a difference there so yes i think it's still early stage i would say even though some of the in early innovation happened 20 20 25 years uh, but i would say still i would still early people are still figuring out what else can be done in ai and i think that there's a good opportunity for all of us to to lead or to be the torch bearer of course vikas and gaurav has shared some really good example i am not in that area i am more on the business side of it uh, wherein i am consulting companies uh, as a chief technology innovation officer to do this but i mean i think there's some small small things like fraud detection anomaly detection some of the work i have done for safety on the shop floor like can i detect a spark which is happening can i detect a <coughs> fire using ai i think a lot of those things are not definitely not replacing jobs but making a safer place for everybody to use it and the more more we do more computational more ideas i think is better uh, some other parts on farming and i've just taken up a project for nature conservation on using ai i think there are a lot of a uh, lot of things are there and especially now when i'm consulting couple of colleges Uh, we are talking about investing in the areas of explainable ai and ethical ai i think that's what the future is whatever we do as long as we keep those explainable and ethical in mind i think we should be fine so that is my submission to you dr sarab great thank you mukesh uh, and vijay um, would you like to take give us your take yeah uh, so uh, first of all uh, thank you for you know uh, inviting me uh, to the panel Uh, I come from you know startup world where um, unless we really solve the problems, uh, our you know customers are not going to pay us. Uh, so from you know that perspective, unless we make things work on the ground, uh, and um, unless the AI actually helps people to make their decisions, you know better, um, you know uh, 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 it's not going to help anybody. so so from you know that perspective of course we need to have a you know fine balance between what we you know commit to the customers in terms of what uh, you know uh, ai can do versus the you know hard uh, you know challenges of ai uh, today and you know i'm assuming that because uh, it is part of uh, you know uh, uh, you know university and there will be a few profs and you know students as a part of the audience right um i don't believe that there is anything like ai today because the you know systems that we have today are hardly uh, you know uh, intelligent uh, so they don't have any sense of reasoning they don't have any sense of uh, you know questioning what we have is a very advanced form of uh, you know machine learning where with deep learning uh, with a lot of data and a lot of compute we have understood you know how to solve problems in a faster way and uh, with uh, perhaps more uh, you know uh, accuracy right so uh, to to you know give you my example uh, so as a part of ibm research uh, in in 2012 uh, i used to take almost a month to train uh, in what are called as uh, rbms um, and you you know run a job and it takes about a month to actually you know, get a output to understand if uh, the rbm has you know trained or not and if you have done a very simple mistake in your code right your entire month is gone but from that point in uh, in a matter of uh, you know 8 years we are at a point where you know if you have to train a very simple image classifier it just hardly takes you you know 2 hours right and with just a you know few uh, you know you know thousands of images you, know, you could solve the problem right so i think uh, you know obviously that kind of uh, you know leap has happened over last uh, you know you know you know uh, you know uh, you know uh, decade also now um the example of uh, you know alpha fold right um you know if you think about it i mean uh, i like to divide things into uh, three you know buckets right problems that need you know reasonably good data and you know compute uh, you know problems that need you know lot of data and in you know, a problems that need a uh, lot of you know compute right or both um so if you think about uh, the you know problems like you know uh, spam you know filtering right so perhaps with you know enough data and compute you know you could you know solve that problem perhaps in a in a few days or so but if you think about problems like uh, you know uh, alpha go zero right where uh, the you know program actually 
uh, you know, learn to solve uh, the problem, right, of, uh, you know, Go, uh, you know, as a game, right? So that program, uh, I think, ran on perhaps, you know, millions of, you know, games, right? So clearly, that kind of, you know, system required uh, a lot of, you know, data, right? And today, if you have to have those kinds of, you know, systems in, you know, practice, we don't have in that much of, you know, data with us. If you think about you know, alpha fold, right? Uh, you know, perhaps the, you know, requirement of data was not, you know, huge, but uh, the team has worked, uh, the, you know, uh, in Deep Mind team has worked uh, on that for over, you know, four years, right? So it's not, you know, something that has happened in a, in a few days. Um, and uh, perhaps they have, you know, worked on it, you know, trained models for over, you know, few months of time period, right? So, you know, clearly, and that's a problem which required a lot of, you know, compute to be available, right? Uh, and, uh, and there are, you know, a lot of problems which need, you know, both, right? Unless you have a lot of data and, you know, of, you know, compute, it's just not, you know, possible, uh, you know, for us to even, you know, uh, you know, attempt these kinds of problems. So, um, so I feel um, um, in terms of the, you know, progress that we have done in, you know, deep learning, of course, uh, over last, you know, decade, uh, a lot of things have uh, improved, but I don't think these, you know, systems have any kind of intelligence or any kind of, uh, uh, you know, anything that we can call as being, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, intelligent. So, you know, that's my take on that. Brilliant. Thank you. So now we've got some provocation happening, which is good. I was worried that everybody is going on to one side saying, yeah, yeah, of course, we've got AI. So thanks uh, for adding that dimension. Uh, Vijay, you had talked about how uh, you break these, uh, you know, problems into those that need a lot of data, those that need a lot of compute, and those that, you know, don't have a lot of data available. Um, you know, when we talk to cognitive scientists, for example, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Ranko uh, from Germany uh, was was uh, giving a talk, Danko uh, Maladnik, actually, um, and uh, he was talking about how uh, from a cognitive science perspective, what we are doing in deep learning doesn't make a lot of sense because humans don't need thousands of images to be able to classify one concept. Um, you know, so, you know, is deep learning a distraction uh, or, uh, you know, is it not important for us to try and model AI on cognitive processes? And of course, we don't understand cognitive processes well enough, which could be a barrier, right? So what is your take on I mean, uh, yeah, uh, to my limited knowledge, uh, I don't think as a, uh, you know, race, we understand uh, how our you know, brain works, <clears throat> first of all. And hence, yeah, you know, comparing deep learning with the way our you know, brain works is, uh, uh, I don't think it's a good uh, analogy. Um, that said, of course, um, deep learning is modeled after uh, the way we do uh, you know, decisions. Uh, and to that extent, I think we are on the you know fairly you know uh, right track. But just these systems are you know clearly you know, not enough. If we have to embed, let's say you know reasoning, right? Or you know, if we have to embed you know questioning. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, you know, just to take example of you know GPT three, right? Uh, if you have, I mean, uh, you know, some of you may have read in uh, you know, a critique by in uh, you know, a Gary Marcus, uh, um, you know, on that, right? And I mean, I'm not a big fan of the you know non non uh, you know uh, deep learning approach, but still, it it basically implies that um, there is clearly there are a lot of blocks that we are you know missing uh, as a part of you know just deep learning, right? Uh, which we need in very simple things, right? So um, deep learning models today fail miserably on you know test data that they you know, have not seen as a part of their you know training set you know even if you have you know very simple you know perturbations as a part of your input right uh, the model could fail right so it it you know, implies that um, um, there is i mean uh, in terms of both algorithms as well as the you know process uh, we have uh, a lot to do Great, thank you. I should apologize to Danko Nikolic. I actually mispronounced his name, but that was the cognitive scientist I was talking to. Uh, Vikas, what, what's your take on this? <clears throat> ah, I fully agree with Vijay. <laughs> okay, 
So you're switching sides. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. Go on, go on. <laughs> so, so, in fact, I would like to show some data supporting what uh, Vijay said. Mm -hmm. Great. So, just a second. Let me just switch to the correct slide here. Okay. So, um, well, actually, I, I would like to lay out a little bit more of what Vijay was saying that uh, the model, purely data driven models. Uh, can get fooled by themselves, or we can get fooled by them. Right? So there is, in my opinion, there is five kinds of getting fooled. Uh, one is poor problem formulation or under specification. This has recently been published by uh, Alexo Amur uh, et al. By, from Google. Uh, that many complex models may fit the same data, but they will produce very different results in the field. So this is a fundamental problem. Uh, also, you could give me wrong reinforcement. I'll show you examples of that. Right? Uh, the training data could include biases, leakage, confounding. You're, or you could go after wrong features, concepts, or relationships in your model. Uh, the point that uh, Vijay mentioned, your input could be outside of the training distribution. So without any perturbation, you will get incorrect answers. Or your, your model will try to sort of force fit the input into the distribution. Or there might be input perturbations small enough that humans will find, let's say, the speech or image or data normal, but for machine, it's beyond the decision boundary. Or there might be input large enough that no human would consider it in the class, but the machine finds it within the class. So this is sort of the um, overall story of getting fooled. And I can uh, you know, go on to examples of what you, you know, you, you may not believe me, but I'll show you examples. Okay? So one is this example of an AI system where asthma patients were more likely to survive, asthma and heart patients were more likely to survive pneumonia. Right? Now, the problem here was that the system did not know that the patients of asthma or heart disease tend to be man, monitored more closely. Right? So the hospital data is systematically biased. So your models will perform wrongly. Right? Another is we are going after the wrong concepts or wrong relationships, or you just don't know that optimizing for the score does the wrong thing. So for example, here is a little model trying to optimize for a high score in this game. Right? This is a boat racing game. Now notice that this thing figured out that if you hit those two locations, those three little locations here, one, two, three, Right? You keep getting a score and you get higher and higher. Now, obviously, this is not this was not the intent. So th this is a well-known example. Instead of dogs, you're really looking at the snow. Right? Uh, although classification is all correct, but it's only looking at the snow. Another example, which, is, which has to do with model predictive fit versus model specification, is so in this case, you have a person you switch the position of the lips and the uh, eyes. It's still a person, you just invert the image, it's cold black color, right? Now, of course, the issue here is that the body that's uh, working here is not taking care of relative orientation, translation, or casual relationship of features, which is why uh, Jeffrey Hinton uh, said that, you know, these networks are doomed because the pooling operation is a big mistake. And so he came, he came up with, uh, 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 capsule networks, again, no, no time for that, but I'll, I'll go on. Again, another example where simply by lying down the opponent here, the red opponent, just by lying down, he can disable the uh, the victim here. You can see just by lying down, you, you this thing doesn't even work. Okay, another example. So Jeffrey Hinton came up with, we should stop training radiologists now. This was two years ago. Okay. Now, the problem with this is, not so fast, Dr. Hinton. Why? Because this does not work at loss hospitals, gets confused, cheats inadvertently. So I'll show you examples, right? So for example, it's giving high scores to this portable machine marker or the laterality marker on the uh, X-ray. Or another one here, when the laterality marker is missing or the portable machine is missing, it's giving a negative score. So basically, portable machines are likely to have more sick patients. So you're going to classify or give a higher score to that. Or the scan signature of a specific machine is giving high weights to that. In fact, higher weight than everything else in the grid, if you see here. Right? The scan signature of a specific machine is getting a higher score here. So uh, 
therefore ai will not replace radiologists but radiologists using ai might replace those who do not so there are examples out of distribution and so on but I, again uh, we can I, i i'm just trying to make a point that what vijay was uh, saying is born out in the field Oh, great. Um, and of course, talking about Jeff Hinton, he also said that science progresses one funeral at a time, and the future depends on the graduate student who is uh, deeply suspicious of everything that I have said. Right. So, so uh, at the same time, we seem to be uh, uh, moving towards creating citizen data scientists and and not uh, you know allowing people to get deep into. um you know the maths and the and the technology itself so are we uh, you know in some way uh, you know putting a pickaxe through our our own foot here uh, if we are not going to create um, uh, these uh, researchers and 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 people who are focused on creating the next wave and you know all of us uh, you know vijay you don't have a gray beard like me so you may not have experienced this but you know we've seen when decision trees were the best things that were out there and then you know support vectors became the next one machines and then random forests and you know now deep learning uh, you know are we coming to the end of the deep learning era in some ways and people realizing limitations and is there going to be something new that's going to come out next right uh, god of what's your view on that um i mean it's hard to say uh, i mean if it is coming to an end but i think uh, just to take a leap from what we just said or what vikas said i think a uh, lot of these uh, you know if you is going away and all these hard questions are being answered as we speak uh, right i mean whether it is about out of distribution whether it is the brittleness of models whether it is explainability so all these are actually you know uh, it is like when we criticize the models for for these errors it is like a, to me it is like a confirmation bias i told you so it's not going to work seriously i mean because like every technology when it comes uh, and i agree with it, there's no intelligence in it it's just optimization finally it is just mathematics uh, so i'm not I, i'm not saying it is intelligent by any means it is just a mathematical optimizations which works very well for specific tasks so it is not very general also it's task specific till now although there is a lot of research on to make them a little more general purpose as far as the requirement of data and compute goes again uh, there have been like lot of advancements recently not not there yet but which reduce the requirement of label data for example i mean all these self supervision techniques or or you know on you know semi supervised techniques are are actually sort of almost at par with the fully supervised techniques so i think there is a lot of effort being done that you can have like these sort of let's say uh, pre trained networks you know on 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 data of that kind and then you just need a little bit of more data of your problem and you can just do away with it so it's like these models come for free basically they are like it's like a you know like a coding paradigm nothing else so you don't have to it's like in instantiating a class in some language right so so all these like while the issues have been there and, and naturally because when things started working well uh, in around 2012 with the alexnet and other papers that came out i think there was a euphoria and people wanted to try this on every every problem every data and without realizing without understanding where it will fail but i think uh, to in the last few years uh, i think there's a lot of focus on how, you know understanding why it works even that understanding was missing the mathematical basis of why it works or what may break it was missing and i think there's a lot of focus on that and and that's why like i'm uh, i'm i think it is it will evolve into something so i won't call it like a, it will you know deep learning's era is coming to an end because i think we are going deeper into we are not just using it as a tool but we are understanding the mathematical basis for example uh, vikas mentioned capsule networks i think uh, Thank, because it started with hinton so but but i think it is sort of not becoming popular anymore i mean i mean in fact he is also doubt, i mean i think he has said it in a few talks that he is also doubtful about uh, capsule networks uh, so there are like uh, you know to me all this is part of evolution we will do some brown in motion but but for certain we are making progress and deep learning may evolve into something else uh but we may call it something else but uh, it's it's a continuum to me it's not like a, this is going to end and suddenly we will be worrying okay, about what to do next it's it's I, i don't see that happening anytime soon because there is a lot of unanswered questions we don't know uh, how to do things right and and all these issues that vikas laid out are, are real and and we are seeing progress on them but there is a long way to go before we address them to our satisfaction and other thing you mentioned i think the part of the hype is also created because of the tools we have uh, created which make it very easy for even a you know 
middle school kid to actually as long as he knows how to operate a computer they can just create a model it, it's so easy i mean it, you don't even have to re be really good in programming or anything so so unfortunate part is like that ease of creating models has been misused or abused by a lot of people who don't want to learn maths or go deeper into optimizations and they okay yeah you know you do cat and dog it works i'm mean, great i mean if you want to stay to that level yeah i mean you will be disappointed but if you want to be real in this i mean solve problems which are unsolvable i mean i mean cat and dog is an example it's a lab experiment i mean the goal was not to distinguish between cat and dog i don't think that was the goal <laughs> right so i think that's where the way to understand and that's why getting to maths and solving problems is key and and lot of people are doing it uh, despite lot of noise around it right thank you gorov uh, you know we will come back to this you keep answering questions that i haven't asked yet which is fantastic you know but uh, uh, mukesh uh, what about you i mean what's your view uh, you know is neural networks going to remain the the centerpiece of of uh, machine learning or do you think uh, we're going to see uh, a comeback by some of the other algorithms so i would say i probably have a opposite view around those because it's like this right it's it's a, it's a kid ai is a kid we allow it to learn whatever they want of course it's going to learn wrong things as vikas said as vijay have pointed out right maybe we need to have a, a, a probably better way to do it like supervised model right uh, so for example for now, any algorithm i write even today when i write right i do i don't rely on ai completely because it's still a kid for for me right so it's a combination of a business rules and human intelligence which can make it better because the purpose is to how can i get value out of it and as gorov said right uh, any any anybody my my son when he was in 6th grade he was able to create a model does he know ai no but it was just the api he just need to call and then from google just figure out how to do it but then do, do we understand the math behind it right as vikas said right the, the x ray if we allow it to check whatever they want they'll check the one with the l and other things and all which is not right in the first place so that's why even my first algorithm when i wrote in 1999 at microsoft the thing was no it was not it was not automated it was all supervised in the beginning and slowly once you understand the signal the behavioral signals validation of those a reinforcement learning probably would become much closer to that than automated deep learning that is what i i would say and uh, as i go forward right, so if, if you talk on the business part of it the explainable ai is the keyword here uh, i was talking to indian institute of statistics uh, some some lead senior faculty over there and i was saying that i think if you don't have explainable i think it's going to die much faster than it started because some of the laws now uh, globally are allow uh, are expected us to explain why we rejected why we this took such certain decision so explainability part is there and i would call it more like a glass box we need to go get to more and more to a glass box model to be make it explainable so with neural network and deep learning and all as long as there is some explainability i think that will work and then fine tuning can human make fine tuning because we cannot discount human intelligence yet i would say there's still a long way to go yes ai can help us automate certain things certain understanding and all but yeah if we don't have human uh, will be challenge so i keep telling people right when with this uh, 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 when the, when the cricket match is going virat kohli how much score is going to be done are you sure you have factored in uh, anushka sharma whether she is there in the stadium or not i think that part is there because we we need understand this right uh, humans but artificial intelligence may not understand this so that is my submission around here great thank you so uh, you know if i summarize what we are we are saying here is lots of advancements have taken place but uh, maybe the label of artificial intelligence isn't quite right uh, you know it's intelligent humans using efficient tools and good tools with good computing power that is actually kind of delivering uh, a lot of the promises that we are seeing delivered upon uh, so uh, you know again uh, mukesh you mentioned um, uh, reinforcement learning and uh, you know this whole kind of work that's been happening around game playing right and i remember back in 1997 and just to put it in context for the students that are listening to us here that was one year before google was was established right uh, when uh, deep blue beat kasparov and of course uh, since then we've seen lots of advancements and we've actually seen alpha go uh, actually beat um, you know humans at a much more complex uh, strategy game Uh, and of course we know that uh, a lot of the learning that was done it was self learning right uh, that that resulted in alpha go uh, beating the human so uh, you know have we kind of got to that you know final frontier where ai is able to you know learn itself and uh, you know are we getting to a point where ai can actually confront the world as an autonomous agent today uh, let's start with you mukesh i would say no uh, i would use a hindi word called picture abhi baki hai uh there is lot more time to to that i think if if we all we go with this pace <clears throat> probably three more years 
uh, to get there. Uh, that's my understanding. Uh, because a couple of points, right? So first of all, we cannot let AI learn on its own. It does learn, but yeah, it may learn wrong things. So as long as like you, uh, we all know about the example of Microsoft Pay, right? The, the, the chatbot we started using racist comment and all. Because it doesn't understand, it will ask question. And if we feed the wrong information, it will learn from those parts. So that part of fine tuning, that part of control is required. And, and then you can imagine, right? Like, like top companies like, like Microsoft, Facebook, and Google, when this kind of thing happen over there, it can happen anywhere, right? So it is uh, recently, I think day before yesterday, one of a uh, politician made a tweet and it got translated into Hindi, completely wrong tweet, wrong, wrong, wrong meaning of that, right? So I think there's still a long way to go. Uh, one of the things which I found useful is, you know, as the training is going, as long as we have some checkpoint, maybe there are 20 checkpoint, uh, if, if it's taking one month to learn, we, we give one checkpoint every day and then, see, and then fine tune it continuously to get there. I think that would be the res result. And maybe three years from now, maybe we'll only have to have 30% involvement of human, 40% involvement of human compared to her. right now. I think still think we need 80% involvement of human to make this as a powerful machine to, to help us take decisions, take decisions better. Wow, so three, three to four years, that's kind of the length of a degree, right? So we are probably dealing with an 18-year-old AI now. <laughs> so, Vijay, uh, what's your take on this? Yeah. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so I, I mean, um, I don't think deep learning is you know, going to go anywhere. I think it's you know, here to stay. And at least for next... Uh, five years or so, uh, we're going to see a lot of applications out of deep learning, which can solve real problems in the world. Um, and I don't think, um, I mean, uh, so you see a lot of advancements in research, which say that, look, the models work with less data and uh, they, they don't need uh, a lot of, you know, uh, label data and other things. But uh, in practice, uh, Transforming those into uh, you know applications um, which can work, it is hard uh, you know uh, even today. So um, I think there's this whole you know, paradigm uh, you know just to share one slide, and uh, I thought uh, I will you know, make a point that it's not just because I'm also prepared with my slides. Uh, so <laughs> so um, so I think in there is this uh, you know whole you know paradigm of uh, software 2.0, right where uh, there are you know two parts one part is how do you prepare data faster and you know better and other thing is how do you write software where perhaps you know writing you know long codes you you know instead of a code now you have a you know a, you know, a, a model right so uh, so if you think about you know preparing data right so um, and you know i'll just give this example here right where uh, i think google had their uh, language you know translation system uh, which uh, not I think long ago, maybe about you know, you know three years back or so, they had almost you know, 500,000 you know, lines of code. If you have to translate you know one you know, sentence from you know, one language to other, right? But now that same system is replaced by just you know 500 lines of code, right? And the you know key thing here is that over last you know three years uh, they have prepared a lot of you know, you know, uh, you know, data sets, um, you know, which were a factor of uh, getting a lot of, you know, people to, you know, tag data, as well as building tools by which, let's say, if you have to translate uh, a sentence from, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 English to Hindi, right? The, you know, model would first predict the actual, you know, translation, and a human would do the correction. And with that kind of loop, you can create a, a large amount of you know data, right? It's it's not like you are you know asking people to do that from scratch, right? So I think those kinds of you know systems uh, you know, will become uh, a lot more uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, important, right? Uh, because unless you have data which is not biased, which is large, and which has a lot of you know you know you know uh, you know distribution, right? Uh, uh, I don't think it is possible for us to train our models. And the you know, second thing, as I said, right? So I think uh, you know, Gaurav mentioned about this, right? That it's it's like uh, initializing a class with a you know pre-trained model, right? So you know, you will see you know, software being written where instead of writing a large you know, piece of code, now you have you know, AI models. So these two the paradigms combined, we have software in 2.0. 
where you know if you have to write a code or if you have to you know solve a problem or write an application these two aspects will be important so so i think um deep learning is important it is uh, you know uh, you know uh, i don't think it is going anywhere the importance of how do you create data is uh, you know uh, only going to increase and uh, a combination of two uh, will see a uh, large scale impact in the world great thank you uh, gorov uh, your view on um, you know whether whether ai is ready to be autonomous and uh, you know do experiments on on the real world and and learn I don't know what you mean by autonomous. Are you talking about like it learns of its own without yes. uh, without yeah. having a task at hand? Yes. So, right. I mean, a taskless learning in a way. Right. I mean, it's not like we are designing, say, uh, image recognition or uh, disease uh, detection or something. Right. Or even a task of winning go. Right. So there could be a task, but right. uh, you know, kind of fairly loose task without defining. Yeah. Task. So I don't know if that. Uh, I think it is still some way to go. I, uh, and I'll probably relate it to what Vijay was just talking about. i think the the way ai or deep learning more so uh, uh, is going to evolve into is like the i think we have very sophisticated techniques uh, and that obviously will keep evolving them we have huge amount of compute which we didn't have earlier with gpus and now tpus and i mean there's the massive amount of computations and and there are frameworks which sort of make use of these uh, compute resources uh, the key thing again remains because like uh, you also mentioned uh, you know uh, uh it's not human because as humans we you you i think mentioned we don't look at thousand images to call it call it cat it cat or a dog it dog right that is true but we we have a lot of context uh, right i mean think if you think from human point of view i mean you can think of like the, when child is born probably it is like a pre trained model i mean it's not like born out of thin air right i mean i mean the, the brain has something i mean it has it has uh, you know the blood and cells of all its parents uh, right so 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 something is coming in there right and then and then we are continuously observing something right i mean uh, it is not like it's not like suddenly one day i see cat and then that's when i get to know it's a cat i mean i have been observing the world around me all the time and then over time all that is leading to some sort of cognition capability right so i think that's what i really believe uh, you know uh, part of the efforts will go into i mean because this sort of uh, it's by done some basically you know sort of curating data procuring data labeling it i think the labeling part has already been being answered but i think it should be just it should be completely multimodal i mean whatever you see feel hear uh, or do uh, in a reinforcement sense it should lead to something i think such kind of like a general purpose uh, self learning continuously learning systems are still some way to go they are still in infancy in terms of research also i think people are talking about it there are few early papers Uh, but long way to go but i think that's where a lot of focus will come into how i mean how do we just continuously keep observing and and make use of data maybe the task is still well defined it's not like again 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 the goal is not to become intelligent but goal is to become better by observing more and more for the task that you were already doing uh, right uh, for, uh, right so so that is where i i think things will go i mean in, in addition to the problems that uh, vikas already mentioned the transfer uh, explainability the Uh, robustness and all those things are there obviously but i think that's i mean that's going to happen very very soon i think with the with the advancements in research i think it's not very far uh, from being deployed in real systems but i think the the lo- little lo- medium term goal will be to how do how do you make the system just pick data of their own i mean for task will be well defined but the data capture will be probably you don't need a human to curate that data that's that's a big blocker and and not natural way of learning anyway right right that's sort of my take Well, I mean, a, a child. I mean, so you're you're suggesting a child is actually getting born with common sense knowledge or some kind of, uh, you know. Um, I mean, uh, yes, right. <laughs> I mean, something. I mean, the child is still forget. I mean, how? Like when you look at, uh, say, puppies in your neighborhood or something. I mean, they they do. They sort of at least they know like they have to be around their mother, right? I mean, all the time. They, right, right, right. Right. I mean, they can walk around, but they are like very scared. And over time, they say like if you are feeding them like stray puppies, some biscuits, they see their mother is coming close, and then they also feel comfortable. So they have, I mean, that that is some some logic. I think that is I some think instinct. More reason. Yeah, there is some reasoning there. Actually, more reasoning than our AI systems have today. Seriously, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. And how how does that happen? So they are born with some. Some pre-trained model, you can call it, right? Which is driven by their parents, essentially. 
Right. And, and, and of course, they're I mean, doing multitask learning, right, at the same time. So I mean, it's not even that focused. Is, yeah, I mean, in our, in our mythology, we have Abhimanyu, right? So I think we can believe that. <laughs> Agarwal, uh, Vikas Agarwal, what about you? What, what's your view on this? So I'm looking at this from a, see, see you were saying, you know, this thing can solve AR, it can solve games and you can do, you know, for example, you know, even AlphaFold, right? Now, AlphaFold, I think is, a, is going in the right direction, I would say, but up to the games, uh, I would like to present a slightly different view with respect to enterprise, you know, solving problems in the enterprise, like what we do uh, here. So let me just share this just a second. Uh, I'm just doing it. Am I already sharing? No. no okay. Now I'm sharing, I think. Um, okay. So, Sarab comes and says, I have solved game X. What is this little enterprise problem? So, here is my take on that. So, the, the challenge is in the real world, the problem statement is often not well formulated. It requires careful science of the domain. Uh, so, and that deep domain expertise makes a difference between a toy system versus an in-production high-value system. That's one thing. Um, second is the goal in games, it's usually clear, but the goal in uh, enterprise systems is it often needs to be first determined and carefully specified. And questions that models need to answer are counterfactual. So we need causal models for that. It just, you know, simply, uh, models which uh, are looking at regularities in data don't work so well. And in games, the rules of the game, which is the relationships of different entities, and the board, which is the causal domain knowledge, these are not known in the enterprise, or they are not at least well represented. So this is a fundamental problem uh, in uh, solving problems uh, using these techniques. Right? And then the other problem is there's a lack of direct feedback. There's no leaderboard, for example, as on Kaggle. Uh, you're on your own you leader. You're, you're supposed to figure out what works. Data is often not predetermined. So this is, goes back to the point that Gaurav was making. It is not pre-collected. It's not pre-cleaned. You clean it today. You don't even know what data to start for a given problem. Because first you have to define the problem. Then you have to say what, what data is required. Where does it come from? It often Data cannot often be generated on demand like in games. Uh, your data changes, your test set is dynamic, your train set is dynamic, and so you have to keep testing, refactoring right, in, in the enterprise. This is a fundamental problem. And then the models need to work with people. So, uh, and, and there's this fundamental problem with once you make a metric, you know, then people work around it. And all output needs to be converted to vitamin M as in money. You have to worry about behavioral psychology when you're creating systems for humans. You know, so, you know, often interventions and analysis is driven by irrational choices. Uh, there are constraints, you know, there's, you know, in terms of response time, memory, compute, all of that matters. And engineering and scalability can kill you. So, of course, you know, these are problems in any case. Now, there's one, one more problem, which uh, Joshua Benjo, Benjo has been pointing out, uh, which is, just for a second. Uh, uh, sorry, just for a second. Um, which uh, I should have it here. I should have it here. Right here. Right? That uh, the assumption that the test data is from the same distribution as training data is too strong. Now, this is what you teach everybody in every single machine learning course. Right? That, you know, the assumption is that the test and training data are basically from the same distribution. And they end up being because you take a big data set and you partition it. Or you also have some validation set, but the, again, the assumption is that that is, uh, you know, uh, not out of distribution. Now, what we need to consider doing is we have to consider relaxed assumption. I have shamelessly copied this from Joshua Benjo's slides. Right? Uh, so that we have to assume that the test data will generate the same causal dynamics, as in the input distribution may be different. But the business processes or whatever is churning that data and giving you the output is the same. So if you make a stronger assumption than that, which is that 
uh, you know, test data is coming from the same distribution, then you're going to have a problem. And so his take is that humans generalize better than others due to more accurate internal model of the underlying causal relationships. So therefore, uh, to, to think that, you know, you can take a purely data-driven system and you'll be able to create something that works in production in the real world is a very far away pipe dream. I, I could talk about narrow AI and AGI and so on. I, you know, we could talk about that, but I don't want to get into philosophical discussions. And you know, Mukesh was a little bit, uh, you know, I, I would say he was quite optimistic on that because most people have made predictions on that which go beyond their lifetime. So, uh, you know, they say 30 years, you know, 40 years. So <laughs> he, he's been a little optimistic. Sure, sure. I just Sorry? I just missed by a zero. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. For example, the protein folding thing that uh, we uh, Gaurav told us about, right? Mm. That is something I was not expecting to happen in my life. So, you know, anything is possible. <clears throat> mm. True. Uh, so, um, there's a question from the audience. Does AI have any role for decoding the protein structure of virus where strain is constantly changing and dynamic in nature? Because do you want to take it? You're the one most qualified to say. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, so this is exactly what the deep find folks did. In fact, I showed you that slide. They, they were the first ones to come up with. So, in fact, I had the coronavirus case here. Right. So, this is this the, oops, the protein. I'm sorry. I think I'm not sharing it. Just a minute. Just a minute. Am I sharing? No. Sorry, just a second. Uh, caught between PowerPoint and uh, yes. okay. Here. So if I share this, right? So if you go back, right? In fact, uh, the deep pine team were the first one to decode the uh, structure of the corona. This this is uh, Actually, they, they decoded three coronavirus proteins. I don't, I didn't note down the name of this protein, but I guess you know uh, it may not matter for this discussion. But yes, so now the challenge, of course, is you know compared to let's say several years it used to take people, this the influence on this still takes several days with uh, you know 200 GPUs. Okay. So still, it's an expensive problem, but it's a you know it's a solved problem now, which is amazing. Great, thank you, because uh, so we are running up to uh, the end of the session. So uh, I'd like all of you to provide, uh, you know, a, a short uh, view on, you know, advice to students that are starting off in the AI uh, space. Uh, what should they be doing today to get to where you guys are? Uh, let's start with Vikas. Okay, don't do what I did. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the, 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 the I, th I think Mukesh would be, would be a very interesting person to hear from in this. But what I would say is that uh, we do need to have very strong foundation in whatever science we are learning. I feel that personally, that the idea of data science itself is a fad. What people need to do is solve problems in their domain. So let's say you are a mechanical engineer. Right? You will need to do computations in your area. That's your data science. Many jobs, that's your science. Previously, it used to be called science. Now they've tagged on the word data science. The science, you know, like Newton, when he came up with his models, he was using Kepler's data or Tycho Brahe's data, right? So he was a data scientist of his time. And, and you know, so, uh, so my recommendation is that one should not be taken in by the hype of data. Being a data scientist will pay you more, perhaps in the short run, but, you know, until people realize that you cannot actually get production models with just running a few machine learning algorithms. Until that point, people will still get paid more than others. But once that, that particular balloon breaks, your fundamental knowledge in your field is going to really be valuable. So yes, if you want to do data science, do it in, the, in, in a particular field with great depth, which a lot of people are doing you know, in, in pharma and manufacturing and so forth. Okay? So uh, one should not get taken in by the hype. 
Right. Like, I think that you're going to get paid more just because you're a Google. You know, you've got that some you know some course that you've done and so on. It's not going to necessarily get you paid more. I have to short term here. Thank you, Mukesh. Sure. I think this is the right time to to start looking at it uh, because uh, in in India now several universities have started a specific course uh, and also a lot of uh, uh, information available free of cost a lot of courses available as well so I would say focus on the data the possibilities are enormous but keep learning use cases right of course uh, no it's, it's still new a lot of them can be uh, innovated here don't just go by what other companies have done what other people are telling you you write your own part and the biggest one is NLP algorithm. I would say not a single algorithm I've seen which can detect Indian English, right? Huge opportunities there. So as Vikas also said, right? So look for data in all the fields and then try to live with data. I would, I, would, I call it data-driven innovation. And that is what I think the future looks like. So I think we say go go for data and then a lot of things to, to learn will come, come your way automatically. Thank you, Bukesh. And Vijay? Right. Uh, let me just share one screen. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, if you want to be a persona like a uh, you know, research scientist, so when I was in IBM, uh, I, you know, I had this designation in the research scientist, and I used to completely you know hate that because I was you know neither doing research nor you know, I was doing science. But if you want to be a you know research scientist kind of uh, you know persona, I think clearly you know you need to have at least uh, ten years of view. Um, so. At this point, I can you know speak about being an uh, engineer because in you know, all of us, uh, I, I you know presume are engineers where we solve you know problems, and uh, if you want to solve a problem in you know, real world, uh, the most uh, important you know skill that you need to have is to prepare uh, very well defined you know, data sets. So if you be a you know, data set hacker, which means uh, be you know smart in terms of how do you you know, collect data, how do you synthesize, how do you augment, and then understand if you need to solve the problem, you know, if you have to build an application over a time period of, let's say, a, you know, you know, six months to a year, right? Uh, how do you go about, you know, formulating that problem with the right data? If you can, uh, you know, have the skill, uh, I think you will be in the, you know, top in the industry. So that's my uh, advice to you know, students. Brilliant. Thank you. And then, so moving on to the research scientist today. So, Gaurav, <laughs> what's your view? Uh, I think listen to everything that Vijay Vikas and uh, uh, you know Mukesh have said. I'll just add another thing. Don't skip your maths 101 or 201 or whatever. Don't miss your classes. I mean, maths is so critical. I think, unfortunately, a lot of uh, so-called scientists today, data scientists, otherwise, they, they don't know what they are doing, unfortunately. Uh, they know how to build models, but they don't know the underlying maths and they are not innovating, unfortunately. I mean, maybe the, you know, the use case innovation, the business innovation, but the, but, but not in this, you know, the, the creating any new, new IP, if you want to call it. So, so I would highly recommend, remember your integrals, differentiation, uh, partial differential equations, because that's what is going to evolve deep learning into something else or, and then beyond it, uh, you know, uh, somehow it has been, uh, in the quest for early results, just by creating these models, I think people are forgetting even linear algebra, forget about anything beyond that. And that's very, very important. Please, please don't skip your mathematics classes. That's more important than anything else you will learn in college. Music to my ears. Thank you so much, uh, Gaurav. And uh, I'm going to uh, invite my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ms. Kiran Khattar uh, to uh, provide some concluding remarks. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, we have come to the end of the session, but I hope we all were enjoying this session. And uh, uh, sir, I remember you said somewhere in the session, science advances one funeral at a time. So I would like to sum up this session by saying that a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the diet, but rather because its opponents eventually die and new generation grows up that is familiar with it. That's what's happening with artificial intelligence. The field of AI is continuously evolving. We started off with neural networks, then we advanced to machine learning, deep learning, and nowadays we all emphasize on the supervised way of learning, yes? As panelists said that, there is a long way to go and explore with the hope to have autonomous artificial intelligent agents which can pick and curate the data on its own. So I hope that day will come very soon. Now I would like to conclude the session by thanking all of our distinguished members of the panel for really excellent insights onto the questions that were raised in. I would also like to thank Dr. Sarabjot Singh for serving as a moderator. 
Finally, as an appreciation for the eminent speakers for the time and their valuable inputs that they have shared with us all today in this session, I would like to offer this small memento virtually. BML Manjal University is honored to present the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Vikas Agarwal for sharing his valuable insight as an esteemed panelist during this technical conclave. Thank you, sir. BML Manjal University is honored to present the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Vijay Gavale for sharing his valuable insight as an esteemed panelist during technical conclave at BMU. Thank you for your time, sir. BML Manjal University is honored to present the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Gaurav Agarwal for sharing his valuable insight as an esteemed panelist during this technical conclave. Thank you for your input, sir. BML Manjal University is honored to present the certificate of appreciation to Mr. Mukesh Jain for sharing his valuable insights as an esteemed panelist during this technical conclave. Thank you for your input, sir. Thank you, ma'am. On behalf of BML Manjal University, we would like to thank you for your time. Your presence has been very valuable to us today. And we certainly look forward to have another interaction sometime in the future. We would definitely request Sarabjot Singh, sir, to have such kind of interaction on AI and machine learning. Uh, maybe uh, in the future, next semester, we can have it. Uh, this Momento and Amazon voucher uh, will be sent to your inbox shortly. At the last, I would like, like to thank my students, my fellow colleagues, academicians, and industry professionals for joining this session on artificial intelligence hyperreality. I hope all of you have enjoyed the session. And uh, next session is on future factories, robotics, and automation at 1 p.m. See you all in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
good afternoon everyone uh, as our next session is on future factories robotics and automation so i would like to call up my dear friend neeraj to take it from here good afternoon ladies and gentlemen i am neeraj puri third year computer science student in bmi university i would like to extend my warm welcome to you all for attending this session on future robotics innovation and automation in this era of globalization and competitiveness productivity plays a vital role in country's economy bringing necessity to switch on the automation in robotics to match the productivity pattern as india is transforming into an automobile hub these technologies will make use of automation and robots flexible and agile that can adapt perform different functions and roles in an integrated manner i would now like to invite the moderator for today's session mr maheshwar dwivedi Dr. Maheshwar is currently working as an associate professor in mechanical department in BML Munjal University since 2014. Prior to that, he worked at Bits Pilani for over a decade. In addition to his academic responsibilities at BMU, he is also assistant dean of practice school and placement. I would like Mr. Maheshwar to take it over from here. Thank you. yeah uh, dr maheshwar is joining soon i guess there's a problem in his network he is just trying to fix it up and okay ma'am yeah sure hello am i audible yes sir yeah okay. yeah 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 so, we can see right so thank you neer neeraj and uh, good afternoon to our esteemed panel members industry participants students and my colleagues uh, it is a pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelist members of this session titled future factories robotics and automation uh, we have lined up some impressive experts from industry as part of this panel Uh, without any order of preference, I'll just read out uh, the profiles of our panelists. Our first panelist is Mr. Vinod uh, Mahindrakar, Joint General Manager and Head of Manufacturing Technology Group at uh, Snyder Electric India. Uh, starting as a training engineer at Sandvik Asia Limited from 1992, uh, Mr. Vinod has over the past three decades of his illustrious career worked in several leadership positions in automotive and engineering companies such as. force motors mahindra mahindra and mahindra lnt and snyder electric so as someone who's been leading key projects in robotics and automation mr vinod has a demonstrated history of designing installation and commissioning of automated manufacturing as well as robotic lines uh, he's also been instrumental in driving the, uh, the digitization drive process at, uh, and also had uh, also given the task of uh, commissioning iot projects at lnt uh, thank you sir for agreeing to share your expertise with us today thank you let me take this opportunity to now introduce our second panelist uh, mr mahender patil who is the national head of robots and systems engineering at fanuc india mr patil has over three decades of professional experience from across uh, countries renowned companies in automotive engineering industrial products automation and systems integration industries as head of fanuc india private limited mr part patil leads key responsibilities such as business development process engineering and proposals project management operations involving design procurement assembly and installation and commissioning of robots uh, we welcome you sir our third panelist of the conclave is mr uh, vijay gunti chief digital and business transformation consultant with over a decade of experience in digital transformation projects and sap implementation related projects currently is actively engaged in the design and development of cognitive rpa bots using ai and nlp for an uh, for an utilities client uh, so appreciate your presence sir on, in this conclave uh, thank you the last panelist of the conclave is mr natwar kadel who is currently assistant general manager and department head he are planning at hyundai motor india limited his current roles include strategic planning and policies 
talent acquisition and management, change management, organization development, to name a few. Uh, so amongst his several achievements is the best employer award from Government of India for best practices and management of app appren uh, apprentices. Uh, we welcome you, sir, to this conclave. <clears throat> So I hope that this uh, panel discussion with an impressive array of experts will give new insights and perspectives on the central theme of this session uh, so that we have all something to carry from this conflict. Uh, for, for instance, it could be a new, new learning perspective, a fresh perspective on things and a new conviction to you know, eff efficiently formalize strategies in our respective organizations. Uh, first, I'll kick off this conversation by asking specific questions uh, to to my panel members, while others can also join in, chip in with their side of perspective. Uh, my opening question is to Mr. Vinod. Sir, manufacturers are implementing new technologies such as artificial intelligence, advanced robotics and automation, and data analytics to transfer their, transform their operations now and also for the future. So therefore, in this backdrop, uh, my my question would be is what is the scope for robotics and automation in conceiving the fact factories of future? Your take, sir. Hello, I'm audible. Yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Maheshwari. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, BML Munjal University for this opportunity to be part of this as a panel member on your this prestigious technical conclave. Uh, so if we go by International Federation for Robotics, so in we found in nine, 2019 worldwide, the robot penetration in manufacturing industry is somewhere around 113 robots per 10,000 workers. And in India, it is very low, almost maybe around less than maybe 10. And in 2019, almost 3.8 lakh robots were sold worldwide and half of it in China. And in India, I think there are some 4,300 robots were sold. So looking at these figures and uh, also the robot density uh, in in countries like Singapore, where it is almost 918 robots per 10,000 workers. And India, it is very less, very, very less. And worldwide, the average is said to be somewhere around 113 robots per 10,000 workers. So looking at the, all these figures, so in Indian industry also, we have a lot of scope for robots and automation. Yes, but if you see almost maybe uh, almost 15 years back when robots actually started, you know, uh, getting into manufacturing, mainly in the automotive industry, I would say started by maybe Maruti, Hyundai, uh, then maybe uh, Ford. Actually, they started with uh, uh, bigger robots, industrial robots, mainly where it is difficult for the human being to start with, to, to work mainly because of the safety, ergonomics, and, you know, fatigue consideration. But now, today, looking at our conditions, you know, this all this pandemic, what we are going through, all these industries, whether it is large industries or MSMEs, everybody is facing labor shortages. And also, there, there, there is a huge demand also for customized products from the customer. And there are many areas where there are risk for human safety where a person cannot work or maybe very difficult for him to work. So in such condition, so implementation of robots and automation has become very necessary. And also there are sudden, you know, requirement for capacity ramp up also. So it's become very difficult for industries to get, you know, human, the workmen immediately on the job. So in this condition also, so the robots or maybe in automations, help industries to immediately you know ramp up the capacity and this automation and robots also helps us to reduce you know time to market so we we, we have seen on this you now pandemic how industries some industries quickly adopted to the situation and brought in products so quickly which were you know you know uh, necessary at this condition so definitely automation and robotics must have helped them to come up very fast and also 
adopting to automation and robotics also helped industries to reduce defects and also improve hygiene condition where it is very difficult for human to work in hygiene condition so automation and robots definitely helps so i am very optimistic looking at other uh, in other countries so india also is has picked up means in last 10 years it has hugely picked up mainly in the areas of automotive industries and electric electronics but it is also picking up in other industries also thanks uh, thank you sir <clears throat> so i understand the the uh, the uh, fair share of india's uh, robotic population uh, deployment of robots in, in indian indian industry will go up in the days to come especially in the in the times of disruption uh, so my next question is to patil sir uh, we have seen that industries in advanced countries are moving towards building factories of future with considerations uh, for flexibility agility mass customization is one of the most important uh, takeaways of this uh, decade of the coming decade security remote access and even in in cases of autonomous maintenance practices so sir uh, as you are part of the system that de that deploys robots in different companies what in your opinion would be the you know opp opportunities and challenges of robotization of indian indian industry to stay relevant and globally competitive and at the same time simultaneously keeping pace with the changes over to you sir yeah uh, thanks uh, dr devedi thanks for the nice introductions and uh, thanks uh, bml munjwa university for this uh, for giving us this opportunity to participate in this uh, technical conclave uh, first of all uh, to continue what vinod said earlier uh, uh, the robot population uh, in india is quite insignificant as of now uh, so as he said the ifr you know data which is saying currently i think in 2019 uh, the number of robots sold in you know different countries and you uh, put it together uh, the highest are in uh, you know china which is close to 1.4 lakhs which is a quite a huge number the second uh, highest is coming to japan uh, which is close to around 60000 and uh, you know if you say these numbers uh, where are we we are in the 10th in the list and uh, we are close to around 4500 robots so uh, just now i wanted to talk about the opportunities available for robotizations so if you see these numbers uh, we see there is a huge opportunity for these uh, you know robots to get deployed in india and uh, as already we know told about the uh, no the density of robots with reference to the uh, 10000 employees which are again employed uh, you know across so there also we find there is lot of opportunities for you know robotization uh, so where do we find these opportunities the numbers are coming through so we had you know already seen lot of uh, robotization happening in the automotive industries uh, where you know we see a lot of automation especially in the field of uh, 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 biw where it's called as an body in white manufacturing processes most of the automation has happened similarly uh, the mig welding processes where the most of the automation has happened if you also take the Uh, total robots sold in this particular uh, total area, sixty uh, to seventy percent of the robots have been sold in this particular area only, where it is MIG welding and spot welding. Uh, so this is giving a bigger impact. But uh, uh, we have also seen in the developed countries uh, uh, the uh, there is a change over happening from the automotive to non-automotive. So the currently in India we also see the most of the robotization is. around 80% of the robotization is related to automotive industries 20% is uh, non automotive but in the developed countries we have seen it's almost 50 50 now so we are also seeing the same trend happening in india right now there is an you know small change happening in this area where we are seeing lot of activities happening in the aerospace industries agriculture industries fmcg industries i know many more general industries metal industries now there where we are seeing lot of you know uh, robotization is Now picking up together, and uh, we are also seeing, uh, uh, you know, there is a, a lot of opportunities to do uh, most of the uh, robotization, uh, uh, which is helping them to you know improve this. Uh, what are the current challenges we are facing uh, here? So you now many people think that you now the robots are only meant for the uh, big OEMs, you know, and you uh, know it, it can be only deployed in a lot of big OEMs. 
uh, in the recent past i can tell you because you no know, we are in this business for quite some time uh, the sales to the non oems has been quite large uh, this has happened in the last 4 5 years this is also because you no know, the oems are also you no know, outsourcing most of activities and they are also expecting a certain standard of quality uh, input to their own uh, you know uh, uh, lines so we have seen uh, more robotization happening in the uh, non oem sector also in fact the robots sold in the non oems are more than the robots sold to the oem sectors now uh, this is also a change what we had uh, seen in the recent past uh, uh, now where we see a good uh, challenge coming up second now this also the thing is that now uh, the robots are now taking a bigger uh, uh, now they take a longer time for ourwise uh, which is also a, a misnomer actually we have seen lot of you know uh, robotization where the ro has been less than you no know, 6 months to 1 year uh, this is also we have to see how we are doing this robotization possible in these areas and uh, we are also seeing that you no know, this uh, you no know, the perception that you no know, robots are taking away the jobs of the people uh, which is also wrong actually robots are helping you to take away you know some of your difficult uh, jobs which you are thinking which are difficult to do dangerous to do or dirty to do those kind of the jobs can also be taken away by the robots so how this robotization can help also is uh, one is the robots are also bring brought in lot of flexibility in the system uh, we have seen that lot of flexibility is possible because the robots are reprogrammable and you can do multiple programs at a time so same robots can handle multiple activities so that is how you now it has become more flexible to use they are not a rigid system automation is not rigid it has become more flexible nowadays and uh, what is second uh, advantage you also get is you get a very reliable output you know these 24 by 7 these robots can work without any breaks so you are exactly sure what output you will get out of the system so this robotization is also helping you to get your you uh, know uh, uh, better out of your you uh, know uh, capital investments so whatever capital investments you are doing right now uh, you get uh, you know roi very quickly because of the robotization because it employs almost 24 by 7 so we have seen uh, this happening uh, in elsewhere in the world but i think we can replicate also in india so uh, this is how i think you now there is a big opportunity coming up uh, for robotics uh, uh, in india and we will be able to use this opportunity to you know develop uh, robotization in india so that's my view right sir uh, so thank you uh so so patil sir again uh, i think you of all will certainly agree that uh, automation and robots have been instrumental in setting up a high throughput production systems uh, and that is how companies such as hero motor corp to which we are uh, affiliated have been able to achieve record production targets in the month of october november if i recall it is about 7 lakh units despite the covid pandemic uh, situation <clears throat> and at the you also mentioned a very interesting data that there is a greater opportunity in terms of robot deployment in the non oem sectors right right so at the so therefore at the other end of the spectrum that's where we are interested in uh, so at the other end of the spectrum we have those msmes and uh, uh, smes which are you know uh, <clears throat> which cater to low low volume and high mix manufacturing kind of conditions right so what in your assessment would be the future role of these technologies uh, not only for the high throughput manufacturing companies that you had mentioned but also for sustaining agile production environments that is uh, widely prevalent in these uh, medium scale manufacturing enterprises and smes Uh, it's a very interesting question because now this is uh, really you know many times we also get these kind of uh, questions where the how you now this automation robotization uh, is helping uh, small scale industries and also you uh, know where they have got a batch production or you no know, low volume production uh, in fact you know the robots have become more intelligent uh, with reference uh, right now uh, we have uh, added advantage of uh, vision systems and you no know, pressure sensors and the ai you know which is helping them to know become more intelligent now so we have been able to know uh, uh, deploy robots uh, for these low volume and uh, you know high varieties of uh, products also so we have seen uh, uh, you know the system getting deployed uh, in a very small job shop kind of 
systems also uh, because they are uh, programmable and reprogrammed and you can have you know uh, uh, several hundreds of programs stored at a, a robot so you can do multiple tasks with the same robot at the same station that is a possibility and we have done it also in many cases uh, we can give you an example which we did in a recent uh, example uh, where it was an investment uh, casting process uh, where they wanted to have uh, you know varieties of uh, recipes in actually in this investment casting process uh, they have a process called where they will dip into a slurry and there is a sand uh, you know uh, rain sand which comes in and that's a baking process which is done so these three processes they have to do it and these three processes for different products they have got a different uh, timeline so they what they call it is a recipes so for example uh, you do a slurry dip then you do a sand rain and uh, uh, slurries are no are in four varieties of slurries are there around i think five varieties of you no know, sand rains are there so with these combinations and uh, baking time is different for different again no you need to bake it for a particular temperature for a particular uh, length of time so here no the uh, there are around 210 you know recipes uh, required and around i think uh, at any given point of a time around uh, around 300 components are being treated so this is very you know difficult to handle no this is what uh, you know you say that it's very difficult so here a uh, robotization uh, and you know with the help of uh, uh, you know different sensor mechanisms we were able to you know achieve this and you know the customer was able to get this uh, the flexibility of you know uh, having multiple products being you know uh, de delivered uh, with the same system so this is a possibility like that similarly we also did in many cases like you know furnace handling also there are you no know, the gripper mechanisms which are come where you are able to handle multiple products and uh, vision is also helping you to you know reset you know your gripper mechanism to take care of your you know new requirements uh, uh, like that so that is how you know we are able to uh, provide the robots which are giving you lot of flexibility now so uh, what i also want to bring into your notice is uh, these robots and systems are you now all available in the market but uh, how to engineer them so where we call it as a robot system engineering process uh, which is a very important uh, uh, you know skill set which is coming now uh, this is also put up as a new skill set in the uh, world skill organization now so i think uh, in the next year coming up in uh, two, uh, 2020 Uh, one it was supposed to happen uh, this uh, uh, competition in shanghai uh, because of this pandemic it is getting postponed by one more year so i think uh, this particular skill is going to be very important for most uh, you know future uh, you know robotization processes and uh, this will also very important for most of the educational institutes to develop this particular skill for the future requirements uh, so what i wanted to say by is uh, by developing this skill you will be able to provide more robotization for all varieties of requirements you know which are coming into uh, you know the field so that's my view okay uh, thank you sir i think i'll i'll get further information from you on the new skill sets so that we can implement on uh, at our university uh, <clears throat> uh, just a follow up question quickly so you mentioned about you know risk design and the gripper design today we see a lot of a uh, uh, lot of emphasis is ma is made on you know compliance uh, you know grippers you know that can hold anything any object any non symmetrical or asymmetrical object right so uh, what is it in fanuc that you are doing uh, uh we we are no using because of we make only the manipulators right now but uh, we have made you know our robots compliant to this all you know newer kind of grip what you are saying uh, there are a lot of flexible grippers which can handle uh, you know a very soft material and you know can take shape of the you know uh, material which you are going to pick it up so we have made our systems open to you know these kind of grippers because again the grippers are you know manufactured by varieties of companies with varieties of technologies so we integrate this uh, you know grippers into our uh, you know robotic system also so uh, that is how we are you now able sure. to support uh, this thank you thank integration you. of system. yes uh, my next question is to mr vinod uh, <clears throat> while we understand that in the pre industry 4.0 4.0 time period the time when the robots came into the picture humans and robots did not share any common workspaces primarily because of safety reasons right so this as i believe is expected to change uh, with the evolution of superior artificial intelligence and vision based systems uh, <clears throat> so 
so allowing for collaborative working between you know different uh, uh, workspaces uh, <clears throat> yeah yeah uh, yes as you said so, uh, our the present uh, uh, our uh, six access robots industrial robots yes, yes. they are uh, uh, little risky to work that way with you know you cannot uh, work you know very closely with them because they almost operate at 2 meters per second speed and you know what can happen if a robot arm comes to you and hits you at a 2 meter per second speed so so that's a that's a risk and also because of this risk so we build you know all uh, uh, safety uh, fences around them so it takes lot of space also so because of that so hence you know as on date mostly these robots were installed either on a say body shop line where it is a exclusive automated line with robots with lot of you know safety uh, precautions taken safety fences provided everything but now with cobots coming into pictures where they have a you know like uh, mr mahendra patil also said they have very you know touch sensors and all those things so where even a, just a touch of a human being so this robot senses and then you know stops so you do not have means the human does, uh, does not have any safety concerns there to work with and hence these robots now have gained you know um, uh, opportunities to work in areas where human also work very closely with the human being say take for example say assembly lines where there is a continuous assembly line from station to station you know the the hardly the distance between the station may be a 1 meter or maybe max 1.5 meter so these robots also come into picture for assembling those activities mainly where the activity is very say uh, requires a lot of precision it's a repetitive type of nature and uh, it's a monotonous uh, monotonous type of job you know which is not possible for a human to do it continuously for say a complete shift say say example say 450 minutes so in such areas so these cobots have found you know space so there is a lot of scape uh, scope now for cobots also to work in these industries assembly industries or maybe even uh, say uh, glue in uh, gluing operations you know and in electronic industry also where there is a lot of precision required and it's very difficult for for the for the human being to do that activity see these robots with a precision of maybe 25 micron to say 35 microns so it is very easy for them to do those activities repetitively so the what we call r and r so gauge r and r so it is very good in case of say robots compared to human being so so those are now slowly uh, you know uh, uh, and these cobots are getting you know scope in our indian manufacturing industry though though actually as per my knowledge though i'm not very closely uh, working with cobots but it's still very very low compared to our robots the main reason also can be the cost because as i understand the cost of cobots is is almost maybe double a similar robot which is a six axis industrial robot so that may be a, a, a initial you know hindrance for cobots to get installed in many of the working areas but but where there is a space constraint and uh, the person has to do a lot of activity along with the automation so these cobots can be a very useful uh, you know equipments to work with actually that's what i feel so uh, you know so, so the, that's a nice perspective that there is a greater landscape for collaborative robots being adopted by indian industry uh, <clears throat> so my my so there is a general feeling you know uh, in msmes you know medium scale uh, enterprises that uh, advanced technologies le leading to automation uh, especially advanced automation are just not suited for them so, so is there a reason for us to demystify the fact that to continue to grow and remain competitive in, in today's age, right? Uh, deployment of advanced robotic and autom autom automatic solutions is the need of the hour. I mean, this question is, is to Mr. Vijay. 
Uh, thanks, Maheshwar, for introducing me, and uh, I'm excited to join the panel with Vinod, Mahender, and Natwar. Uh, uh, so th thanks for asking. Like you know, the uh, the current situation of the MSME because of this pandemic, uh, things are gone haphazard. So let me give you a specific use case, like which we already did it in Hyderabad for one of the MSMEs. So the basic challenge, like we have introduced them, the industry food auto technologies automation. Now we are working closely with them on the robot and cobots, how they can help the current situation, the pandemic, and then they, they can go forward with that. So what is the pain area? What is the objective of this? Like the challenge today, you know, most of the MSMEs and SMEs is I was run by a single owner, right? Because of this, uh, the, the situation, what they are having. So now the challenge is the productivity. The productivity is not so high because on the shop floor and also on the on the plant, they are not available. They may go out, the owner can go to different, different locations for the day in day out activities and like meetings, vendors, customers, tax. So he has to be on the road. So, but what is actually happening is he doesn't know what is happening on the shop floor, like the real, real situation. So because of that, you know, there are three shifts, especially on six o'clock, two o'clock and absolutely at night, 10 o'clock. So, but but most of the times we know in reality, right? They start at 6:30, and we don't know. The owner sitting outside doesn't know what's happening at 6:30. They switch it on, or like they're they're really happening. What's happening? And also, you know, there are a lot of breaks. Uh, there are a lot of breaks happening. Like they go out, they don't come 15 minutes, 30 minutes. There's a, again the productivity losses. So that holistically, if it is the night shift. Nothing is going to happen there. I don't know the productivity. What them. So there are a lot of challenges today that customer is facing. That's what we we went. We understood the pain areas, and approximately overall, when we understood it, the shop floor are like they're getting a 30 to 40 percent losses. Like the productivity is not there. So is the the, the the customer is not able to understand what's happening on the ground, what's happening on the shop floor, what is happening to my productivity. So it's totally chaos. Like he doesn't understand what's happening. So we went there. We did a preliminary study. Uh, and then we understood the pain areas and then we we, we we did a strategizing of it. Like, you know, the entire process methodology we followed and finally we did, okay, the solution for this, uh, the implementing the automation of the entire business process. This was started before COVID. Uh, we, we have started this, but but the real benefits, what this customer got it, right? COVID, because, you know, the COVID made entirely the life stand still. So you cannot go to the plant. He doesn't see what is happening. So this totally helped me. So what we did in this case, right, we you know the technology helped us you know the internet of things the artificial intelligence machine learning so these all tools the analytic tools implemented for them enable that owner to understand what's happening on the ground so wherever like we, we did a mobile app to them so on the go that's what he can he can look at what's happening of like how the productivity like the where, where where that particular uh, the person is the, so so he can he can fix the issues right then and there itself he, he it's overall the productivity got increased, Maheshwar. So what we look at it, right? the industry 4.0 solution and associate technologies help that customer to achieve. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving one of the MSMEs, right? Today, I think, right, the, the whole perspective of SME and MSMEs are facing the same situation. So they are there and still the pandemic, you don't know when it's going to uh, get on and then we don't know what's real time. So I think every MSME, and SME should look at this prospect to look at the industry 4.0 solutions, a connected automation solutions. And then and then after this, right now we are helping this customer uh, to go into the robots and cobots because I know definitely we know Sir and Mahendra Sir has given a, a fantastic explanation of how this can help to that. So definitely I see a good potential moving forward. Uh, the customers like uh, the, the step one to me is more of an automation, uh, get the connected thing, let the business go, let the, let to see the and 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 they they absolutely need to go into the next level which is a, i'm talking about more on the cobots and robots uh, thing so overall uh, in a nutshell uh, mahesh uh, what they got it right because of this implementation right the key results what they found is you know the reduced downlines so the the work ethics that, that's one of the biggest challenge in today's uh, business process they, they we have to go with the work ethics they they could achieve that the product production efficiencies the quantities and and also the util, the machine utilization you know right the oee part uh, so because of this entire automation thing, they could benefit 
the rejections and and also right uh, overall like they want to see the energy efficiency that there is a lot of losses on the power so they could they could mitigate that and and also finally they could the shift they can manage the entire shift they can monitor it they can analyze it and and also overall they could at the end of the day they, they could save the money right at the, uh, the, so at the end they could able to sustain that and then finally get a result so that they 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 got, they got a good amount of capital expenditure the new machine saving the old machines it's kind of so these are my two cents which i want to uh, share mahesh uh, perspective and then uh, definitely i can see uh, going forward any msme or msme uh, can look at this industry 4.0 initiatives and extend it to the robots and cobots uh, thank you mr vijay uh, then uh... I think one of the points touched upon by Mr. Patil was that, was that there is a fear that you know robotic automation would kill jobs and uh, increase unemployment in leading uh, economies like us. I just wanted to know from uh, question is to uh, you know uh, Mr. Cardell and Mr. Vinod. Uh, Cardell, Cardell sir can join first. Is there any merit in this concern or is, is it just a hype? I'm sure everybody is able to hear me. Uh, thank you for the introduction and sincere apologize for joining a little late. I had technical glitch. When we are talking about industry 4.0, when we are talking about technology and innovations where I am still struggling with catching up that. So uh, being in the panel uh, slightly on the outer side of it, uh, I see most of the panel members have a technical edge. By being, I being in uh, part of the human resources family, I will try and uh, give a human capital view on the entire industry 4.0. Well, uh, to be specific to your question of, uh, will that be a impact on the uh, human capital per se? Well, I just wanted to say you is completely a myth. Uh, I'm sure all of us, if you go back, stroll along the memory lane, way back in 80s, so when the IT actually revolutionized the entire world, and uh, there was a similar trend and talks about that uh, IT would actually kill away the jobs and there would be huge amount of unemployment would increase. This would impact on the earning capability of the uh, individuals and overall it would impact the micro indexes of the economy as well. But inversely, what had happened, it is, it's actually a result to one of us on the face of it. Today, IT is the actually revolutionized the entire Indian economy. And today we are actually known as the backbone of the Indian IT, rather IT world. And I'm sure you, all of you also know that big of the, the IT firms are led by Indians. So uh, it is, it's absolutely myth. And now to, to justify my example, I would uh, go to very specific to Hyundai. Uh, I represent from Hyundai Motor India and uh, Hyundai Motor India is the, being a second largest in the India and that's the fifth largest automotive company in the world. But I'm sure uh, the industry 4.0 has definitely brought us to really think the way we work uh, because automation is the way forward. And accordingly, this plant which I hail from is the seventh best plant in the world. When I talk about it, it indeed means that you, we have the best level of technologies, automation, robots. Uh, well, I'm not getting into the technical point of it, but sticking into the same human capital, over the period of last 10 years, we have steadily increased our automation level. Mm. But at the same time, where we, we have increased our automation, we have not retrenched even a single employee on account of automation. Uh, our automations are precisely focusing on the changing needs of the customers. Now, let me be going to much more a brutal example. Uh, I was seeing a picture which probably I cannot show you now. There was a 35 gadgets which were in place. And uh, today the 35 gadgets is right in your pockets in the name of mobile, because that is what the customer's requirements are. It's, everything has changed. Same way, uh, let's, let's not talk about in the industry, let's go back to your home. When you be at your home in your kitchen, uh, if, you, if you look at the way our, uh, our mothers and mothers' mothers would have cooked the food, and today the context is very different because you right have the technology in kitchen. So everybody wants the hassle-free uh, process and operation. That's why the customer changing needs are. And then in order to meet that, you need to develop products which are, which are meeting the current standards. And so you take the help of uh, growing technology. Well, uh, I would like to be more specific uh, when it comes to Hyundai that uh, one of our line is actually close to about 90% automized. Having automized, 
yes indeed there are certain jobs which are being replaced but there is a there is a huge requirement of another segment of jobs because i'm sure all of you would actually understand uh, when the line in the car is actually in the conveyor uh, it's all about we've been thinking that you know there is no amount of data analytics there is uh, what is the need for it but let me tell you today the data analytics big data per se has become the crucial thing focusing on technology automation has become the crucial thing and in fact we have we have hired huge number of people to go to work on the latest technology latest innovations which they need to work on talk, talking about the data specialist right in the line uh, it's about just 5000 of uh, just an example 5000 spots of welding which happened in the car number of welding how much of data point is that actually created so there is there is always a different segment of job which will be created when there is one job which will shrink so they would actually see a boom in another area i think this is the cycle of the economy itself uh, but having said all this uh, more positive about that being a myth i also wanted to put a footnote very clearly people will lose the job if they don't upskill themselves upskill is the it doesn't only applicable to a line worker it also applicable to all of us i'm sure uh, over the period of time the jobs the way i look at the jobs has actually changed so being a human capital it's very important that today there is a need of somebody to be even a basic human resources professional should be able to manage analyze the data if that element is missing then i'm sure i'm actually taken on my job as well so the upskill element is the metaphor which will exist universally in all of the jobs per se one technology coming into the system or a higher level of automation in technology indeed will reduce certain operational job but actually boom away the couple of other jobs which will be a new job so if you will look at to 2025 a couple of jobs we you see that there is shredding of couple of jobs but at the same time you see the huge boom requirement of into many fold requirement in terms of another jobs i rather look not this is a crisis i rather look as an opportunity for us to relook in the entire job skill which we have in the industry i think i probably have addressed the concern uh thank you uh, kadal sir and uh... your take on this mr, mr. vinod uh, yeah uh, sorry i got disconnected in between uh, i totally agree with uh, what um, uh, mr kadil said uh, see in industries also uh, whenever we plan any automation i'm i'm saying from my my experience point of view so we are not implementing automation and robotics for the sake of you know doing automation and robotics no actually so we before you know planning anything before working out any proposal on say robotics or uh, automation we are looking into all the conditions what is my manpower availability what is the condition of my work you know what kind of safety issues i have what type of you know concerns i have what kind of fatigue issues i have for the operator what is the nature of that work so after thinking all these things and then finally in 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 particularly in, in indian industry we always look for what is my irr and what is my payback and definitely still our cost of uh, worker a uh, cost of human is far far that way is less compared to robots which is not so in uh, say either us or europe where the cost of uh, robot is lesser than uh, cost of a human so it is easy for those countries to implement robots and do automation but it is still not so in uh, indian uh, uh, industries so we are not implementing automation and robotics in all the areas so what we do we look for areas say say if i say look at the nature of the work whether it is highly you know uh, unsafe for the operator to do whether there are you know fatigue issues there are say ergonomics issues so we and then there are repetitive type of jobs which is very monotonous for an operator to do and then also there are you know areas in assembly areas where uh, it is prone to you know defects you know because of this maybe monotonous work operator is 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 uh, uh, going to do certain mistakes in that so in such areas we do automation you know we deploy say robots and not in all areas and definitely wherever there is a human intelligence required in the work also we deploy human only where it is a very mechanical mechanized work in that area only actually uh, we do uh, we implement say robots or automation and also because of this automation also 
Yeah. Yeah. This automation also, we also need to see that how the utilization of this automation and robotics, you know, can be improved. So hence it requires a lot of, you know, data analytics and to see that the OE of this machine also is very high because since we have uh, invested money on automation robotics, we have to see that OE is high. So my, my payback is very fast. Hence it also requires a lot of data analytics where people are also required to do a lot of study and solve the problems very quickly through all this, you know, uh, analysis uh, part and all. So where our digital initiatives also also helping us to you know solve the problems, look into the issues very quickly. So so it's totally de depends upon the area where we want to implement automation robotics and not in all the areas. That's what my view is. Uh, thank you, sir. <clears throat> so my next follow up question is on the human capital, uh, which we are um, our panelists have been discussing about. And we know that, you know, these disruptions that come from the process of digital digitalization and the adoption of the other I4.0 technologies is going to share, reshape the way industries function, especially with reference to employee reskilling. Uh, therefore, leadership, I believe leadership has to create that learning factory environment where there is a strong focus, not only focus, but also demand for training and retraining of existing employees. So, so what I'm referring to is the, uh, uh, the learning 4.0. So having handled the training and skilling part in your parent company, Hyundai, uh, Cardin, sir, I would like to know, what is your take on this, on this learning 4.0? And how do you do this in your organization? So I'll, uh, so Vinod, sir, can answer this question. And then uh, we'll also like to hear this uh, perspective from, uh, uh, from sorry, Vinod, sir, can I join after Cardin, sir? Thank you. Uh, very interesting question, and uh, I'm sure with the people of my panel members and other colleagues would agree on this, that uh, these reskilling doesn't come into the place just mere on account of Industry 4.0. Uh, I think that is a phenomenon that reskilling has to be inherently part of your system. If absence of that, I think uh, you're actually endangering or leading an organization in the wrong way or rather in simple way to say that your human capital would not be prepared for uncertainty. So uh, having the very structured industry for which is integrated with the organization's today's contest, having, I just wanted to be specific to your question. Let me give you one uh, very different example. Today, electrification is gonna be the, uh, uh, I mean, we are already onto electrification, but going forward, you will see the cars which are electric cars on the road. My question is, uh, and I mean, the just thought of counter question is, what I'm going to do with the people who are part of the engine, uh, you know, huge workforce, which is working on the engine, what are we, they going to do? Uh, how would they would survive when the electric ship will come? So this is something which organization should be prepared and be ready. Uh, if you are not reskilling, if you're, the concept is very clear, learn, unlearn, and relearn. If you're not following this three conception, I think uh, that's the end which you are putting a full stop to your career, not as an individual, but as an organization definitely have equal shared responsibility. we specific to Hyundai that, you know, we understand that the 2025 is going to be uh, a complete paradigm change in the way automobile industry is going through. If you look back, uh, you know, the diesel engines were into place petrol. Now we are actually talking about hybrid and electric cars. Is your capital is prepared? Is your human capital uh, rather than employees are prepared to deal that changes? Are they equipped with the certain skills and technology which they need to be in place? So today, you may, may or may not require a mechanical engineer. Uh, you may require an electrical engineer because the context is changing. I don't know. Uh, do we need to hire an electrical in, uh, electric engineer or mechanical engineer in the future? Or should I hire an IT guy to run my car, car I mean, and the cars? You also can see that car company, who is your competitor? When the question is asked, who's your competitor? My competitor is no more an automotive company, which traditionally been manufacturing. It's also companies like Microsoft and Google, which is you know effectively working on the cars. So the business model has changed and that's not with the auto industry. That's with most of our industry. We are seeing that is over a 10 year cycle, there is a complete business model change. And we, we are seeing that witnessing on a very high scale in the automotive industry is concerned. So going back to the example, which I quoted, electric cars. So we have a huge chunk of employees working on the engines. So if the electric cars become the mass and that's what I'm going to produce, which means 
that will be a great necessity for me to ensure that they should be ready to deal with electric then we you just have a motor there so you need to equip themselves to deal with those challenges not just this uh, this this universally it's it's not just applicable to line workers but all of us as well the technology might change couple of operations may not be redundant so are we prepared to deal with the future skill so this is something which is universal and phenomenal until unless you don't learn and learn and relearn on a consistent universal basis i think just not industry for zero any any certain cycle which comes which revolutionizes the industry which will impact the skill so which will impact the business as well so reskilling upskilling is a phenomenon which which can should be a part of dna for every organization to survive so indeed yes to all those people uh, if the students are precisely learning that i just wanted to tell you one simple thing what will bring you on the campus from campus to corporate will not take you up the ladder so you will have to keep renewing yourself in every year with the new skills and trends which are prevailing in the industry else consider yourself to be an outdated i'm i'm trying to be a little more brutal but i think that's a fact which all of us to agree and accept it if and that's applicable to me as well today what has brought me here may not take me up in the ladder again so there is an element of upskilling in all of us and universally across the organization and institution that's my say on that thank you uh, vinod sir your perspective uh vinod sir uh, am i uh, i think he is not there right uh, let me go to uh, let us move to the next question which is kind uh, if the time permits we have about 10 minutes to go uh, so I'll, we can at best take one Hello. more question. Yeah, uh, yes. uh, sorry, I got disconnected. A uh, lot of yes, you know, sir, please, please, you know, your perspective yeah. on this. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, see, I fully agree with what Mr. Cardell said because, see, in in industries also, uh, training is part and parcel of the process. Okay, so in any industry, uh, training has a very important role to play. So, beat any type of work. Why industry four point zero only? okay so whenever any operator comes to shop floor even for a simple assembly operation or machine operation first we train him for 3 4 days in our gurukul you know and the same practice must be followed in uh, many of the automotive industries also i know like mahindra and mahindra even hero motors you know maruti they all have training centers even uh, ford they all have training centers for people to first initially train before he is taken to the shop floor so same is applicable even for say industry 4.01 where there are new technologies are coming whether it's a 3d printing whether it's a robotics whether it's a artificial intelligence whether it's a augmented reality so which requires different different type of skill sets and definitely yes uh, people have to undergo training and learn those things so that we can use them effectively for finally get you know uh, business uh, benefits so th th that's how i think so it is nothing new it, it is nothing new that only because industry 4.0 has come and hence training is required so training skilling reskilling of people is a continuous process so there is there is no end to uh, uh, training or learning so sure. industry 4.0 is uh, just it's on, uh, in the way so we have to learn it that's what sure. i think okay sir thank you thank you so i, I have about about 7 minutes to go so i would want my panelists to be uh, uh, to be uh, 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 a little bit precise and crisp my question is uh, you know in india we we con con continuously deliberate on improving industry academy interface uh, while much has been done in, in, by by different universities to improve this kind of relationship over the past two decades we still haven't been able to create a fully functional ecosystem that is there in the western world so at bmu uh, because of our association with the hero group in just a span of 7 years of time uh, we have successfully collaborated with over 150 plus organization where our students get interned for a mandatory period of 27 weeks spread out across their four years uh, recently we also created a center for industrial consulting training and uh, research at bmu and we continue to float flagship uh, certificate programs for working professionals so that is some kind of you know work we are doing in this area 
so my question to is to Mr. Cardell and Mr. Vijay. So, sir, what is your perception about industry academia interface, especially in these times, you know, uh, in these times when we are in the midst of a paradigm shift in the way industries are conducting their business and uh, also uh, the kind of job employability skills expected from our students. You may also please also elaborate uh, what would be the scope of our students in terms of career choices, future work and, and the evolving job market. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, I'll stick to be as brief as I can, considering the time and lag which we have. I just, if the students are listening to me, I just wanted to tell you one thing. Having said uh, whatsoever the people talk about the scarcity of the job, the unemployment, one thing is very clear. India has the most youngest population. And in 2030, we will be, the average age will be about 32. And which would be the which would be instance that rest all the country will be about 43, 50, which means you are or probably we Indians have the highest uh, a large labor opportunity looking at not just in our country from the across the world. And the way the government is intervening and bringing the skill up India, there is a lot of skill interventions which is going on. And I'm sure there's a huge amount of job opportunities will be waiting for you. Having said anybody talking about anything else, the opportunity will always exist. All it will determine this where you, how you want to navigate yourself. To be specific to industry and academy, I just wanted to tell you that we have been talking about this from ages. I remember when I was a student, I think the same question was raised at industry academy and we continue to talk about the same. But when we just look back, I just want to tell you how much of the institute has changed. The great that, uh, you know, as a, your institute are taking an initiative of 27 weeks of internship. But uh, that's, that would not be sufficient. I just wanted to tell you one simple thing that internship cannot just be a part of a degree. I think that cannot be an area of academic fulfillment because that is more looked at an academic fulfillment <clears throat> requirement rather than it should be a more of a tangible uh, outcomes where longer associations have been there. And uh, I think internships should be more of a research based um, and to deal with the more realistic problem rather than more of a perception driven problem. I think if, if that happens, you will see a, a higher connect between the students understanding uh, the, the problem which is there practical in the organization because what you read in the books uh, indeed acts as a foundation for the students. But when you get into the organization, the problems are very different. So if they've been given an exposure to deal that problem, I think that's where the bridging, the gap between a corporate and a campus. I just wanted to tell you this responsibility does not lies with the institute to go and catch up or probably not with the organiz organization. I think it's a balanced because uh, we are the same coin and it has the other side of its institute and one side is the organization. We would, an organization would not survive if there is a good amount of talent coming on in the future. At the same time, institute will not survive if there is a job opportunity. I think we will have to go hand in hand together to deal with issues. I just say, I just wanted to conclude saying that uh, we have taken enough time to talk about it. It's time for really get into action and uh, get things uh, uh, go rolling on. But having, please don't restrict yourself, any student listening to please, please don't restrict yourself with the organization or institute as a responsibility. Your individual stand responsible. I think the effort required from your side will be more to understand how the industry and, and the business works than the institute and organization being responsible to teach you that. That's all my say on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cardin. Uh, Mr. Vijay, your, your perspective. Yes, I have less than two minutes. I'll give only two cents of my information. That's it. Right? I'll not drag it out. I know people are like, we are, all, we are running out of time. So here, uh, our sort of like has given the enter perspective. So my suggestion to the students is the learning on the go. So until we are comfort, you should be coming out of the comfort zone. So we are having the comfort zone, come out of it, learning on the go. The concept right now is going as a micro learning. So you have a lot of gadgets in your place. Like you go with WhatsApp, you go with different, different tools. You have a TV, information is available everywhere. So go and learn in the bits and bytes of pieces for you. So it's available on the on the internet. My suggestion is go. It's not, rest, not restrict your college, not restrict your information, your, your syllabus get out of it and then on the go you start learning out of it and definitely doing this you will be ready with the employability and additional to the internship i will request to the industries and to the colleges to add a apprenticeship 
so i know this is a new word to the the it world the apprenticeship we know is in the industries if we add that right learning on the job that's what is needed for the industries so these are my two cents which i want to share it out and then conclude it thank you so much sir so once again uh, uh, we i would uh, like to thank all my esteemed panelists for sharing their insightful ideas and their uh, you know uh, interesting perspectives uh, so over to you neeraj as we moving to the end of the session uh, i would like to thank all the panelists and dr maheshwar uh, for sharing their valuable insights now i would like to invite dr surya prakash uh, to end the session with a closing note thank you uh, really it was very intense session i would i must say it was full of new insight and uh, i actually learned couple of new things uh, from this discussion very first time so thank you everyone particularly panel members for putting uh, such a insightful knowledge to this discussion and all the attendees as well uh, the whenever uh, i am going to present few highlights for the session as well so mr vinod highlighted about penetration of robots in india as well as the co working risk in the upcoming era as well uh, mr patel also said lot of new things which includes robotization in in automotive industry the way it is adopting uh, the way other and other non automotive automotive sector is is lagging behind and they need to uh, catch up that thing as well he also highlighted couple of challenges for the adoption of robotics which includes roi cost related matters and he he rightly highlighted the status of smes in the and the adoption of robotics and uh, for the other panel members i think uh, mr gunti has uh, contributed a very, very good points which is particularly i would like this on the go learning which is uh, because all of us are are now surrounded with the devices so this on the go learning is definitely going to help all of us and actually we should target learn in pieces so that is really a good uh, point of view apart from it uh, he also highlighted uh, msm is uh, case uh, where the owner can increase the productivity and he also shared a few thoughts on it so network also highlighted very very relevant points related to the students skilling and reskilling uh, particularly in this new era and the impact of this new technologies on human capital and the focusing the change from customer to adopt these new technologies so this is the kind of summary which i can say uh, now as a token of appreciation to the panel members from bmu for their time and contribution i would like to present them a e momento and uh, this e momento as well as the comments amazon voucher will soon will be there in their inbox so bml munjar university is honored to present this certificate of appreciation to mahender patil for sharing his valuable insights as an esteemed panelist during the technical conclave on industry 4.0 smart autonomous technologies thank you sir bill munjal university is also honored to present this certificate of appreciation to mr network kadil for sharing his valuable insights as an esteemed panelist during technical conclave thank you sir bill thank you sir university is honored to present this certificate of appreciation to vijay gunti for sharing his valuable insight as an esteemed panelist during technical conclave thank you sir for your time bml munjal university is honored to present this certificate of appreciation to mr vinod mahendrakar for sharing his valuable insights as an esteemed panelist during technical conclave on industry 4.0 zero and smart autonomous technologies thank you sir for your thank time you. thank you dr surya prakash dr dr maheshwari and all panel members it was uh, it was very nice to be part of this panel member thank you sir thank you now uh, at last i dr surya prakash want to like thank panel members again and the industry experts who has joined us my fellow faculty members students colleague and everyone who was the part of this wonderful discussion thank you very much 
the next session is on iot the next frontiers and that will start at 2:30 after a short break requesting thank all you. To... thank you all thank you all thank you for providing the opportunity thank you thank you thanks bye thank you for giving the opportunity thanks a lot thank you thank you bye
Actually, the session is at two thirty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought kids. Yeah, right. You can see, na? So.
Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, sir. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, hello. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Bhupendra. Good afternoon. How are you, sir? All well. Okay. So uh, the panelist uh, members are about to join. We are just five minutes to go ahead, right? May I request, sir, would you please try and setting up the virtual background? Virtual background. Um, did you receive the mail or shall I send it to you? I, I guess you might have received the mail by Dr. Goldie Gabrani. Oh. If it is not, I'll be sharing it up right away. Okay, please send, send it to me. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, let me just confirm your email ID. I'm going to, you know, say it. Sir, it is boopy at vbdntech.com. Is that right? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm going to drop you. Hello? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Goldie Gavrani. And I think oh. Mr. Bender. Yeah. How are you? I'm fine. So we are all set for the yeah. start. Yeah, two minutes to go. <laughs> Down count has started. Hello, ma'am. Uh, hello, hello, Mr. Ashish. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, I'm audible. Yeah, yeah, very well. Uh, hello, everybody. I think hello. Mr. and Mr. Anil Chaudhary has joined. Me. Oh, you could set up your virtual <laughs> background. Yeah, 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 yeah. I use that trick, you know, the green clock. Achha, you have set up with green clock. And what green about clock. Mr. Akhil? You have also green cloth. No, uh, I think just that uh, up arrow around that stop video, uh, I, I think just on the right side of that, you click that and set the background. 
No, no, I did that uh, in four no. devices. Ashish, uh, let me just say that if there is any illumination problem, then that you can get rid of by just having a green background. Right, right, right. Next time yeah. probably I will. Uh, but uh, this uh, time what happened was that um, uh, my all four devices were not supported. Uh, Mac OS, Linux, mm. Chrome OS, uh, tablet and a phone. Okay. Because even my laptop hardware was not supporting uh, as Mr. Akhil, you know, immediately uh, you just add image and it uh, sets the virtual background. So I had to do this. Trick. <laughs> achha, achha, achha. So, uh, good afternoon. I think we have. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, now I would like to call up uh, my dear friend Dinesh to take it from here. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dinesh. I welcome you all to the session, IoT, the next frontier. We are in a new era of digitization that is happening across the industries and in our day-to-day -day life. The IoT is, as we know, continues to leapfrog in the technological ladder with cheaper and improved sensors and devices. IoT enables interconnecting physical objects that can collect or transmit information to each other and to us. Latest research shows that IoT has the potential to translate itself into a trillion dollar industry soon. Now, let me introduce you the esteemed moderator of the session, Dr. Goldie Gabrani. Dr. Goldie Gabrani spent around three decades working in higher education. She started her professional career with computing industry and subsequently worked with premier universities of the country like Netaji Subhas University of Technology and Delhi Technological University. She is currently working as a professor at BML Munjal University. Her focus has been on strategic planning of academic programs, deployment of innovative teaching pedagogies, student engagement and interaction with other research centers and labs to enhance mutual participation by taking up more design oriented and real world projects. Her areas of research are distributed computing, networks, IoT, data analytics, and transformation of engineering education with a higher emphasis on student engagement. Now I would like to invite Dr. Goldi Gabrani to take over the session. Thank you, Dinesh. So I first, uh, I would like to welcome all of our esteemed panelists. Uh, and today we see that we are going to have a great session ahead. Mm -hmm. So I'll just give a brief introduction of all the panelists first. Uh, so Mr. Akhil Chaudhary, born and brought up and educated in New Delhi, mm -hmm. India, Aki graduated from Delhi College of Engineering in 1984. He started his professional career as software developer with application software group of Uptron India Limited. He realized his vision and dream for an entrepreneurial career and ventured of his own own by co-founding Bindery Semantics Limited in 1986. Currently, he is founder chairman of Bindery Semantics and managing partner and CEO of Vaco Bindery Semantics. After founding Bindery Semantics in 1986, Akhil has held roles of increasingly responsibility within the organization across engineering, sales and marketing, support services nationally and internationally. VACO Binder Semantics is working on disrupting the managed services and technology space by constantly evolving digital services and delivery models by harnessing cloud, social, automation, re-engineering, AI, machine learning, and analytics. So welcome, Mr. Akhil Chaudhary. Thank you. I would like to introduce Mr. Ashish Banerjee. Shri Ashish Banerjee has more than 33 years of software development experience. He is a hands-on programmer and open source evangelist and has guided more than 18 MTech theses for IETE and IIT Delhi. He has worked at Oracle Corporation for nine years and has entrepreneurial experience of over 15 years. At Oracle, he was IoT and telecom specialist, director Asia specific star team. He helped create IoT strategic services offerings for telecom across Asia, including China Telecom. Also TM Forum compliant architectures for Reliance Geo, Hutch, Voda, Airtel, Grameen Phone, Telecom, Excel, Exiata, Indosat. He was principal innovator for making Java faster on multi-core processor architecture at Sun. His contribution of the first rewrite of Q's kernel module to open Solaris at Sun is worth mentioning. Microsoft has recognized him as a .NET community star. He has co-authored a C-sharp web services book published by Rocks in the USA. 
his idea and key ideas stage investor and startup investor startup investor is iml incubator jss step incubator and amit innovation incubator presently he is working on blockchain technology is also the co-founder of fusip blockchain technology llp welcome mr ashish now i would like to introduce mr bupen saharan mr bupen saharan is one of the founders and chief executive officer of bbdm technologies private limited for more than 12 years he has helped define and implement bbdm strategy and growth he also serves on the company board of directors and industry veteran pupender has overall experience of more than 20 years pupender is also an active speaker in various business conferences and technology forums he is a member of indian chamber of commerce and india cellular and electronics association pupender oversaw bbdm's investment in technologies R&D and manufacturing that propelled BBDN into the mainstream. During his tenure as chief executive officer, BBDN became a premier ODM in cloud managed products including 5G and data center, networking and Wi-Fi, IoT, vision, cloud and apps. Prior to BBDN, Bupender was CEO at Econ Infotech where he oversaw the embedded hardware and software business of the company and expanded from networking and telecom to camera and video domains. Welcome Mr. Bupender. Thank you. Mr. Sanjay Kumar, he is Director of Global Solutions Engineering at Dell EMC, Bangalore, India. With over 22 years in various technologies and IT space, he has experience in leadership, management, operations, building teams, and strategic implementation. He has played a key role in leading various technologies and solution offerings such as HPC, Oracle, SQL Virtualization, Cloud, HCI System Builder. He joined Dell in July 2007 as PG Technologist and later managed many solution teams in Dell EMC, Bangalore. Prior to Dell, he has worked with Veritas Software, Aero Data Networks, Speed Data Networks, and Research Division of Tata Steel. Sanjay has a Bachelor of Engineering from NIT Durgapur and Executive General Management from Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. He is also actively involved in promoting collab collaboration between universities and industries. We welcome you, Mr. Sanjay. Thank you. So I think now we are looking forward to a very interesting session on IoT. the next frontier so uh, first i would like to invite your opinion on the topic of the session uh, how do you see iot at the next frontier at both global and indian space so i would like to call mr bupen first thank you welcome everybody and thank you for giving me the opportunity so the iot as a word started around 3 3 4 years back basically internet of things so it means the connected world so if you see the iot was there always uh, even last 20 years mobile phone was the first iot device because it connects everybody uh, to the cloud and everything now now iot specially took over the sensor networks basically 3 years back where they say that everything will be connected whether you have home if you have your home you have multiple fire sensors in the universities you have tons of the different vibration sensor all that kind of sensors basically would be connected to the uh, would be connected and then uh, it will be sending the data to the cloud and then it will going to the app and that's how you get the alerts and everything it's a very very big opportunity right now the meaning of that is all the old infrastructure whether it is inside the buildings inside the cars inside everywhere it's going to change it means we will have lot of opportunity to do develop tons of the sensors to to make tons of the change the infrastructure based on this new sensors sensors and networks it creates a very very huge opportunity for all of us in india in the past what used to happen if you see lot of sensors used to work independently independently means you have a water sensor you have a air sensor you have a gas sensor all those sensors are working in isolation basically and they did not have the cloud connectivity but when the iot has come it means all these sensors are uh, talking to the cloud and the cloud is eventually talking to your mobile phone over the apps basically now what happens is china was very very strong very extremely strong in hardware from last 25 years they have gone really really very 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 high and india has become very very strong in software actually but now the opportunity has come the hardware because of the iot every hardware need to talk to the cloud and every cloud talks to the app basically 
so it has created a, such a wonderful opportunity for india because india is already very very strong in software if we can design the sensor networks if we can design all the automation products basically which eventually talks to the cloud it is a big opportunity for the whole india to to go really ahead of the china because we are very very strong in the cloud software and we are very very strong in the app software the piece which we need to uh, develop right now the sensors the all the automation devices everything which sends the data on the cloud so 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 with we really have a big opportunity right now being a strong in the software if we can develop the capability on the hardware and the sensor and the devices side then the sky the limit for india to grow right now so with that the india can make, can become a major can really create all the devices now and it opens lot of opportunity for the startups it opens lot of opportunity for the platform company which develops the cloud to create the complete ecosystem basically so with that i will say we have got the opportunity as a country to really do very well into the iot space and to move ahead of the china and define the new strategy for our country for the 5 trillion economy with the, our prime minister is seeing the vision i think this with this can become a major part of that basically yeah absolutely correct uh, mr putin now mr ashish would you like to say something on this i think is mute you have to unmute uh, mr ashish you have to unmute yourself yeah so um i would like to take uh, forward what mr bhupendra just said uh, very well rounded sir um uh, discussion and you mentioned china as well and i will elaborate on this a uh, little bit later on um so uh, i have been uh, working across apac uh, while in oracle and in india also i was uh, engaging with the bigger players now with my third inning in uh, software startups i have seen a lot of iot uh, you know every third company we are seeing in startup india uh, money raising is iot only uh, so the challenge which i see since i started my uh, like uh, career with hardware and went over to software so i still in touch with the hardware part unfortunately what i see is 90% or rather 95% of the devices in india even those who masquerade as made in india are having their heart uh, of the devices which are processor and key components from china and this is a big threat although this is an opportunity as well as mr bhupendra uh, just mentioned ki we can actually dominate because of our software you know province but uh, hardware infrastructure is required uh, today which is missing uh, unfortunately very few companies are doing that and uh, one of the biggest challenge we are facing is the chinese chips are very cheap and most of them are using it now even um, i wanted to uh, put a sanitizer i'm just saying a personal story which you will relate to uh, like in 2017 my home was hacked because i bought a chinese uh, uh, security camera and i had to open upnp uh, services uh, which is required for enabling it and my home network got hacked now cut to 2020 i bought a made in india uh, this uh, smart uh, plug which i put it in my sanitizer uv sanitizer and connected to alexa what i found indian company with the indian app i put my password there and while connecting to alexa it takes me to the chinese site where my password works so that means indian uh, app transferring data to chinese system and my friend who also i have been uh, like mentoring him uh, as a uh, hardware startup he is developing a smart plug and he opened up the same made in india uh, stuff which they were claiming and it turned out that they were using uh, like chinese chip chip esp32 so which is the most popular one and the most cheaper one other one which another startup which has been funded uh by us in startup india is supplying to tatas and other uh, good places uh, and they also unfortunately have this uh, uh, chip of chinese so now we have put up a, a condition now that they have to 
uh, get out of this security hole and uh, in the next iteration they are uh, they have promised to you know uh, upgrade it to a proper thing now apart from this negativity there is also a you know challenge and an opportunity um, to you know go and prove to the world that our systems are more secure and uh, we should be an alternative uh, in the world now uh, apart from that the 5g networks are also coming and uh, we need to be very careful about and the government is already already you know uh, knowing about it and they are addressing it we as investors industry professionals should also be aware of the facts now uh, i see three pillars actually uh, working along with uh, iot one is iot itself uh, blockchain and uh, the third is ai now lot of uh, you know stuff that we are looking into iot cannot be enabled without these two and we are uh, fortunately very strong in software and therefore i am hopeful that uh, eventually we will develop a hardware infrastructure uh, which can cater to iot so the iot is few, actually when i started my career there was no iot so called iot world we used to call them embedded system now after that scada became iot like uh, industry 4.0 and <laughs> this uh, embedded system became uh, less iot now the difference is that processing power uh, has increased tremendously and the network bandwidth has also grown bigger and bigger uh, like wider and wider so these two put together is fueling the whole growth and this is going to continue so we need to you know kind of get inside the processors as india which is already we are doing um, i think uh, bmu is already a uh, planning to get into the indigenous uh, processor courses and all so we should be focusing on hardware we are already good in software that's all what i would say yeah absolutely correct mr ashish uh, now would, i would like to have opinions from mr akhil choudhary uh thanks dr goldi and i think uh, carrying on from where uh, ashish ji mentioned and uh, enlightened us all i i think uh, uh, he he touched a very very interesting subject i don't know how many he talked about scada and that's what brought back memories of uh, of course if we trace back the evolution it started with where we used to do data acquisition uh, we used to call it daq which evolved into scada the supervisory control of data acquisition and which which finally evolved into what we call as industrial iot also or uh, iot in general but iot today i i think there are broadly five major categories that are there uh one is the consumer side of iot where we actually talk of light fixtures home appliances the smart plug that uh, he talked of or the the voice assistants that a lot of us are using today that falls under iot under consumer category then we have uh, commercial iot and when we talk of commercial iot i think again a lot of us see it the vehicle to vehicle uh kind of communications or iot that we see today or uh, in healthcare the smart pacemakers that we see today or monitoring systems whether health monitoring systems or wide range of uh, monitoring systems that fall under commercial iot then industrial iot that i started with dq to uh, kind of where we basically talk of digital control systems uh, that's uh the control systems uh, that we traditionally knew and the industries uh, managed and uh, manage their production systems and uh, the other is uh, other categories infrastructure iot uh, i think the infrastructure iot is which is being used in smart cities uh, kind of uh, and and i think that's growing at a very very rapid scale in the country and uh, finally the major fifth category is the military uh, iot which is also abbreviated as iomt now of course military we know it is being used uh, today in a major way right from surveillance 
robots to surveillance drones to uh, remote guided missiles and and what not or even a lot of combat equipment is also being created using iot the both both the defense side or or to protect their own sovereignty whatever so now now incidentally in all the areas we are at the tip of a revolution uh, kind of uh, i i think one of the favorite words is the title of a kind of uh, book uh, melcom gladwell's book the tipping point and i would say in in the iot space we are at the tipping point uh, in in practically all the areas and and i think the current ratio of about three connected we are close to about no not three i think we should be closer to about 2 2.2 devices currently per connected devices per human being on this earth we expect this to be about 4 to 5 by 2025 and about 15 in 2030 and that's that's going to really really change the things so definitely as uh, bupendra ji also said i i think there's a tremendous potential on hardware side on software side yeah. and also lot of converged applications lot of business model changes lot of uh, kind of disruptions that that can exist or or can be created in the existing business models and areas so i think uh, we we are at the kind of frontier of stepping into a so called digital future where everything in the world is connected so i think maybe maybe i i think we'll take on further questions later and i think we have other people to talk about it uh, i i think i would like to to invite mr sanjay to say his few words on this sure thank you uh, thank you everyone and i think as our panelist has already mentioned a lot about this iot's and it reminds me my first job in tata steel actually and it's not like uh, it's something new right now industry used to have that kind of sensor skeda collection computation then kind of processing thing so right now i think the current uh, environment because of this huge computational power commoditizing the hardwares the cloud infrastructure this iot is evolving and if you look at from india perspective i think we have variety of challenges actually uh, in different industrial sector if you pick at social sector rural sector or maybe the cities like bangalore delhi the congested cities so from that perspective i feel there is a this iot is a going to bring the lot of opportunity in india it's a big opportunity in india uh, from the business as well as the need from the requirement perspective you talk about automation you talk about faster decision making you talk about predictive analysis so that it can help for any kind of disaster management or something which is forward looking in those areas so huge opportunity i feel for in india and i feel we have just started the journey right now yeah uh, definitely in india if you look at from that perspective uh, from the iot yeah software is a big thing i know many of us have spoken about the hardware etc yeah hardware i think government is trying to support many things from that perspective but the result has to still yield in the forward looking but we have just started from that perspective the major important thing i feel from that perspective even you have the technology we have a requirement if the government policies are not very kind of you know conducive supporting then many things we cannot achieve so fortunately i feel the government is supporting this like anything if you look at from smart cities project if you look at uh, digital india movement even industry if you look at the digital transformation which is happening across the industry across the sector be it a manufacturing be it a health sector energy sector across right so that is going to bring lot of opportunity from the india perspective i feel so definitely it is going to big help uh, for the india country the one last point i would like to say that i think the mobile penetration which is happening in india now very fast the internet connectivity right i look at the data i think some as present we have i think close to 670 million uh, user and it has grown very rapidly i think that is going to bring lot of iot's devices iot users iot technology into different sector and differently i feel i think by 2025 if i look at there is a huge plan for 
for the telecom to grow, including the 5G, et cetera. And once that happens, definitely this technology can come and play a bigger role in our country development. And of course, the talent pools are also becoming available. So with the talent pool availability and the infrastructure and the government support, I think we have a big opportunity and big role to play in India. Yeah, exactly, Mr. Sanjay. Uh, see, each one of us is speaking about this hardware and most of the hardware we all know is coming from China. Um, at least 90% of the hardware yep. is coming from China. And these processors, these computing devices, they have security holes, they have frozen holes. Yeah. And now with the App Nirbhar India uh, initiative, how do you think this IoT data security is going to, uh, we are going to tackle it? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Yeah, the security is a big concern, definitely. You look at, forget about India, China, I think. If you look at the whole worldwide also, all the IoT devices are very vulnerable to the security problems. I was, I mean, if you look at some data of fact, I think close to 98% of IoT devices are all encrypted data. Okay? And they're going to all centralized traversing. And it's very easily, anybody can hack to any home system. I think one of our panelists just mentioned his experiences about the Chinese device and the security camera and how it got hacked. I think that really does exist. Even you look at the Alexa device or Google Home or any other, even Wipro bulb, for example, whatever people are using, which is a, a smart bulb, can be easily hacked. So from that perspective, that's a, definitely it's a big concern from the security perspective. But I feel, I think going forwards, maybe the some of the technology which is right now, for example, blockchain, et cetera, if we bring that blockchain kind of philosophy, kind of decentralized approach, which is the blockchain main kind of IP, compared to what we have right now, the centralized approach, because all of the IoT devices are getting communicated through the centralized, through the cloud device, et cetera. So maybe that kind of, once it evolves the blockchain, then also maybe the, the, the secure algorithm which blockchain provide technology, I think that development when it starts, that can bring some kind of security hole to close. Otherwise, definitely my point will be like right now, yes, most of the devices, IoT which are connected are very vulnerable, but maybe potentially the blockchain and some of the advanced algorithm, the security algorithm, which can come and leverage this technology can bring some close gap for the, the security perspective. But my point is not only China, it is across the world actually. So it can come from anywhere. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely correct. Uh, so Mr. Ashish, would you like to say something on this? Yeah, uh, so uh, just to clarify uh, something just Sanjay ji just said about blockchain. So uh, sir, um, we have, uh, you know, uh, explored this blockchain uh, for uh, security and all we have, uh, like, through my consulting uh, also you know, for US as well as in India and for my own startups where I have put some, uh, like, efforts there. So, uh, one is that the data is too much. So, like, for example, there are uh, uh, specialized uh, IoT networks altogether called, one of them is IOTA, which uses Hashgraph. But there, you know, it's like everything is kind of, you are trying to open up everything. So what we have done practically to uh, put up a security, we are just uh, putting up events which are adverse or which can affect a smart contract. For example, if a cold chain is broken, right, then we put it up that, okay, this cold chain was broken at this point of time, just stop it, stop the product uh, from being shipped further, like these kind of adverse events. Like it will be very uh, like important for the pandemic to come about. And you can also prove that every handoff point, uh, we have not broken the cold chain. One of that being an example. Mm -hmm. So another thing is uh, AI along with IoT is that uh, one of very interesting uh, use case we saw was uh, a warehouse application where they are using AI camera as well as the door open closed and uh, to figure out whether the stuff is still there also humidity and temperature is also monitored so together uh, with that they are using blockchain to secure that data in the sense that we are saying this data is not manipulated but from the 
IT security point of view, now people, uh, when I talked about it, ki aisa ho gaya, uh, in my home, they were saying, yeah, what's the big deal? Uh, Chinese chip hai, uh, smart, uh, usme pl- uh, bulb uh, mein, plug me. So what it can do, right? It can switch off your light or you can switch off your sanitizer or switch on your sanitizer. That's all. But that's not the question. The thing is, it has my Wi-Fi password and it has a surface on which uh, any uh, remote, we call it uh, over the top uh, software update. So the firmware, firmware can be launched there and an attack can be made outside the network towards any uh, other connected devices and networks and uh, even uh, the whole power systems as mr akhil uh, ji was uh, like akhil ji was mentioning about the power systems and scada and all so what if using these devices within an executive office you uh, bust your scada and then uh, take over the processes and this has been done in uh, like cia in iran when they you know uh, uh, went into the windows hacked it in and uh, their centrifuges they rotated such a fast way that it was like all the centrifuges which were uh, enriching uranium was blown off so you know these threats are very real and security threats can only be done by parameterizing this thing now it, it we will take about 3 to 4 years to replace or even come out with a viable alternative of a Chinese chip. Till that time, at least we can do is parameterize security where we like, you know, uh, ring fence all the IOT devices or Indian uh, devices, which are critical in nature and not let the data in and out without a security there. So that is, I think a mitigation, uh, you know, uh, approach till we are able to, you know, get into Atman Nirbhar Bharat situation where we are able to generate our own hardware designs and implement the hardware also here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, any views, Mr. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks. I think that was uh, very, very uh, kind of uh, valid uh, threat points, uh, Ashishji, that you talked about. And I think. Uh, on one hand, I think uh, we, like we talked of, we are at the edge of a revolution. And on another hand, there is a, a big threat also that's looming, not just on us, but people around the world. I, I would say even people or organizations, even within China. So it's it's not actually, it's it's the, the misuse of that potential hack that can get established. Now, now, I think what we really talked of uh, definitely is uh, use of blockchain. And one of the uh, blockchain and all other uh, penetration or th- threat protection technologies coupled with AI, ML, big data happening on the edge or, or that edge layer. Uh, in, in fact, what is also becoming very critical is the IoT devices, they can operate at the edge and there is distributed computing over there to enable all these blockchain, AI, ML, big data handling or kind of micro data centers that exist at that edge layer, which may or may not interact with the fog layer in between, which will further interacts with the cloud layer. So, so put together, I, I think we can establish an authenticated, relatively secure way of managing uh, IoT devices, of course. Uh, this will always stay. And it also augurs well. I think there are a lot of students also here. It creates tremendous potential employment opportunities. If you want to specialize in uh, security, not just IoT, in general, in the world of applications, uh, kind of, or this interconnected world, uh, I think security uh, uh, job opportunities there, they just all around and they, they will stay for times to come. I, I think. Uh, Absolutely. So, Mr. Bupendra, would you like to add some comments? Yeah, so three components we talked about. One is the silicon, second, the hardware, uh, and then the cloud, and the security uh, sits between the cloud and the hardware. So silicon, we have a lot of alternative to China today. 
So China does ESP30 and this kind of small modules. Then we have Qualcomm has a lot of chips. NXP has a lot of chips. And most of these companies are American or European companies. So we have a lot of options from silicon perspective that our dependency on China is not there. And we can have the secure silicons from the Qualcomm, from the NXP, and from a few more companies which are non-Chinese non company. Definitely, they may be 50 cents more costly as compared to ESP30 and that kind of stuff but is the possibility is there. Second option is the hardware development. So, so three years back, we used to think the same. Today, VVDN alone, VVDN is, I'm the founder and the CEO of the VVDN. We are shipping 10 lakh IoT devices every month, basically from our factory. We manufacture and ship 10 lakh devices every month. The third comes the cloud. The, if you see what China did basically in, in the IoT devices. So there is, there, there is something called Tuya. I think most of you guys might be aware about the Tuya. So they make a very small connecting Wi-Fi devices which, which they have offered in $1 to all the companies, whether they are Wipro, whether there is Wipro bulbs or any, any, any tons of the IoT devices. And this device is very cheap. And what this device does is eventually this data, this device sent the data to a Tuya platform, Tuya cloud, which is hosted in China. And pretty much all that, all that cloud contains all the information about all the, whether they are the Vipro bulbs or whether there are uh, tons of other <laughs> IoT devices. So right now, so, so definitely the India company need to have their own cloud platform equivalent to Tuya. The silicones are available from NXP and Qualcomm. We don't need to wait for next three to four years before the silicones are made basically. And hardware, the India has a capability to do basically. With this option, VVDN only is shipping 10 lakh devices every month basically with this combination. And I will be happy to help all the people who are on the call, the attendees, the young startups basically, whatever help they need. VVDN has a complete ecosystem. We have uh, our own SMT lines. We have our own production facility. We have tool making facility. We have everything what it takes to do a hardware product, basically. So, so, so definitely we can compete. We can make a very, very secure uh, uh, cloud platform and use the use the use the security of the blockchain or uh, for the encryption and all that kind of thing. And hardware we can develop and we can use the new Chinese chip, which is from the Qualcomm, which is from NXP, and many more companies. So we have the capability to do, we have the brain to do. I will provide anybody who is looking for a help in building the devices, building the hardware. We will have the complete infrastructure to do everything what it takes to do a hardware product. And we are doing the 10 lakh devices every month today, shipping to India as well as Euro, US, Europe, most of the countries too. So, so everything is available, it's just the need it's just the courage what people need to have basically the startup need to have startup does not need to give up in one year two year or uh, three years it will take 10 years to have the success basically we will fail multiple times we will we will we'll, we'll make one device we fail we make another device we fail and your third or fourth devices will do very very well basically and the infrastructure platform everything vvdn has whatever help anybody need i'll be more than happy to help anybody the startup companies or any whatever it takes Thank you. So, Ji ke liye, I've got a question uh, just to, you know, uh, clarify. Uh, thank you, uh, Bhupinder Ji, for, you know, uh, enlightening us uh, that and helping out. Uh, I'm surely going to send a few startups your way uh, who are struggling right now. Uh, so, uh, in one of the uh, startups, uh, we were trying to replace it and uh, ESP32 can be directly replaced by CC3200 platform, uh, which they have deliberately put it $3 extra. So, my question is, all these NXP and other chips which have equivalent, uh, you know, capability. Uh, uh, so, uh, how much extra uh, like hit uh, the hardware at the top line uh, is required like to say ki, ha, it is secured yeah cc3200 is from texas instrument they are little bit costlier there is qualcomm which gives a very very cheap uh, silicones basically like 4004 there are multiple 4002 there are multiple silicones from the qualcomm which are 1.5 dollar kind of thing so extra hit will be i, I told you earlier the 50 cents will be extra as compared to ESP32, basically. 50 cents to a 75 cents, basically. That will be the difference, basically. That is quite doable, actually. So, 
so the, I, i think developing the hardware more than that people were not de- able to develop the mold sayer and do a beautiful because iot device need to look very beautiful the touch and feel has to be very well so we didn't have the complete mold design we have around 20 cnc machine to do the mold designs we are doing almost 25 to 30 molds every month basically so we have removed that plastic molding all dependencies from china our own smt everything the complete infrastructure which we have developed here whatever startups you send it to me the people need to be very very strong basically i mean i like the strong people who are ready to take head to head for anything it doesn't uh, uh, doesn't matter so definitely uh, will be happy to help whatever it takes to do it so nice of you thank you so i think mr bhupendra has given us a great offer to our students who are and all that and this i think we must take uh, advantage of this offer which is so generous Uh, professor yoldi i have one uh, like uh, suggestion yeah. for you yeah. so um, since uh, bm munjal is already into you know uh, mobility right yeah. uh, the group as such so we should have an accelerator iot accelerator focused on uh, this aspect and uh, let uh, uh, the vbdn also participate uh, so that you know the startups can create the design the 3d and the pcb prototype and they can yeah. productionize you know yeah, yes so they have full uh, line up the full infrastructure the end to end infrastructure and they I have to scale it. also i believe now that i am i'm not sure we will have be able to participate there but we have all this 3d printer industrial printer any help a good startup need and strong people will be ready to help basically we have everything what it takes to build a product actually mm-hmm. that's really nice i think so some students are actually going to take uh, advantage of this offer no problem uh, so i have the coordinator uh, she is on the call vinci huh. uh, happened to my daughter also so we have to be passionate guys if you are listening here so my daughter name is also vinci vinci you to be operating system windows ce basically mm-hmm. so when i started the organization in 2003 uh, and uh, that time i got married i thought if i get a son i'll put the name linux and if i got a daughter i would put the name vinci So my daughter is there, Vinci. She will help the startups basically. She's she's on the call right now. Okay, so that's great. <laughs> really great. Okay. And like, see, so many IoT devices now uh, we are anticipating, and you are seeing already 10 lakhs per month are already shipping. So do you think some because uh, of this radiation, we will have some health issues also? Uh, ma'am, health issue. You keep with you this mobile phone throughout your life. You are keeping right. your chest and near to your. uh ear uh, most of the time we keep mobile phone like this near to our mm-hmm. heart near to heart mm-hmm. so madam let's not worry about that because we are having the biggest uh, threat always with us so it doesn't matter now any anything else actually practically it doesn't matter anything <laughs> the everybody is you know you, the advantages we are getting we are exposing ourselves to these radiations yeah and uh, and now see you are saying about So 15, as Mr. Akhil said, per person 15 uh, devices will be connected by 2025 to 2030. So obviously the exposure is going to increase. See, those devices are low power, battery powered. This they they dissipate yeah. very low radiations. Very radiations, yeah. But so multiple devices. Yeah, but yeah, met- and you are yeah. surrounded with them. Then. Yeah, maximum will be your mobile phone. Yeah, maximum yeah. will be your phone. Not only it causes the radiations, it doesn't let us sleep basically because every 15 minutes you check the message on that and you don't. Yeah. It is a big challenge. Sleep basically. Yeah, so that is the biggest threat today. Yeah, I, I think on this health hazard issue, mm-hmm. yeah, not nothing is proven now. But yeah, there is a lot of talk is going because initially mobile phone came, then we had a similar thing, yeah. a radiation and other thing. Yeah, certain differently, certain norms need to be followed. The certain standard need to be followed. I think that's the reason. I think we were talking earlier that hey, whenever we have the and opportunity in india to develop the hardware etc yeah. all the standard guideline need to be followed which is the fcc or maybe the wireless protocol guidelines so the radiation can be minimized if i have heard maybe fact or not i may i may not be expert here for that but certain devices which is outside from india they have more radiation for example mm-hmm. that thing need to be more strict from the government perspective uh, from the policy perspective so that at least the exposure can be minimized so that's where i can put my two cent on this but yes there is a lot of discussion going on but very early to kind of you know conclude a as iot devices will be growing more in my home i have a, almost like five six wireless devices mm-hmm. yeah i precautionary i switch it off in the night so we don't need to go get exposed 24 hours 
but honestly i don't know what is the impact for that but yeah we need to be aware maybe we don't need to be always like a 24 hour on with that kind of very close to that uh, devices which are radiating but it's still a lot of thing need to evolve from uh, on that that side that's my perspective mm-hmm. And Mr. Ashish, would you like to say something on this? Deviation, well, exposure uh, to health hazards. The uh, human hazard is minimal, actually. As uh, Akhilji had already said, it is just an evolution. So if something happened, we would have been dead by now because of mobile radiations anyway. And microwave radiation is also there all, all around us. So I think uh, radiation hazard is not that uh, much an issue. what a psychological hazard and security hazard which sanjay ji mentioned is more relevant actually more psychological uh, stress of not being able to sleep and uh, being like for example this uh, health band every half an hour it will buzz and i'll you know kind of go around uh, doing some activity i feel sometimes that i should you know just stop this and switch it off you know uh, <laughs> and uh, this is the kind of intrusive iot that comes with our you know all the integrations we put around our body now start started putting on and uh, akhil ji also mentioned about the heart uh, pacemaker now heart ke andar bhi ghus gaya and every yeah. every time uh, we, we are <laughs> you know yeah. walking it will say nee nee you slow down now we are being sla- enslaved by iot then and see uh, mr akhil also spoke about five kinds of iots uh, india being a agriculture country do you think uh, we'll have iot revolution in agriculture ah uh, absolutely what has happened is that there is a maharashtra government big initiative and uh, i think other states are also having a big initiative there um so uh, agri iot uh, iot is uh, in a big way like i mentioned about the warehousing then there is uh, like many uh, companies which are monitoring uh, the controlled environment like high uh, like value fruits and other in a hydroponic or controlled environment as we say uh, those things and soil meter and uh, the uh, other uh, kind of uh, smaller instruments uh, their uh, farmers are themselves using and then they are you know kind of putting this in the soil and then uh getting a read- reading and uh, the fisheries are using ph meters and many of them getting connected so iot is in, already in a big way there uh, mahindra has started a autonomous tractor demonstration and so these kind of things are already in the process i would say i would like other uh, panelists uh, to also comment on this Uh, absolutely i think uh, like you rightly said i think uh, agri uh, agricultural sector or agri tech uh, companies uh, they they being funded in a big way and uh, kind of we we already have a lot of innovation taking place uh, some of them problems typical to india in the agriculture sector because people even have those problems of when will the water come right so so we have sensing devices which senses the water has come now the motor has to be switched on uh, so 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 we we have a lot of unique india use cases so so agriculture definitely and india where where agriculture definitely has been a big contributor to gdp so so the innovation is definitely going to help india move forward in a big way uh, towards that atmanirbhar bharat not just iot technology and everything but applied iot or applied technology will help us move in a big way forward and i think uh, anyway the key for us is uh, along with the the hardware the software or the cloud layers everything the other key uh, opportunity for all the young uh, potential entrepreneurs or the business community is also to keep innovating new use cases by combination of the phys- physical and the digital layers and the reinventing of those business models the use cases which are going to create more and more opportunities in the market space and and i i think while while those hazards will stay like we did talk of radiations etc but then as human beings we have always found a way or antidote to those hazards also Uh, so we'll keep finding those ways and none of those things is going to come in the way of progress 
like almost like nuclear uh, bombs also is a huge threat yet we have harnessed electricity uh, from from the same processes and help power the world so so similar way i think we have to look at the opportunity world uh, ahead of us and look look at how can we revolutionize uh, the globe make it into one small global village uh, create a lot of opportunities for people around whether in terms of employment or uh, uh, a way to make it a better and cleaner world yeah. sanjeev ji yeah i think as our friends have already mentioned so i see differently there is a huge potential for iot application in agriculture actually many work already have started in india as our friends have mentioned and many i think big companies now for example mahindra they and couple of other startups are working in those line but i feel it's it should be a big revolution for agri basically our agri if you look at it like in farmers like you know it's all traditional thing uh they don't know what kind of soil fertilities when water need to be how much water many things are surrounding that right now the technology this iot technology either the hardware and software combination and then of course the the analysis portion of it which is the ai of it that is going to bring big advantage to the agriculture sector especially the you know the smaller kind of agriculture farm i'm not talking the bigger thing because we have a large population of a smaller agri farms right so that will be kind of i'm betting on that there will be huge advantage in india for they will be able to leverage this technology for example even as someone mentioned just now the pumping set right or when that need to be turned off or hey the pump set is not working for example maybe some kind of issues are there can some predictive analysis happen for example cattle tracking for example so i'm sure this is going to bring a big leveraging this industry in agri sector and many works have already started in india again it's very early and you know a lot of factor will be depending how much how many our farmers or big farmers can adopt this technology but i think because the challenge is what we have in india in different rural sector i think slowly slowly this will get adopted and thanks to this uh, again mobile penetration internet penetration in a rural sector that is going to bring that uh, technology in our rural and that is where our agriculture sector can leverage this advantage. so i'm fully kind of you know uh, fully convinced may not be very soon in a year or two but maybe in next 4 5 years i will our agri sector will be a huge taking advantage of this iot technology yeah exactly uh, mr bupik are you at vivid and are you making some products specifically for agriculture uh we have done the moisture sensors Okay. I've done the this uh, automatically turning on and turning off the tubules, tubules basically, and then we have done lot of this smart plugs basically, which are also used for these tubules and that kind of devices, high power. So, so lot of sensor we have developed already. Uh, so this is basically for Indian uh, uh, right for international. Most of this stuff goes to United States basically. We are exporting this right now. these sensors are basically for united states so india do you feel the consumption is not uh, no no that level uh, india norm, i mean we little bit uh, on the technology side when the on application tech, on the application of technology side india normally start one year later than united states basically which we have seen in the past so once uh, the but the needs are coming i will say 6 8 months uh, the some of the it devices whether they are the soil sensor whether they are the moisture sensors whether they are the turning on turning of the water pumps or or the or different kind of more sensor for the agriculture they will start catching up in probably uh, year time eight months to year time frame from now basically we shall see the consumption and, and india also but the can you think with there some divide okay with maybe north india is using these kind of products more or south india or it is uh, flat crop the uh, the see if you see the lot of indian farmers basically they don't have too much land basically uh, no land, yeah so so then uh, deploying the technology there we really need to have a use case we need to need to talk to the farmers by deploying this your income is going to become 1.2 times or 1.5 times or your expense are going to become half what you are doing today in that time that does not happen that that the need does not arise the 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 consumption would 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 be little bit less 
but so normally it happens by learning from others if one guy have put the another guy will see hey this are the benefits of this then it then it scales up slowly basically so we are seeing in agro sector maybe a year from now scaling up the iot technology that's what yeah. we yeah. yeah as mr as mr bupinda said i think if you go to some of the rural area which is very close to city the tech city for example bangalore you take an example or chennai for example i think i have seen people are adopting that the larger farm basically yeah. especially for irrigation and some other things so they are adopting it but because we have a vast agriculture population so getting in a mass will take some time yeah so we are at this starting stage as uh, i i guess so yeah i guess uh, still at the starting stage and do you think with uh, 5g coming in uh, the penetration will of iot will increase yeah i think let me start share my views on that to start differently 5g is going to bring lot of opportunity actually in terms of iot as we know the current technology what we have it's limiting the speed latency and bandwidth and 5g is going to increase the speed and latency so differently in terms of bandwidth and latency when it the things open up pipes open up more number of iot device can be connected right so that is going to bring lot of advantage for um smart cities for example handling the traffic through the ai for example even tele telehealth for example because you are opening the pipe so differently 5g is going to revolutionize as we said we are in a starting journey but 5g is going to go kind of next 2.0 kind of thing for the iot because pipe is getting created huge huge number of bandwidth etc will be there to connect the devices etc uh but at the same time differently this is going to bring lot of other technological challenge as well because you will have a lot of use of data right a uh, lot of data will get generated so differently data storage data retention the ml challenge will come how to kind of model the data because a lot of data will get generated uh so there's a lot of other challenge will come but from iot perspective 5g will be a game changer so my two cents here is that you know uh, when we are talking about 5g even before that uh, the ism uh, channel where the wifi is also a part of that uh, and other uh, similar technologies are not really yet fully exploited mm -hmm. for example uh, there was a, a project by iit kanpur a couple of years back in fact 5 years back uh, digital ganga so what they did was so they created a wifi mesh across this uh, gangetic plain for uh, taking out pollution data and other uh, things could be you know uh, integrated into it so if uh, the small farms like all the farms we are seeing the natural farms uh, work in clusters and they have some sort of iot there and uh, they can actually uh, you know start up a cluster which we were doing trying to do a poc uh, along with few farmers there farmer groups Far farmers have now become a collectives uh, now so what uh, they are talking about uh, with us is that uh, the use cases again uh, are uh, the uh, roadblocks in the sense ki whether it is kind of will be beneficial to them or not to government is now paying up little bit uh subsidy on that so uh, they are getting connected uh, or the at least the plan is there and then they uh, wifi mesh then integrates with the panchayat um, broadband so the small clusters get connected uh, and then they go to the cloud basically otherwise uh, the connectivity is uh, not so well in those areas this like farmers live in a small uh, clustered area and the farms are very far off so their uh, the wifi connectivity mesh they are trying to build so that we can get it them to connect to the mainstream there so this is another uh, work we are doing um, along with the uh, agri iot if you may will mr akhil Uh, yeah, uh, uh, definitely, I I think uh, yeah, you talked of a very very interesting project that uh, is being undertaken, and I I think that that uh, brings us uh, to the power of what IoT or five G. In fact, what five G is likely to bring. I I think that's where uh, this started from, and I think. 
uh, this uh, of course 5g is going to create enormous uh, speeds and like you said uh, that even 4g is not been fully exploited of course that gap will always stay in the marketplace uh, we will we'll always have those early adopters or laggards in the marketplace and uh, so so but 5g will create uh, bigger opportunities and in fact 5G and edge that uh, I talked of earlier uh, are going to complement each other in a big way. Uh, because what we anyway, a uh, lot of these issues around uh, security, a lot of uh, kind of data that, that needs to be stored locally uh, for, for low latency or which, which kind of, uh, where, where you need to do a lot of data processing also, or we talked of those micro data centers. So, so actually, actually, 5G and Edge are going to go hand in hand. In fact, uh, 5G will lead to uh, much better and bigger opportunities in terms of both Edge and IoT, because Edge finally is going to benefit IoT or the computing that's taking place at the Edge. And, and I, so I think all these uh, 5G, Edge, IoT, is is they are all poised for a big group together yeah even i agree the 5g is now going to penetrate uh, and obviously our iot landscape is going to emerge much bigger now see I, now it's already 3 30 pm so it's a very very interesting session so i would like any one of you to give some concluding remarks or would like to tell our attendees something so uh, one thing I will say to our attendees, if you guys are doing the startups, please, the cloud platform is a big opportunity. Make a cloud platform like the Tuya has made. Do some study on Tuya. They, what China did with the Tuya, they put in almost every device is Tuya. It's a small Tuya device and the cloud is all in China. And they are pretty much controlling all the lights, all the fans, everything basically. So do a study on the Tuya. There is a way to make better than Tuya. I'll be ready to help somebody who has a vision and who is very, very strong and who is taken head and head that he wants to compete with Tuya. That is the best example to beat China on the IoT device and Tuya is the largest IoT platform today. So with that, I will say uh, people shall come up. Startups need to come. They're the young guys who might be on the call basically right now. They need to really be strong and do a lot of research on Tuya and whatever help is needed on the technology platform side will be able to help them. Thank I you. think let me add to Mr. Bhupender. Jo Bhupender ji ne just bola to, to students, uh, guys, um, uh, if you want any help from me, I can uh, help you architect and uh, uh, we can uh, get it on into uh, network. Anybody who is interested, please uh, contact uh, Professor Goldie or any of their professors and uh, we can uh, figure out uh, a way you know to really challenge to yeah i think that's is a good takeaway from the whole, whole discussion. discussion yes <laughs> no absolutely i think uh, agree and uh, i think i think uh, everyone here on the panel seems to be very enthusiastic about it uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Bupinder, for uh, that offer. And I think that's interesting. I think because I uh, personally am also a strong believer that entrepreneurship is uh, a big solution to a lot of world's problems. Because we create employment and that, that minimizes both poverty or reduces, helps reduce crime. Most of the crime is because of unemployment. So I, I think... Uh, Thanks for uh, making that offer to the students. And I think we'll all be extremely glad to support uh, BML Munjal University and uh, Dr. Goldi Gavrani in uh, whatever initiative you want to move forward with. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Akhil. We definitely will come to you with our students. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Jai Hind. Thank you. So now I would like to conclude by thanking all of our distinguished members of the panel for really providing excellent insights into the questions that were raised. Now I would like to invite Dr. Rajiv Day who will give the closing remarks. Thank you, Goldie, ma'am. Uh, 
we have now come to the end of the session so i would like to uh, conclude by thanking all our distinguished members of the panel for providing really excellent insights on the questions that were raised in and i would like also uh, i would like to thank you dr goldi ma'am for serving as a moderator panel members have discussed about the hardware and software parts of iot and they have also discussed about the agriculture uh, domain in which iot can play a big role they have also talked about challenges of iot for example uh, akhil sir has beautifully mentioned and defined the categories of iot for example consumer iot commercial iot industrial and all that and uh, he has uh, pointed out a new a new category of iot that is military iot i have never heard about that military iot <laughs> first time i heard that and uh, uh, bhupender sir has mentioned about the two two wifi chip uh, which is used to basically develop the home appliances uh, home appliance devices and it is very nice to hear from him that he is uh, ready to help the new startups in this domain uh, and new people who are uh, already uh, in this domain and uh, um, so at last uh, uh, i would like to appreciate uh, uh, all the panel members uh, uh, eminent panel members uh, by presenting a memento of certificate uh, from the university BML Munjal University uh, is honored to present this certificate of appreciation to Mr Sanjay Kumar for sharing his valuable insights as an esteemed panelist during the technical conclave thank you BML Munjal University is honored to present this certificate of appreciation to Mr Ashish Benerji for sharing his valuable insights as an esteemed panelist during the technical conclave thank you BML Munjal University is honored to present this certificate of appreciation to Mr Bhupen Saran for his valuable insights and an esteemed panelist during the technical conclave thank you BML Munjal University is honored to present this certificate of appreciation to Mr Akhil Chaudhary for sharing his valuable insights as an esteemed panelist during the technical conclave. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we have a break of fifteen minutes. See you all at the next session. Challenges of cyber warriors in the uncertain environment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so thank again, you. we thank uh, all the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are fortunate to have you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
नितिश मैं आपको टेंडर दे रहा हूँ इसकी ना सॉफ्ट कॉपी आपको बहुत अच्छा मैं Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bhagwan Bulena here to introduce our moderator of this session and present a short introductory note on the topic challenges of cyber warriors in uncertain environment. As COVID-19 has a negative impact on the economy as well as our society, it has really rattled the whole manufacturing, transportation, healthcare, and retail and other verticals of the economy. The worst is not over. As the concerns regarding the COVID-19 pandemic grows, the computer hackers are taking advantage. of the situation to launch cyber attacks spreading the insidious virus of the different and the bad actors are really taking at the covid virus is the opportunity for social engineers and get into the businesses and many of things we have seen are typical percentage of the personal laptops printers and other devices of home networks have a malware the concern has that and been a uh, potentially going to have a wave of cyber incidents and coming in the wake of the uh, coronavirus pandemic so now let's take a moment to invite our esteemed moderator of the session dr purnendu shekhar pandey the dr purnendu shekhar pandey has done his phd from iit alhabad in the information technology his areas of research are iot machine learning ad hoc networks sensor networks and d2d associated networks he has published various papers in sci and esci journal and various top notch computer conferences like ants iccsa he has also a reviewer of uh, various peer reviewed sci journals a keen interest in coding has led him to qualify as the oracle certified java programmer in the top percentile welcome sir thank you thank you so much bhagwan so i would just like to invite and welcome the panelist i would like to start with brief introduction of of panelist i would like to introduce uh, mr atul tripathi a thinker who has been acknowledged to influence the thought of nation a data scientist with 16 plus years of experience and interest in ai multilingual unstructured data processing and analysis and a const and and consultant in national security council secretariat prime minister office government of india 
member of the team that worked on AI policy and data protection policy for India, and also member of member of leader excellent at Harvard Square. Atul has developed strategic and self-learning applications using AI for national security, IoT, IOE, IIoT, Indian Railway, shipping, human speech recognition, and image processing, and an advisor uh, of setting up data science center at ISR Mohali. So thank you, uh, sir, for agreeing uh, to you know uh, part of this conclave. Uh, we welcome you for you in this conclave, sir. Thank you. Now I would like to uh, give a brief introduction of uh, uh, Indrajit Singh, sir, and experienced info system professional with experience of more than twenty-seven plus experience across wide spectrum of areas spanning info, security risk management, cyber security, cyber forensic cyber warfare expertise in SOC and CERT, cloud computing, big data, internet of things, including IoT security, blockchain, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. He's a visionary for startup incubation, entrepreneurship development, strategic consulting, consulting uh, new technology evaluation for commercial viability. He is a security analyst and freelancer, freelance writer, having efficient solution architecture and, pro and project management skills. Thank you so much, uh, Indri, sir, for, for agreeing to be part of this conclave. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to give a brief introduction Thank you. of Mr. Pukhra Singh. Uh, he is he, indeed you know, cyber uh, threat and intelligent analyst with 14 years of experience. He played an instrumental role in setting up the Cyber Defense Operations Center of the Indian government under the Prime Minister office. Pukhra was also first threat intelligence professional to be laterally inducted into the government uh, from the private sector after the 26 by 11 terror attack. It was a multidisciplinary tenure ranging from geopolitical doctrine formulation, eventually approved by prime minister to the very brass attack of cyber operation, operations. Later, he spent some time at Aadhaar India, India's flagship national biometric ID project as its first cyber security manager. Puraj also has a very brief sting in private sector, working with Semantic Canada's deep side, industry first threat intelligence team, and other innovative American, Canadian, and Israeli firms. Thank you so much, Pukhra, sir, for attending this conclave. Thank you for having me, doctor. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. Uh, now, I would like to introduce Mahinder Singh, sir, who is professor uh, and Mahinder Singh, uh, sir, has also re received his bachelor's degree from Pune University in 1994 and hold a master's degree with honors in software engineering from Thapar Institute of Engineering and Technology, as well as doctoral degree specialization in network security from Thapar University. He joined Thapar Institute of Engineering and Technology in January 1996 as lecturer. His stronghold is practical know-how of computer network and security. He is on role of honor. EC Council to USA, being certified as ethical hacker, security analyst, and licensed penetration tester. Dr. Singh has successfully completed many consultancy projects and for re renowned national banks and corporates. Dr. Singh has many research publications in reputed SCI high impact journals. His research interests include network security, grid computing, secure coding, and is strong torch bearer for open source community. Thank you so much, Mahindra, sir, to, you know, part of this conclave. Thank you, Dr. Purandu. So I would just like to, you know, start this, uh, this uh, uh, session with a very interesting question, right? So the first question of mine is, in this uncertain environment of pandemic, even threats are also changing, right? So what are your views, sir, Pukhra, sir, can we start with you? I don't think the threat environment really has changed for us, to be honest. The, the ground realities have remained the same. It's just that the perception of the threat may, be, may have changed a little. But to be honest, uh, the underlying dynamics of the threat landscape have remained pretty much consistent over the last 20 years or so. So I would not say that there's a massive disruption in the nature of the threat, but it's just that the threat perception has evolved. Now, I don't want to hijack the, the discussion itself. So I would maybe later, uh, Dr. Pandey, if you permit, I'd like to you know, give you a, a five-minute a five monologue 
on 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 cyber warrior cadre building and and skilling but i'll i'll probably address that later so that other panelists can also join and contribute to the discussion yeah sure sir sure sir sure why not atul sir your take on it so i think you are mute oh sorry am i audible now yes 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 sir. okay so thank you thank you doctor uh, and as pukraj had said you know uh, he is quite correct that the, the threats have remained the same the mm -hmm. magnanimity or the intensity of the attacks have improved have uh, increased in mm -hmm. fact um, to be very frank with you i was uh, there on uh, uh, one of the channels yesterday and we were talking about the acts of uh, data leaks and threats that are being posed particularly by the indian startups and the indian smes we are very at mm -hmm. a very very vulnerable position of life and uh, the problem is that this is a very deep malice that we are looking at and it's a multi dimensional multi factorial thing that is happening so it's not a single dimension it's like you know a thief is trying to break into your house he will break in intentionally so it is my job to protect my house so similarly something like that is happening on the cyber space as well now <clears throat> that can also that should not only include the company is, perspective but it should also include the perspective of uh, you know individuals as well your privacy your data your individual identity how is it being abused what is happening that is all has to be taken into consideration when we move ahead in this area right right as i have said sir so uh, indraji sir your your views on this yeah uh, thanks uh, firstly you know it's a really to be pleasure to be here today with uh, all the august gathering and uh, all the uh, listeners and uh, it's a wonderful topic to talk on the cyber warriors and their preparation and uh, one liner which i'd like to you know begin with uh, this pandemic has brought a situation where you know the data which was always in the four walls of any company or organization uh, it's moved out of the organizations and the challenge which is there is when we are going to go back we are going to the organizations without the data yeah and the data is always going to be there in the offices or your students laptop or anywhere it is so we go do, uh, go back without the data uh, impact to the office that, that's going to be a new normal what we are going to see <clears throat> and that brings the challenges and uh, that's what uh, we are going to be discussing about right 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 mandar singh sir your take on this no as rightly said by all the other three panelists see uh -huh. the scene hasn't changed much but only thing is again i'll say if you want to safeguard yourself against script kiddy that's what mm -hmm. we should target to see uh, only this 2 2 3% of the people who are experts they they anyhow are going to get into you okay so right. we need to, we need to prepare the warfare war force warfare as well as each and everything related to it in such a manner that at least those 96 97% of the people like previous day we were seeing some kind of a movie where it was that people were hijacking the phone calls of the uh, person and they were taking their main money out of their banks so the, these are right. the these are the kiddies which can be taken care by awareness uh, to the right. crowd as a whole but if you, if you talk about really what is happening in the true sense that that uh, warrants a big debate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so bukras sir don't you think that you know uh, with the passage of time the threats have been changed in terms that uh, the, the the you know uh, the hackers are just 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 trying to make people you know creating a scene that uh, now this is pandemic right and saying that if you're not going to click this uh, you are going to you know uh, lose this much of money so so all these things are 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 you know happening these days and because of the panic situation people just try to you know do something that they are not you know uh, should do so that's what you know uh, this this uh, that's why that's what indeed i just wanted to ask right so so how to avoid it how to how to you know come 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 out of this i think prescribing a uh, general guidelines could actually is only very counterintuitive or and counterproductive in our in our domain and whenever someone asks me like i i engage with people who let's say have a potentially being spied upon by intelligence agencies 
to do high value assets or targets you know who are basically uh, you know are have uh, have access to classified information so whenever they mm-hmm. ask for certain uh, you know antidotes uh, which the cure alls for such problems i the first question i ask is what is the threat perception and right. the reason i ask this 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 question is that because i just want to point out the fact that your adversary the threat actor is a sentient mm-hmm. being probably in the in the profession of risk management cybersecurity is the only profession where your adversary is a sentient actor you know the other risk mm-hmm. management professions deal with natural disasters or or things going wrong but you're dealing with a sentient actor and if you start right. understanding this sentient actor this threat actor in anthropological terms in in the nature of the how the threat actor behaves to certain environment you know then you start understanding how do you build defenses against them i'll give a small example so the two we always talk about bolstering our defenses but we don't talk we don't talk about degrading adversaries incentives so mm-hmm. if you shift your focus the fulcrum of your effort from defense to to adversaries imperatives what are the motivations of the adversary and that depends on what your threat perception by the way so if you focus on the two the two the do that they're basically you know i'll just quote uh, uh, you know the, the three the only three cardinal dimensions of cyber offense and this was said by a, a veteran cia uh, cyber operator he wrote a book on network attacks and exploitation and he was giving a larger philosophical structure to cyber attacks and he basically mm-hmm. says that cyber attack target three aspects three dimensions humanity access and economy humanity is a nature of human beings the social engineering and all that access if a person has access to privileged information that person is becomes the weakest link in the chain or depends on how you access the information and economy if you outspend your defender if your if your attacks are costlier than the the cost of the defense then you always would win so i would really put it into very simple terms to to have workable defense i'm not talking about spending you know millions of rupees or dollars in creating hypothetical structures of defense you need to understand that you need to lower down the decrease the incentives of the cyber adversary and increase their costs so if you focus on the high high cost attack surfaces and you focus you mitigate these high cost attack surfaces the attacker would really be deterred because attackers have their own bosses and budget so you know this is a very famous saying that you know the adversary also has a boss and a budget just like a defender so you understand once you understand these dynamics not only can a simple let's say network of a university would be able to defend against an adversary but also a nation states uh, network and i'm 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 saying this from practical experience i don't want to hijack the session so over to other panelists right right so rightly said sir rightly said so given the rise in the work from home for majority of the companies in this pandemic situation employees employees are now away from the protective firewall right all these days and and the organization and are more prone to social engineering attacks what can be done to make them aware about the possible fixes right so this is indeed my second question to that of uh, indrajit sir please give your views on it you are mute you are mute can i sing you on mute i guess no it's okay yeah. right 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 so uh, you know uh, wonderful question and you know the point is that uh, when the people are working from home and how really we have to train them we have to uh, tell them about what is it uh, something which is so important the cyber hygiene uh, because there is a long list of uh, uh you know do's and don'ts which we can really talk on but definitely there is a requirement of a cyber hygiene where you need to change your passwords you know you don't really don't need to use the same password at all the places right <clears throat> that's pretty important also you right. know when you you know getting onto the social media it's not really important to put everything on the net right because just be aware that there are people who are actually you know going after you right other thing which is important is that Uh, while you are working from home be really 
you know miss out on something important of you know changing the passwords of your router so practically you have to have your strong passwords of the uh, router right mm -hmm. uh, from a user perspective the window to the internet is your browser right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's so important that you update the software have a ad blocker right. which you can uh, put it into your uh, uh, browser so that uh, all these big companies or people who are there they don't you know fingerprint you right mm -hmm. and uh, most of us we know that uh, all all the social media sites are fingerprinting you and mm -hmm. this is what the hackers are trying to exploit uh, this kind of capability okay when right. i say so when you are working on an e-commerce site uh, you know mm -hmm. we are every day seeing you know the, there's a loss of uh, credit cards and uh, Uh, debit card details so whenever you're going on an e-commerce right. site just be very sure there is no j sniffer because uh, a person who's novice will not understand what is a j sniffer but definitely if you have the blockers if you are having the right kind of a, a anti malware uh, in your uh, device you can really you know guard against that uh, you need to manage your profiles uh, in a manner that uh, don't put anything extra don't put this so that don't give an option to hackers to do a social engineering on you when i say so just imagine uh, uh, there are so many social engineering attacks which are happening and there are phishing attacks which are happening uh, last six months what we are seeing and uh, right. uh, to put your perspective again there are almost 1 lakh phishing sites came up right uh, in the month mm -hmm. of say uh, uh, february to uh, march end and uh, that's where people like you were bringing about you know people are made to click on those sites they being you know lured into those scams and uh, that's the place where they're taking to the the kind of uh, you know links and people end up right. using their credentials uh, one example where uh, there was a you know kind of uh, you know people were being told that you'll get a netflix uh, subscription to for uh, free for two months people fell for that and people and uh, landed you know uh, losing their credentials losing their user id password and then it was you know how it really happens and right. you right. need to check your privacy and your security mm -hmm. settings of your browser that's the basic i'm not going on a very on, on the upper side of the technology where i would have talk of multi factor authentication and dlp right. and right. sore and all those right. i'm talking right. from a very ground uh, and a grassroots level where people mm -hmm. really require to do it okay and back up your offline and online work regularly why because you may never know when are you going to be hit by the ransomware If you're not right. being hit by the ransomware, it's good. Else, you're going to be. I'm not scaring this. It's a fact, and uh, we are seeing so many ransomware attacks which are happening for last last uh, six months, and the kind of ransomware which is going, you know, uh, one person in the complete network can destroy mm -hmm. the complete security architecture altogether. You may have right. the best of the, you know, the firewalls, UTM's, you know, DDoS attack uh, the, the mitigations, everything in place. Or the one employee, or the one person, or the one student who is accessing your, you know, data, one click on a phishing attack, right, will let that malware detonate and explode in your network, lead you to a, a kind of situation where you lose everything. And universities right. are not devoid of all these cyber attacks. If you remember, there were seven universities in UK which have been hit in the month of I think September. by the ransomware attack and what they were trying right. to thief a uh, cheat uh, or a steal they were stealing all the theses your research work that's very important from a university because you will say what's there in the university for me it's all research work right, right. then right. there was a university in uta you know they paid uh, 4 uh, 4 lakh 75000 dollars for the ransomware attack so uh, you right. know uh, all the all the education institutes also are not devoid of these ransomware attacks and each day the ransomware attack is becoming more complex more complicated right and they know what to do and earlier right. time and today's ransomware uh, it's happened in 2013 starting that and now the ransomware attack which is happening is totally different right they are more you know focused they are uh, you know what uh, uh, my earlier parallel was telling they have, they have their bosses Uh, there, there is a malware as a service. There is a ransomware as a service, and there is something very interesting which has come up. Just, I'll just take a minute. You know, the hackers are not getting on to a kind of straightaway launch and attack. Okay, 
So they do a reconnaissance and then there is a community which has come up called a uh, internet, uh, sorry, the excess brokers, right? The malware mm -hmm. excess brokers. So the guys are making the foothold into the network. Once the foothold is ma made, they sell that particular, you know, foothold to the ransomware guys. Now the ransomware guys buy that foothold and launches an attack. Right. See, such a complex situation this has become today, uh, the complete, mm. you know, uh, the ecosystem or the threat landscape. And uh, right. it's very difficult to protect. And the human mm. being being the weakest link in the complete game, it's very important right. for us to have the cyber hygiene, have the, the you know, kind of uh, points which I just brought in, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to be followed. Even your mobile security per se, because mobile is as good as your... A device like your laptop so you right. have to have a uh, you know security for the mobile and we are neglecting it if i ask uh, amongst even the gathering which is there today how many people have the security in their mobile the answer will be very few or none right. I'll tell you right uh, the, the but the fact is that malware in the ransom uh, in the in the mobiles of the macs today and what are they stealing they are stealing your location they are stealing your bank data there's a there's a malware which is specific to your bank, uh, uh, stealing your bank credentials, right? Stealing right. your call details, stealing your SMSs. So anytime you download an application, you have to be very careful. Anytime you download a video on a WhatsApp, you know, you got to be, you know, take right. it with a pinch of salt that it doesn't have a malware embedded into it or a photograph. So you know, the list goes right. on and on. So I will stop here, but then this is how the complete landscape is shipping out to be correctly said correctly said in this sir actually nowadays even the hackers are you know trying to steal the data from the the, the covid data so that that is another thing that is also yeah. happening right so, yeah so we had a ransomware so, attack yeah the ransomware attack which were targeted on the countries which are developing covid vaccine and right. uh, you know that's where they have been you know hitting out hard and mm -hmm. one interesting thing which has come up out of the complete uh, coronavirus is the healthcare has become the new IT sector of the world, which we never thought so, right? All so, right. <laughs> and, and the healthcare is being most targeted today. The healthcare infrastructure and the OT segment of the healthcare is the most vulnerable because nobody thought that it would be uh, so, you know, on the targets of the hackers. Right. 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 Yeah. Correctly said. So, Atul sir, means uh, according to you, means what, uh, what, what company or an organization should be doing to you know protect the the, the their data, right? Because now the employees are are even working from their home, right? So it is indeed something that is uh, that 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 is that companies are also thinking of. So your take on it. So uh, I'll continue what uh, from what Colonel Indrajit has said. You know, I'll take up his point and uh, just take it from where he's left. He talked about the uh, the uh, healthcare being the new sector. You know, mm -hmm. so I'd like to give an example, a couple right. of examples. You know, um, uh, this is on seventh of October. Doctor Lal Path Labs, they reported right. that there has been a cybersecurity breach. Followed by twenty third of October, Doctor Reddy's lab uh, says that there has been a cybersecurity breach. And uh, 7th of November, loop in India. Now, do we see a pattern out here? Coronavirus, Sputnik V, uh, vaccine development, what Colonel Indrajit has just said. Huge thing happening, right? And I'll tell you another interesting take. I, I don't know whether the audience is aware of it, but most of these attacks were coming from Russia and North Korea. So there's a group called as Strontium and Zinc and Cerium. These are the groups that were involved. So what Pukhraj had said earlier during his talk that making the enemy pay, you know, pay him back in the same coin. We don't be defensive. We are in the attacking mode. You know, that's the opportunity. Right. That's where we have to take the game forward. We cannot be paid back. So it has to be fought at multiple levels. You know. First is at the government level. Obviously, government has to play a very proactive level. It cannot be, you know, I cannot say I am going to shrug off my responsibilities. It's your headache. No, I'm sorry. It has to be everybody's responsibility. Right. So obviously, making the making your enemy pay that's very important, right? Who's the enemy? Anybody who's trying to steal my citizens' data, my uh, organize my organization's data, my 
uh, you know, our country's data, whatever it is, you know, within the boundary geographer boundaries of whoever we are deciding on. We are trying to take care of each other, we're trying to protect each other. And whoever is trying to attack us, whether physically or in the cyberspace, we all are to be, you know, helping each other out. That's one point. So it has to be done at all the levels. Coming back to the point at the individual level, what again Colonel Indrajit was talking about, and social media he did bring out. You know? So I'll give you an example of what, what we what we should not be doing on social media. By the way, just to tell you one a little, just you know, that uh, are we aware of the fact that uh, about 90% of the bots that are roaming around on the Twitter, they push adult contents. That's the num that's the amount. 90% of the bots. I'm, I'm being very, very frank. Okay. I will not name a social media platform for a controversial reason it may become. percent mm -hmm. plus of their profiles are having people who are actually quote-unquote uh, pedophiles. And do you, and uh, are we aware of the fact that uh, during this pandemic lockdown, the mm -hmm. number of attacks that have taken place and the cyber security bullying that has taken place with children has only increased magna magnifold. I mean, it's gone up human, human, I mean, across the world. Why? Question is why? See, what has really happened is out of the love for our children or out of the love for the fact that I want to show how my child looks like, what did I do when I was with my child during the holiday and what I was doing in my life, I kept on opening up my life. I kept on, it takes two minutes to download anybody's photograph. Somebody's right. head, somebody's body, end of the story. <laughs> it's a fact of life, right? Right. 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 So you right. see, yesterday, uh, on, uh, you know, uh, uh, today's second, 30th was one of the, <clears throat> you know, a uh, marriage took place uh, mm -hmm. in our family, to the family marriage. Because of lockdown, nobody could travel, very small gathering. Zoom was used to showcase what was happening. I said, that's very good, but are you even aware of what you're doing? <laughs> are you even aware of it? What are you doing? You're opening up your life to the entire public. I mean, let me put it up. I mean, all this group that I mean, all of us who are sitting out here, you know, uh, 50, 60 of us, would any one of us like to be a public person that everything is known about that person? What do I eat? What I don't like? What I read? When do I sleep? Which movies do I like? How do I behave with my child? How do I behave with my parents? How do I behave with my friends? I mean, why should my life be public? I'm not a public property. I have a private life. But I don't know why do we get so excited on social media platforms that we just tend to push everything. So, you know, just hold back. Think. Stop. Mm -hmm. Then act. You know, what Colonel Indrajit was saying, you know, just, just think what you're doing, trying to do. Where are you pushing your information to? Whom are you giving this information to? Have you even thought through? Yeah. I mean, he also talked about one very important aspect was about the mobile phones he brought forward. You know, okay, I am downloading an application, very happy. I want to use that application, application that desperate love of the application for whatever be the reason. And have you read the conditions? It is, it is asking for access of my contacts, all the photographs that I have, every SMS that is received, including it doesn't matter whether it is coming from my wife or it is coming from my bank or it is coming from my boss. Why? I mean, personally speaking, I don't allow any such app to be used. I mean, I am using a lot of apps. I would not deny about it. But when, as soon as I try and use it and it says, please give me access to these things, I say, thank you. I'm done with this app. Right. So it is all about your own hygiene. Similarly, when you're working from home as an all as an organization, you know, representative, we are all of some organization representative, right? right? Whether it is our own organization or it is an organization for which we are working for as an employee, we are representative of the organization. So we should be very clear what are we trying to do, mm -hmm. right? We have to be very protective about ourselves, about our organization. Steps, simple steps. Don't put up your entire life on social media. Very simple step of life. Awareness, the biggest lack is, I think, is the biggest lack is that of awareness. Right. So, I mean, I should, I think we should start with basic awareness campaigns, you know, like the ones we had for polio and the ones we had for uh, AIDS and other such diseases, you know. We should mm -hmm. have awareness campaigns running, continuous awareness campaigns, so that it gets ingrained in our mind, how do we need to be here? These are the very important fundamental aspects which we are missing out. 
And then trust me, if you do these fundamental aspects of the game, a lot of things would be safe because organizations, they'll have to look at it from another perspective of life. They'll have to look at larger security perspective. That's what I wanted to bring up. Right. 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 So one question comes out of my curiosity, right? So Bukhra, sir, I just want your views on it. Is that uh, we are having strong encryption techniques, right? AES is there. We also go by the firewalls, right? And everything, whatever, you know, makes us look like we are secure. But then also we, you know, get hacked or, or we, we, we just get compromised over the internet. So how exactly that happens, right? Means when we have everything around us, every, every security aspect, then, then, then how come we get hacked? Your views on it. Okay, I think uh, Dr. Maninda Singh still has to speak, so I don't want to hijack his time as well. But uh, I'll come back to an important, I think there's far more, imp I, so the theme of the discussion was cyber warriors, right? And I think there's, there are far more burning issues than actually COVID or anything else which need to be discussed. I mean, right now, the biggest problem which is facing the Indian government is how do we scale and create 10,000 cyber warriors in five years? And I'm talking about not just like, you know, you know, creating these in, 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 you know, in, in, these are highly specialized warriors. So we'll come back to the problem later, but to answer your question quickly. So first of all, hacking itself is not a, a, a binary phenomenon. Either you're hacked or you're not, you know, it's somewhere is in the middle. So, you know, attackers can actually, you know, first of all, wait for to gain the right footprint or the, what we call the, you know, the, in, in, in warfare terms, you know, you know, gaining the, you know, you know, the bridge, the bridge hole, right? So they, you know, it's not a unitary process where, you know, you know, you either you hacked or you're not. And similarly, vulnerabilities themselves. So vulnerability, it's not like you're secure or you're insecure because vulnerabilities, they emerge from the complexity of the environment. A vulnerability, again, mathematically quite difficult to prove that whether you're vulnerable or not because vulnerabilities emerge from the complexity of systems. So you can understand a computing system would have millions of layers of abstraction. You know, and even a single computer would probably have, uh, I would say not even billions, uh, probably if you start probing it, reverse engineering it, probably billions of layer, layers of abstraction. And there's a veteran cybersecurity philosopher. He says, it's almost like calculating how many beings exist in a cubic meter of a rainforest. It's that rich in interfaces and abstractions. So when vulnerabilities arise when all these billions of layers start processing your inputs and outputs. And so there's so the idea that you are vulnerable or invulnerable, that you've been hacked or not hacked, when it becomes that kind of uh, a black and white phenomenon, that is where the defenders lose their imperatives and their initiatives. And so that's why the industry has evolved a little. They started talking about assume breach, where you always assume that you're breached and so you start focusing on not on, 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 on cleaning up systems. You start focusing on your mean time to detect, your mean time to respond. So your parameters, your KPIs as a defender, they have completely evolved. In fact, now there's a future, there's a research going on in, in the Central Intelligence Agency, a venture capital fund of the Central Intelligence Agency. They are funding new research. If I, you know, just like an immune system, the way it actually it learns new detection signatures is by, by detonating a few cells. So few cells commit suicide and then your, your systems are, are immune to a new invading anti uh, organism. So right now we also, there's a project with the CIA, you can, uh, you know, I, I, I can probably send the link to that later, but somehow we assume in the most critical of environments, there's no way for you to clean a system. You'll have to set the system to a blank slate and it's almost like the immune system. You, you self detonate and then you reset your whole baselines to scratch. So it's, it's, a, it's very difficult to answer whether you're vulnerable or invulnerable, whether you hacked, uh, whether you've not been hacked. Over to you, Dr. Bond. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for your valuable comment. Now, uh, in this pandemic situation uh, has a lot of rise in home automation and use of IoT devices, right? So from a security, um, cybersecurity point of view, how do you see the, that affecting the security of the people and industry? Uh, Maninda, sir, I just want your take on you, on this. See, um, uh, I don't think um, uh, this is the great way to um, ask everybody to answer a particular question. But rather than if we, if we take uh, this in a wholesome manner that where the problem lies, okay? Right. And then we can take this discussion forward. 
let, let me cite something for you. For example, we have been having so many awareness camp, uh, ca campaigns about the health of a person. Okay. So everybody, everybody across the globe knows that this is not good for your health. This is good for your health. You, you need to exercise. You need to, and this is this is for your own human life. But how many people fall? The same thing is true here also. Even if you are going to tell everybody that you need to have this kind of a password, this kind of a stuff is to be there. It's not going to work. So we need to find a root cause that why it is happening. And that root cause is altogether missing in our academia. See, we are teaching the students computer networks. We are teaching them how to find vulnerabilities. We are, we are teaching them how to protect the network using firewalls, IDS, IPS, all those systems. But we never teach them how to secure code. Right. Now, the, the, the problem lies there only. For example, if somebody chooses a topic that I want to work in a network area, I want to be a security analyst. One thing which comes to his mind, if you ask n number of students and go around and find out why you have chosen security, he says, I was afraid of coding. That's why I went to security. But that is not true. You cannot be a security analyst. You cannot be a security researcher. You cannot prove it to be worth if you don't know coding. And that's that's from where the problem starts. Why, as you have as you have asked, that we have AES two fifty six. We have we have so many encryption algorithm, but still we are getting hacked. The reason is very simple. We haven't told our guys that this is this is the way to do coding, and that is the core part. You think of any any operating environment which exists today. You think of any company. I'm not naming ABC, any company. Each and every company, each and every piece of software has a vulnerability. Why the vulnerability has happened? There are n number of causes, but the root cause, if you if you dwell deep into it, you will find the root causes. Our people don't know how to code, and this is across the globe. Even if you go to the best of the companies, there also there, there is a pressure that tomorrow we have to um, release this particular product. And the people who are developing always use control C, control V, and across the globe, there are some set of uh, functions which are available deep down uh, in the kernel environment. Even they will pick up that and uh, let, let them execute. Nobody has time to do the regression testing. Nobody has a time to do any kind of a testing. It goes into the market and that vulnerability is already lurking in that particular code. And when it comes come out in the public, that vulnerability is there and that persists and people know about it. So a, as an academia, we must start from a scratch. At the, at the first year, we start with C language, then we have um, object-oriented programming. I, I never saw any university putting any focus on this kind of a stuff. And that is where we need to work on. And that, that's kind of a burning question need to be uh, answered by each and everyone. That why it is so that our, our uh, software systems have problem. And now the people are talking about when they are touching the human lives, they have become more vulnerable. Please carry it forward. Dr. Pandey, I'll, you know, I, I would very respectfully like to hijack the session a bit, if you permit, and also, contribute, you know, uh, seek the participation of other panelists as well. So I'm just gonna do the disruption and I'll then pass on the baton to other panelists. So as I mentioned that we got a far more burning problem than let's say worrying about these, uh, these, uh, these topical issues, these are tactical issues. But if you don't focus on the larger strategic picture, then I think the discussion would go astray. And especially for students, I'm concerned about the students. What would they like to take away from such a discussion? So I'm just gonna, you know, maybe tweak the discussion a little bit with your permission. <coughs> And we got 15, 20 minutes left in this discussion. And maybe each contributor can contribute five or 10 minutes to this, 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 uh, this, this theme. So now I'm just going to start with a, a subjective monologue. Now, I joined the, when I joined the government 10 years ago, I was a guinea pig. I was a lateral entrant. And they thought, OK, since it's very difficult to create specialists within the government, so let's hire a specialist and then see whether this, this guinea pig, we can produce 100 guinea pigs like this chap. And so that is how the whole process started, I was the first lateral, lateral entrant into the government in the cybersecurity space. And it's been 10 years that I've been trying to solve this problem of skilling. I'm just going to give you an institutional picture of what skilling is in cybersecurity terms, just like Dr. Maninda has said. 
and then come down to the very brass tacks or the very specific areas where we need to do the scaling. Now, I, I've started, you know, I was recently uh, interacting with uh, the head of Cyber Command India has a Cyber Command called the Defense Cyber Agency. And the gentleman at the helm, he's also trying to solve the problem of talent management in the army. And, and eventually it led, led me down to a path where we try to figure out how, do the, how are the other, other nation states uh, are, are skilling their cyber programs, how they're building these cyber cadres. The first sort of solution we thought would be that, let's say during the, let's say during the training program itself, let's say it's NDA, you, you pivot certain spe specialized candidates with certain amount of aptitude to a cyber NDA. And then they have a, a separate kind of like cadre, which they will contribute throughout their career and then, but still be within the larger regimentation of the defense forces. But then the question was, you know, it went even further. Now I kind of studied these two larger models of uh, uh, scaling in, in cyber cybersecurity. So one is, let's say the US model, let's just say, where you create a massive military industrial complex. And then this military industrial complex itself bolsters the, the creation of skilled professionals. So, uh, you know, they joke in Fort Meade. Fort Meade is the headquarter of the National Security Agency. And they say, if you throw a stone there, it will probably hit an exploit engineer or a malware uh, writer. Uh, you know, the people are uh, plenty. The other, other the, so now you can't, let's, no, let's take another example where you can't scale up like this. That example is Israel. You know, we have, I think we've probably gotten bored of talking about the Israel model. No, Israel didn't, didn't have a scale. They could not scale it up. So they, they took a different model. So they have this program called Magshami where they pick these high students of high aptitude and they kind of like, they've created a structure where they can psychoanalytically analyze whether this person is a good hacker or not. This is an important question as to what, 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 what does hacking entail psych, in a psychoanalytical way. And then these, these kids, they join the unit 8200, which is their cyber warfare team. And their mothers are very happy because it's like, you know, almost like getting selected for the IITs here. It's like that. Because after that, the kid is probably going to start a cybersecurity company and become a billionaire. So Israel solved its cybersecurity problem just by refining its skilling program. And so now I'm just coming down to the, to the crux of the discussion. Now we need to create cyber warriors and, and is there, can we, so like Dr. Maninda said, you know, we need to code. And now my question would be, what is the aptitude, aptitude require for a programmer to code in the right way? I mean, you, not everyone probably could program in the, in the way we expect them to be. So what is the larger baselines or the, the, or the quantification of a person's skills and aptitudes? That brings us down to cadre building and, and skilling. Now, now my, my closing statement would be that cyber security itself, cyber offense and defense are largely they have an institutional lineage. They have institutional memory. If you study the Chinese cyber offensive program, if you study the American cyber offensive program, if you study the Israeli cyber offensive program, they have a lineage. To give an example, you know, our, uh, you know, the, the rocket science program came from, you know, basically was, its origin was in the Nazi rocket program. And when, the, you know, the Nazi regime was dismantled. So some rocket scientists went to US and that became the edifice of NASA and rocket program in the US. And some scientists, went to Russia and that started the Russian continental ballistics missile program. And to understand that mathematics lives in an epistemic bubble. And so how do we create this epistemic bubble in India, this epistemological bubble where you know, information thrives in a certain closed environment? It's closed, but it's, the information still thrives. And so these are kind of discussions, I think these are kind of problems I think we should solve or try to solve. Now, largely my last uh, uh, closing statement would be, the funny part is that would you call yourself a cyber warrior or a hacker? Now, there's a difference. Cyber warrior entails regimentation. Cyber warrior entails that you avow to certain uh, imperatives of the nation state, that you are loyal or patriot, or you're working for the state or the welfare of the state. Whereas a hacker actually is a, is, it's a countercultural entity. So the, that's why the earliest hacker, they were anarchist, they were anti-establishmentarian, and probably somewhere in the middle. So how do you, so, the, so they could be poets and they could be mathematicians. You could train mathematicians, but how do you train a poet? And so how does our skilling program address this special aptitude or skills which are required in the students and the kids so that they eventually build a, a critical mass of cyber operators? I think that is the kind of discussion which I assume we would have because we're talking about cyber warriors. And I just wanted to ruffle up the feathers a bit and I'll pass on the baton to other, 
uh, panelists to say what they have to say. Thank you. Now, see, I, I want I would, to say something here. Sorry. Okay, absolutely. Please, you can carry on. No, please, please go. Please, please go ahead. Please go ahead, Dr. Mayan. Okay. Right see, um, see I, I wanted to say something here. The, the, the thing is, uh, Pukhraj, you had touched upon very, very critical point here. Now, see, what is happening across India when, when we talk about engineering institutes? Where is the admission? Everybody wants to do computer science. Now, now the each and every university across India have started something, um, I think, say, um, uh, I, I need to be very blunt here. They're, these are, they have started something which is called uh, uh, money minting machines. They have started and started to fool people around. We can offer a B in artificial intelligence, B in machine learning, B in data analytics. Does that make sense? Anybody here would understand, unless until you have a core computer science curricula done, you can have a specialization growing after that, yeah. So initially when you say I, I have a BE degree in AI, I, I don't understand what that AI degree would be. That is kind of shuffling some computer science subjects and bringing some more and naming it as, as we started. And the, we have really confusing the public. Now the people say, which kind of a degree I should go for computer science engineering, computer engineering, system software, information uh, technology degree, or I should go for a software engineering degree. Then add on that, if we say we have another cyber uh, security B program, that's going to kill. Now, as you have said, we need to find out that once these people are in into some degree program or what kind of a program, we must have a kind of a, um, a testing of their um, mental ability to take cybersecurity as a career. And if that is going to happen and you do that kind of a psychoanalyst uh, kind of a job with these kids, then you will come out with something. And then you will find a match between poet and mathematician and this, this kind of thing will then grow. So a, a, as, a, as a country, as academicians, we need to think on those lines if we really want uh, cyber warriors or those kind of things to really flourish in our kind of environment. Otherwise, otherwise, because we 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 are we we are kind of having a herd metal mentality. Ah, okay, this kid is doing this, my kid will also do this. So we we never thought in th that kind of a um, uh, state of mind that how it is going to help the security of the country security, country will come later. Yeah, first of all, security, my personal security. So start from that and then you can build something. Uh, Mr. Atul, please. Sorry, so I, I would like to take forward what you have said, uh, Dr. Mahindra and what Raj has all said, you know. One is about having that ecosystem, very vital. Two is about, uh, you know, ensuring that we all are in the right perspective and we don't get carried away by buzzword. So I'm working in the field of cyber security for some time now, and trust me, one of the biggest challenges that we face as an organization is we don't have people. You know, yeah. people who understand. Okay, let me give you a value uh, another interesting perspective. You know, where I, I think so a lot of young people can make a great career, and I think so that is a great opportunity. You know, we don't have GDPR specialists, people who understand GDPR law. And this is high in demand with the new private, uh, this PDP being passed, you know, data protection bill that is pending in the parliament. It's going to be passed hopefully by the, by next year. That being passed, are our organizations ready for this? If they are not, who's going to help them? We as professionals, are we as professionals, as students of the subject, are we ready for this game? Hacking, let me give what, what we have talked about, uh, Dr. Mahindra, uh, uh, without understanding the fundamentals of the game, you're trying to play the game. You're quite correct. I'll give an example. Uh, Girza, one of the US NSA, uh, you know, US NSA has released this framework. It's an open framework now. You can go to the internet and you can just download that. It's a Girza, right? It's an anti malware framework. What do you need to do? If you open up the code, you'll find that there is Java and the hardcore ELP, assembly language programming that is written out there. So if you do not understand the fundamentals of the game, how will you play the game? So I agree with both of you guys. We need to play the game with a very fundamental level, have the right attitude. If I don't have the attitude just for the show business, let's not get involved in this. This is not a show business we are in. And this is a very serious business because protecting uh, things is not going to be an easy task. Because at, as Pukhraj had said some time ago, you know, bringing, taking the war to the current, uh, enemy itself, that's not an easy task. You have to take the war to the enemy. You just can't sit back, have a laid back. 
are we ready as professionals are we ready as students of the subject are we ready as leaders to train the st uh, student community and the others this is something we have to get ready for and only when we get ready mentally and educationally can be imparted so it is also got to do at our level as well as the right direction that we can give to the student community that okay this is the path now generally cyber security is taken as hacking quote and quote but there are multiple aspects of cyber security you know so there is sock uh, that is there there is data protection that is there there is idam there is application security so many aspects of life start looking at it at this point so these are the points that i want to highlight everybody there are multiple areas we can make a great career in cyber security not to worry on that you're not good with a particular skill don't worry multiple areas open to you that's from my side you know the two cents that i would like to add from my side right uh, so you know so i would like uh, go ahead go ahead go ahead tanal so you know i'll uh, continue with where you left and uh, a very pertinent point what you have told that uh, the the academy are really have to play a major role in training the people i really doubt if there is any cyber range in any of the engineering colleges today you know who are even giving a, a course in cyber security but some of them they are trying to give it and uh, also uh, the computer engineering people who are trying to get into the you know the cyber security and one area which i have always found you know i have stopped going to the colleges and take picking up students there because uh, the kind of uh, uh, the talent which i am getting uh, is not the one which is there like uh, what uh, raj has told and to tell you uh, our company which uh, part of the threat intelligence also we do the psycho analysis uh, of the all the employees what we are you know putting across because because we are doing a very serious job as it guards uh, you know the cyber security is concerned but then you know uh, like uh, pen testers you know vulnerability researchers uh, sock analysts what uh, you know ajay gupta so there have been there are so many kind of uh, domains which are there today but unfortunately we are not able to feed that kind of talent into the market now students when they get out of the engineering they try to do some courses you know ethical hacking followed by the oscb you know somebody would try and get into Uh, the the cloud computing security then you know, the csp but then again where the, where they are falling they don't have the practical knowledge it's only a bookish knowledge there's a gap between the practical application of that kind of talent into the forensics into the uh, white hat white hat hacking red teaming purple teaming blue teaming you know those are the kind of things which we actually are looking at for but we don't get those talents that is where today in india despite we having so many people wanting to get into cyber security we still lack that kind of talent which is coming across and that's where the problem lies today we really need to think very radical you know uh, uh, like uh, one of my colleague who was already saying you know 10000 cyber warriors i'm into new cyber warfare for almost you know i started uh, the initial part of the cyber warfare in india in, in army right? and uh, before i moved out and and that that kind of talent we are looking into 1.5 million you know uh, cyber security professionals where are we going to get they are all, if it's all going to be bookish then it's going to be a very sad state of affairs we really need to align our education academia their thought process and also the industry that's where you know we need to look at you know we never talk about the security in the critical infrastructure you never in any of the discussions today you know the the critical information infrastructure okay of the security of that how many people of in india today talk of the critical information security or the ot security we are very poor at it if you know uh, we take cyber security as plain simple hacking or some bit of you know uh, firewalls and utm and ips and some malware analysis but that's not it's really gone beyond those stages and what uh, mr atwar also bringing out there's so many flavors of it you cannot master everything you need to be expert in that and that's where we need to you know kind of uh, focus ourselves software engineering reverse engineering you know all those things have to be mastered today else we are just you know in a cat and mouse race uh, just to give you one more how many of us are in the dark net doing the forensics in india very few people don't even talk of it they don't even know how to get into it i'm not saying everybody needs to go into it. expertise i'm talking of expertise but today the crime is all happening in darknet so if we don't train our students into it if we don't train our talent into it we'll be in a very sad state of affairs like 
the the like we missed the IT bus, everything within in the Silicon Valley. Similarly, we'll miss the cybersecurity bus. Everything will be there in the all other countries. You know, uh, they'll take it on. See, there are, uh, Colonel Inderji, there are two, uh, two very important things here. One is uh, working on a particular platform, which is already there. Okay. So kind of our education system already hijacked by a big MNC when they say, when somebody wants to do any financial calculation, he may say, okay, I'll do it on uh, spreadsheet or I I'll do some SPSS, I'll use the MATLAB. So actually they they are not looking at deep into what is happening at the core. Right. So who, who knows at one point of time um, in a one, one of the cyber warriors, uh, big system at 12 night, there is some leakage of information by the chip itself. Right. I agree. I agree with you. So what will happen in those? See, it, it's very easy to say that we, we can we can build the uh, uh, particular ecosystem where everybody knows about one two three four all kind of uh, uh, items which will synergize the whole flow of cyber security but it's 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 a complete process it's not bringing up some kind of uh, uh, products and processes and put them and i am secure that will never happen so we we need to we need to go into the deep that okay this is, this is one layer. Above that, there's another layer of products. So we need to first teach the functionality, then teach those tools that are available, and then find out the vulnerabilities and plug those right. vulnerabilities in our customized products. Right. I agree. And that, that is how it is going to take leverage out of this. Otherwise, as everybody knows now, IoT, each and every kind of device is hackable. The pacemakers, I don't need to tell everybody here, they are all learned people working in the security field. Each and everything is vulnerable. But only problem is, can, can, we, can we do something uh, where, where this vulnerability kind of a scenario be cut down? And that's, that's again, uh, kind of a leftover thought for the people to digest from this uh, conflict. Thank you so much. Sorry, sorry. Just last point that I would like to add, you know, from my side, and I would, uh, uh, the other experts can also, if they feel, you know, will, uh, I'll be happy if they contribute. One area that has come up is the application of, you know, uh, large scale processing systems, what we call as quote unquote AI techniques, you know, particularly in case of malware analysis, can we, can we give it to the, can we design systems around that? Here, a lot of other complicated systems, would be, if you need to design something like that, you need to understand computer science. You need to understand the fundamentals of the hardware. You need to be good with your large scale data processing system. You need to be good with your AI techniques, mathematics, probability, and the areas of cybersecurity. So that has also started to emerge because the hackers have already started to apply these techniques to get into your system. You know, so we as defensive or as well as offensive mechanism, we also need to think this from the academic side as well. And we think something around it because there's a high, again, let me repeat myself. There's a high demand for it. The hunger is very high in the industry. Can we feed that hunger back? Can we help the industry at least? Can we get that? In, in, and that's a good opportunity for all these businesses, community as well. That's a great opportunity, but you know, the perspective and the approach is very important. That's what I want to draw. Okay, I, I was just reading the chat. Uh, there, is, there is one guy called Dildeep Singh. He has answered to one of my queries where he's saying the DNF of core computing courses and BML, they are doing something in cyber range. See, see this, this particular uh, discussion was not targeted to anybody. I don't know what BML is doing and what Thapar is doing or what IIT are doing. Only, only my concern is as a nation, we have to... It may it may look like a big statement. I don't know. Uh, somebody mute wanted to mute every everyone, so he muted me also. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> but if it was intentional, I don't know. But I, I don't think it was. So uh, the thing is like this: uh, when we say as a nation, it it, it may look like a big uh, big kind of a thing, but it has to come somehow. Uh, from from the deep down into those um, AICTs and UGC and all those that we need to think very seriously. Yeah, it's it's not always security has been eleventh item on ten point agenda. Okay, yeah, security discuss kar lete hain. 
and also in this conclave it's a last item for today so it it's not like that i'm not saying it should be first or ai ko baad aana chahiye tha but it's really serious affair so if we think on those lines i think we will be able to do some service to at least ourselves be not to the nation computer science where the you know if you go to black hat and defcon all these conferences where you don't see phd scholars or 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 professors producing uh, you know you know delivering new research so the disparity is high because again it's very difficult to institutionalize this this thought process in a structured uh, manner and and that is what the challenge we are dealing with the last thing is i think we talk a lot about user awareness or oh, we need to make our users aware i i would blame i would call it victim shaming in a way so you know i mean i'm going to take a very uh, uh, controversial example so you know most of the rape cases you know people have a tendency to blame the victim because of societal taboos around it it's almost similar way we blame the victim because somehow our defenses fail to trip in the right way so our risk calculus assume that if you start making these dumb users we assume the users are so dumb they always click on these spear facing attachments and that's why they get hacked that is a complete skewing of the risk calculus right now the dwell time of a simple malware even a simple malware can live in your systems networks for months when you have months of dwell time average dwell time i'm talking about you can go to years when you have years of dwell time how can you even start blaming the victims you know i think that mentality itself needs to change and it's all about you know a psychoanalytical aptitude to, towards security thank you thank you so much sir for your valuable comments and i would like to uh, thank every panelist for giving their valuable suggestions uh, from here onwards i would like to invite my colleague dr pradeep to conclude thank you so much good evening all uh, thank you dr punendu uh, it's a great discussion and uh, i personally learned a lot of things from uh, that particular uh, discussion so uh, i would like to thank all the panel members moderators and all my faculty colleagues and my dear student to make the discussion is more interesting and successful so now i would like to present a token of appreciation in the form of certificate and e voucher which will come to your mail soon bml manjal university is honored to present the certificate of appreciation to mr atul tripathi to share his valuable insight as a steam panelist during that technical conclave thank you sir thank you bml manjal university is honored to present his certificate of appreciation to colonel indrajit singh to share his valuable insight as a thank you. panelist during the technical conclave thank you sir bml manjal university is honored to present his certificate of appreciation to dr maninder singh to share his valuable insight as a steam panelist during the technical conclave thank you sir thank you bml manjal university is honored to present his certificate of appreciation to mr pukhras singh to share his valuable insight as a steam panelist during the technical conclave thank you sir thank you. so now i will request to dr kiran to summarize the event over to you ma'am thank you all thank you dr prathi yeah thank you Honorable panel members, respected guests, my dear students and colleagues, it is my privilege to present the memory of today's event, Technical Conclave 2020 on Industry 4.0 and Smart Autonomous Technologies. The conclave started with the welcome address given by Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Manoj Arora. The Technical Conclave comprises four one-hour thematic sessions centered around the main theme of the conclave, and the panelists involved senior industry leaders and leading academicians. first session of the day was on ai hyper reality which was moderated by dr sarab jot singh the panel kick started off the discussion on is ai a reality or hype 
Panel members asserted that AI has made a lot of progress in the last decade and some developments are clearly visible to us, such as AlphaFold winning the critical assessment of structure prediction challenge, retinal image-based diagnosis of retinopathy, hypertension, and many more diseases. However, clearly there is a hype around uh, hype around it created by media and in some cases marketing department of the companies. Such hype can only slow down the progress, but AI is definitely growing and contributing in niche applications as of now. Panel members also express that AI system don't operate like children who persistently ask questions to understand the world around them. In fact, AI system only knows what it was fed. It will not recognize anything it was not previously made aware of. Panel members also suggested the way forward for AI autonomous agents if the data can be curated by intelligent systems and can come up with instant decision making wherever it is required. There were some insights gained on the evolving state of AI in achieving human intelligence. Lastly, the panel members shared their vision how students can prepare themselves for AI world by going through the use cases, case studies, and tuning themselves to mathematical skills. The session was culminated with felicitation ceremony and the closing note for this session was presented by Dr. Kiran Khattar. Now, the second session was on future factories, robotics, and automation. The session was moderated by Dr. Maheshu Divedi. Panel members deliberated on the scope of robotics and automation in conceiving the factories of future. These factories of future would entail a lot of flexibility, agility, and mass customization through autonomous capability of smart manufacturing system. The panel members highlighted the current robotic deployment in India and discussed the way forward. They also suggested the way forward for micro, small, and medium enterprises to remain competitive by integrating the disruptive technologies into their operations. There were also some insights gained on the current state-of-art deployment of smart collaborative robots in Indian industry. Lastly, the panel members shared their vision for industry academia interface and highlighted the need of skilling and reskilling necessary for getting employed in the area of cybersecurity. The closing remark for the session and felicitation was extended by Dr. Surya Prakash. Later, we had the session on IoT, the next frontier. The session was moderated by Dr. Goldie Gabrani. Panel members were asked to give remarks on the futuristic role of IoT with respect to 5G technology and agriculture. Panel members explained that how IoT helps to plan in a better way to improve human healthcare system, crop production, day-to-day -day life management, and disaster management. Later on, it was discussed that number of IoT devices in our surroundings are increasing day by day, which may produce huge amount of data and it poses a challenge to handle. Panel members also highlighted the role of AI and machine learning to obtain essential and valuable insights from this huge amount of data. The panel members also asserted that why Atm Nirbhar Bharat initiative is relevant for IoT data security as at present 90% of the IoT devices have Chinese processors. Though these cheap, these are uh, Processor chips are inexpensive, but have security holes. Sometimes these chips poses Trojan holes as well. This gave us an opportunity and now industry, Indian industries have started manufacturing hardware. The session was ended with the felicitation ceremony and closing note for the session was given by Dr. Rajiv Day. The last session of technical conclave was on cyber security, challenges for cyber warriors in an uncertain environment. The session was deliberated, moderated by Dr. Pranendu Pandey. The panel six, uh, kick started off the discussion with an understanding that cyber threats can come up from any level of a services being used, be it online transaction, social media usage, spam mails, and phishing mails. The panel members address the security gaps and lapses in the internet-based services. The threat landscape has changed a lot with the emergence of new threats coming to the fore. How and why are the threats changing was the highlight of today's panel discussion. It was also explored that how cybersecurity threats are increasing during this COVID time, especially in those countries where vaccines are explored for coronavirus. 
panel members also emphasize that there is a need to educate and make the people aware about social engineering scams and cybersecurity attacks, which will help them to be more cautious in using cloud and internet based services. Lastly, the panel members share that what should be the aptitude and skill level of the students for getting employed in the area of our cybersecurity. The panel members also emphasize that there is a need to fill the gap between academic and industry in order to have more cybersecurity jobs. The closing remark for this session and felicitation was extended by Dr. Pradeep Arya. At the last, I would like to invite Professor Manik Kumar, Dean School of Engineering and Technology, to present the word of thanks. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kiran. Uh, well, I know this, this discussions have gone on really well, and I, I was there in the last session. I was listening very intently to what uh, people were saying about cybersecurity and why it has been brought to the end and why it should be upfront. I think security of whatever comes right up front. It's important that way. That is how we look at it as engineers, because uh, you know we as engineers work uh, on a very thin line. And I think whenever we are working, even as civil engineers or mechanical engineers, a computer engineering came a little later probably, but we all started uh, with, with very basic military and civil engineering. There were the two engineerings and military was always looking into the security part of it. And whatever was being taught to them, I think it was taught to them from the perspective of how they can secure our physical systems and beat be the boundaries, beat whatever it comes to. But I think it's very, very important. Uh, and I think whatever I've seen, I've, I've listened very intently. I think I thoroughly agree, agree with the experts who are up there, Pukhraj, Indrajit, Atul, and Maninda. Maninda is a good friend. So I, I, I know him right from probably 1990s, you know, when, when we were together at Thapur. So, so that's, that's amazing. And I think those discussions are very important considering the way things are moving nowadays. And, the way we are, I think, I think another thing which is coming through nowadays, we are looking at exploiting whatever we can. Now, that is something which has now become the intent of everyone. So I think we need to stop that particular thing at, at every point and every point of stage. We need to understand you know, what the industry needs are and what as individuals our needs are and what we need to study and learn from the educational environment which the engineering institutions specifically provide. I think that that gap needs to be filled up big time and I think that gap needs to be filled up through a very good immersion of you know, the industry coming forward and, and taking that mental of coming back to the universities and, and talking to the students and, and taking them on board you know, with regards to internship or practice schools. I think that is, that is one way of getting into it. And also probably encourage the students also, you know, big time, to think differently, right? It's very important and, and that can come through only if, if we are all on the same page, you know, be, it the, be it the faculty members, be it the students or be it the industry people. I think we somewhere have to draw a straight line and say we all stand on that straight line and say that's how we need to look up front. That's that's the same vision we have. And I think the larger purpose, you know, becomes very important. So, so that's something which I thought I'll share because I was listening to everyone and looking at the chat sessions also. I think it's, it's a fantastic session, uh, you know, amazing sessions we have had. So uh, I think it's a great opportunity for me to come forward and have it have a, have a little look and you know into what was going on here. So that was amazing. So uh, at the outset, I think I think it's great that you know I'll, I'll first like to obviously thank all the honourable panel members you know who have participated uh, in in very relevant discussions today, uh, be it uh, AI or be it IoT and be it cybersecurity or be it uh, the other technologies which we are looking at. I think it's amazing, and I think uh, this probably would definitely improve the way we look at various things. And 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 I think there would be certain myths around certain aspects. I think that would have gone away. I'm pretty sure that is what this would have, would have done to all the participants. So I, I'm, I'm obviously also going to be very thankful and on behalf of the university, I'd like to thank the organizing committee comprising of all the faculty and students. And I would specifically like to be to extend the grateful thanks to all the panel members specifically. So I'll name all of them for sharing their thoughts and opinions on the specific talk, topics. I think Dr. Vikas, Dr. Vijay, Dr. Gaurav and Dr. Muk Mr. Mukesh, you know, they were there in the very first panel, which was an AI hype or reality. I think they were wonderful discussions. I was present there as well. Uh, and I think I got a very good feedback also coming through from some of the participants who said that those sessions were really very engrossing. Uh, then we had a second session where I, you know, where Mr. Vinod, Mr. Vijay Gunti, Mr. Natwar, and Mr. Mahendra Padal, they participated on future factories. And that's another very interesting, you know, line of thought in the Industry 4.0 process, which is going on right now. And that was basically the topic of discussion there. Then we had Mr. Sanjay, Bhupinder, Mr. Ashish, and Akhil. 
Akhil ji who were in the panel on IoT, and that that is what also went on very well. And I thank uh, the panelists uh, specifically of that particular panel for participating in those discussions. And finally, coming to the last frontier or the first frontier, the, that that debate will still carry on. But I think it's very important session we had. So I'd like to thank Mr. Atul Tripathi. You know, I can see him on my screen up there. I'd like to thank Dr. Maninder Singh, Colonel Indrajit Singh, and Mr. Pukrat Singh for for making this session very wonderful with your insightful thoughts. That was really amazing to listen to all of you, and I'm sure the audience would have immensely benefited from the experience and expertise you brought on the table today. That that was amazing. And, and I, I, I would like to say from this platform that it's all about collaborating and we would surely look forward to collaborate with you and look forward to your support in the future as well. And, and I'd like to thank you once again for being a part of this wonderful technical conclave and, it, and it's your presence and participation, obviously, that has contributed to the success of this event, that's amazing. I'd also, also like to express my gratitude and thankfulness to Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Manoj Roda, who has been constantly encouraging and supporting us in all kinds of ventures which we're doing be it a technical conclave or any other activity. I think his gracious presence uh, in the inaugural session laid the foundation very well. And, and I, I thought that this was very well discussed and a debated conclave on very relevant topics. So I thank uh, Professor Arora for that. And I must mention my deep sense of appreciation to all those mediators and moderators of the session. I think uh, they had a very tough task. Probably they have to see that how the line of that discussion went on. And I think uh, they really facilitated very insightful uh, discussions which were there. And, and I think, uh, you know, they are, I would express my sincere thanks to them, Professor Sarab Jyot, Dr. Maheshwar, Dr. Goldie, and Dr. Purnendu for molding the sessions and the discussions in the right direction. I, and I think that the moderator plays that role very well. So he has to see to it or she has to see to it that they rightfully take this forward. So thank you to you as well. And obviously, you know, an event can, like this cannot happen without the ID support. And if there were no glitches, I think hats off to the ID support. And this is what uh, has been uh, the way things are progressing as we are considering this to be a new normal or an old normal or, or a blended normal, I do not know as yet, but it is something which is now happening day in, day out. And I think we're all part of this bigger picture as such. So I, I, I would like to thank all the organizing team members comprising of faculty members, the CGDC team, marketing team, and the IT team. And special thanks specifically to members like Kiran, Maheshwar, Pradeep, Surya, Rajiv, Shantanilji, Alipto, and all the faculty members and team CGDC members who all made it possible. I think they have been working really hard, getting in touch with all those 16 people and getting them on board on the same day. I think they deserve a round of applause because you know having the gathering of 16 people on the same day and all great and all busy people, I think it's amazing. And I, I think hats off to the team and the IT team for making it possible to have that stage available at that notice. So thank you so much for, for doing that. And special thanks obviously to Arun, Sandeep, Jeevan, Right, and the team and the team of IT who have been handling it at the back end. I think uh, all the all the events which are now happening nowadays, I think they are they are the ones. You know, just like we are talking about cybersecurity to come up front or security to come up front. I think the IT people have come up front, and I don't think they are getting the due which they should be because they are the ones who are managing the show with with the real panache. And I I, I would sincerely like to thank the IT team, you know, which is there at Bimal Munjal University for making this possible. I would also like to acknowledge and express my gratitude to the students. I think uh, they did a fantastic job of introducing the, introducing the speakers and introducing the sessions. And, and let me tell you, they are, they are very dedicated in the sense because their exams are coming forth, but still they found it that it's very important to be there and participate in these activities. So I'd like to thank Durga Bhagwan, Saswat Sarangi, Raghavendra, Neeraj, and Harshwardhan for their support despite their busy schedule because they are pretty busy and they are their screen time is enormous you know, considering the way they are undergoing their studies at this point of time. So thank you, dear students. And at the end also, I'd like to thank all the participants, although I know that the numbers are not very encouraging, but I'm pretty sure the numbers who, were, who could stay till the very end would have benefited much more from the ones who stayed back, you know, didn't come to the screen and, and wanted to listen to people. But I think, you know, so thank you to all the participants here. And I'm pretty sure the students, the participants, including faculty and other people from outside the university would have definitely loved uh, these discussions and would have carried on uh, something with them today to, to make sure that they probably think in the right direction and don't uh, think left and right too much and think positively and, and have a larger purpose of giving it back to the society. I think once that is there clear in their mind, I, I think the day would be made. So uh, at the end, if I've missed out, missed anyone, Kiran, you can please uh, sound me if I've missed anyone to thank at this point of time. But I think this is this is what I thought. I would definitely like to thank all of them and thank you once again for you being. Thank everyone, sir. Everyone. So I, I think that, that's that's something which I thought. And uh, 
Thank you once again, the dear panelists who are, who are up there on my screen. I know I can see all of them up there. So thank you, Maninder, Atul, you know, Pukraj, uh, Kanlinder Ji, Kiran, Surya, Pradeep, Shantanil, Goldie Ma'am, Sarab Joji, you know, all those people, Raghavendra, Durga Bhagwan, Rajiv, you know, and Sandeep and his team, and Maheshwar and Purnendra for making it great. So all the best, and thank you once again for participating in discussions today. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye, Mananda. Bye bye. Bye bye, guys. Bye bye. Bye, Indraji. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a good day, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.